A Letter One of Clarissa Harlowe, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlowe, Volume Six, by Samuel Richardson. Letter One. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Saturday Midnight. No rest to the text that I once heard preached upon to the wicked, and I cannot close my eyes, yet only wanted to compound for half an hour in an elbow chair, so must scribble on. I parted with the captain after another strong debate with him in relation to what is to be the fate of this lady as the fellow has an excellent head and would have made an eminent figure in any station of life had not his early days been tainted with a deep crime and he detected in it and as he had the right side of the argument i had a good deal of difficulty with him and at last brought myself to promise that if i could prevail upon her generously to forgive me and to reinstate me in her favour i would make it my whole endeavour to get off of my contrivances as happily as I could, only that Lady Betty and Charlotte must come, and then substituting him for her uncle's proxy, take shame to myself, and marry. But if I should, Jack, with the strongest antipathy to the state that ever man had, what a figure shall I make in rakish annals? And can I have taken all this pains for nothing? Or for a wife only that, however excellent, And any woman do I think I could make good, Because I could make any woman fear as well as love me, Might have been obtained without the plague I have been at, And much more reputably than with it. And hast thou not seen that this haughty woman, Forgive me that I call her haughty, and a woman, yet is she not haughty knows not how to forgive with graciousness indeed has not at all forgiven me but holds my soul in a suspense which has been so grievous to her own at this silent moment i think that if i were to pursue my former scheme and resolve to try whether I cannot make a greater fault serve as a sponge to wipe out the less, and then be forgiven for that. I can justify myself to myself, and that, as the fair invincible would say, is all in all. As it is my intention in all my reflections to avoid repeating, at least dwelling upon, what I have before written to thee, though the state of the case may not have varied so i would have thee to reconsider the old reasonings particularly those contained in my answer to thy last expostulatory nonsense and add the new as they fall from my pen and then i shall think myself invincible at least as arguing rake to rake see volume five letter fourteen i take the gaining of this lady to be essential to my happiness and is it not natural for all men to aim at obtaining whatever they think will make them happy be the object more or less considerable in the eyes of others as to the manner of endeavouring to obtain her, by falsification of oaths, vows, and the like, do not the poets of two thousand years and upwards tell us that Jupiter laughs at the perjuries of lovers? And let me add to what I have heretofore mentioned on that head a question or two. Do not the mothers, the aunts, the grandmothers, the governesses of the pretty innocents, always from their very cradles to riper years, preach to them the deceitfulness of men, that they are not to regard their oaths, vows, promises. What a parcel of fibbers 
what all these reverend matrons be if there were not now and then a pretty credulous rogue taken in for a justification of their preachments and to serve as a beacon lighted up for the benefit of the rest do we not then see that an honest prowling fellow is a necessary evil on many accounts do we not see that it is highly requisite that a sweet girl should be now and then drawn aside by him and the more eminent the girl in the graces of person mind and fortune is not the example likely to be the more efficacious if these postulata be granted me who i pray can equal my charmer in all these who therefore so fit for an example to the rest of her sex at worst i am entirely within my worthy friend mandeville's assertion that private vices are public benefits well then if this sweet creature must fall as it is called for the benefit of all the pretty fools of the sex she must and there is an end of the matter and what would there have been in it of uncommon or rare had i not been so long about it and so i dismiss all further argumentation and debate upon the question and i impose upon thee when thou writest to me an eternal silence on this head wafered on as an after-written introduction to the paragraphs which follow marked with turned commas thus lord jack what shall i do now how one evil brings on another how dreadful news to tell thee while i was meditating a simple robbery here have i in my own defence indeed been guilty of murder a bloody murder so i believe it will prove at her last gasp oh poor impertinent opposer eternally resisting eternally contradicting there she lies weltering in her blood her death's wound have i given her but she was a thief an impostor as well as a tormentor she had stolen my pen while i was sullenly meditating doubting as to my future measures she stole it and thus she wrote with it in a hand exactly like my own and would have faced me down that it was really my own handwriting but let me reflect before it is too late on the manifold perfections of this ever amiable creature let me reflect the hand yet is only held up the blow is not struck miss howe's next letter may blow thee up in policy thou shouldst be now at least honest thou canst not live without her thou wouldst rather marry her than lose her absolutely thou mayest undoubtedly prevail upon her inflexible as she seems to be for marriage but if now she finds thee a villain thou mayest never more engage her attention and she perhaps will refuse and abhor thee yet already have i not gone too far like a repentant thief afraid of his gang and obliged to go on in fear of hanging till he comes to be hanged i am afraid of the gang of my cursed contrivances as i hope to live i am sorry at the present writing that i have been such a foolish plotter as to put it as i fear i have done out of my own power to be honest i hate compulsion in all forms and cannot bear even to be compelled to be the wretch my choice has made me so now belford as thou hast said i am a machine at last and no free agent upon my soul jack it is a very foolish thing for a man of spirit to have brought himself to such a height of iniquity that he must proceed and cannot help himself and yet to be next to certain that this very victory will undo him why was such a woman as this thrown in my way whose very fall will be her glory and perhaps not only my shame but my destruction what a happiness must that man know who moves regularly to some laudable end and has nothing to reproach himself with in his progress to do it when by honest means 
he attains his end how great and unmixed must be his enjoyments what a happy man in this particular case had i been had it been given me to be only what i wished to appear to be thus far had my conscience written with my pen and see what a recreant she had made of me i seized her by the throat there there said i thou vile impertinent take that and that how often have i got thee warning and now i hope thou intruding barletess have i done thy business puling and a low voiced rearing up thy detested head in vain implorest thou my mercy who in thy day hast showed me so little take that for a rising blow and now will thy pain and my pain for thee soon be over lie there welter on had i not given thee thy death's wound thou wouldst have robbed me of all my joys thou couldst not have mended me tis plain thou couldst only have thrown me into despair didst thou not see that i had gone too far to recede well to on once more i bid thee gasp on that thy last gasp surely how hard diest thou adieu unhappy man adieu tis kind in thee however to bid me adieu 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 to thee o oh, thou inflexible until now unconquerable bosom intruder adieu to thee for ever End of letter one. Letter two of Clarissa Harlowe, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Clarissa Harlowe, Volume Six, by Samuel Richardson, Letter Two. Mister Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Sunday morn, June eleven, four o'clock. A few words to the verbal information thou sentest me last night concerning thy poor old man. And then I rise from my seat, shake myself a fresh new dress, and so to my charmer, whom, notwithstanding her reserves, I hope to prevail upon to walk out with me on the heath this warm and fine morning. The birds must have awakened her before now. They are in full song. She always gloried in accustoming herself to behold the sun rise, one of God's natural wonders, as once she called it. Her window salutes the east. The valleys must be gilded by his rays by the time I am with her, for already have they made the uplands smile, and the face of nature cheerful. How unsuitable wilt thou find this gay preface, to a subject so gloomy as that I am now turning to. I am glad to hear thy tedious expectations are at last answered. Thy servant tells me that thou art plaguely grieved at the old fellow's departure. I can't say, but thou mayest look as if thou wert, harassed as thou hast been for a number of days and nights, with a close attendance upon a dying man, beholding his drawing-on hour, pretending for decency's sake to whine over his excruciating pangs, to be in the way to answer a thousand impertinent inquirers after the health of a man that wishes to die, to pray by him, <laughs> for so once thou wrotest to me, to read by him, to be forced to join in consultation with a crew of solemn and parading doctors, 
and their officious zanies the apothecaries joined with the butcherly tribe of scarificators all combined to carry on the physical farce and to cut out thongs both from his flesh and his estate to have the superadded apprehension of dividing thy interest in what he shall leave with a crew of eager hoping never to be satisfied relations legatees and the devil knows who of private gratifiers of passions laudable and illaudable in these circumstances i wonder not that thou lookest before servants as little grieved as thou after airship as if thou indeed wert grieved and as if the most wry-faced woe had befallen thee then as i have often thought the reflection that must naturally arise from such mortifying objects as the death of one with whom we have been familiar must afford when we are obliged to attend it in its slow approaches and in its face twisting pangs that it will one day be our own case goes a great way to credit the appearance of grief and that it is this seriously reflected upon may temporarily give a fine air of sincerity to the wailings of lively widows heart exulting heirs and residuary legatees of all denominations since by keeping down the inward joy those interesting reflections must sadden the aspect and add an appearance of real concern to the assumed sables well but now thou art come to the reward of all thy watchings anxieties and close attendances tell me what it is tell me if it compensate thy trouble and answer thy hope as to myself thou seest by the gravity of my style how the subject has helped to mortify me but the necessity i am under of committing either speedy matrimony or a rape has saddened over my gayer prospects and more than the case itself contributed to make me sympathize with the present joyful sorrow adieu jack i must be soon out of my pain and my clarissa shall be soon out of hers for so does the arduousness of the case require end of letter two letter three of clarissa harlowe volume six this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 3. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Sunday morning. I have had the honour of my charmer's company for two complete hours. We met before six in Mrs. Moore's garden. A walk on the heath refused me. The sedateness of her aspect and her kind compliance in this meeting gave me hopes and all that either the captain and i had urged yesterday to obtain a full and free pardon that re-urged i and i told her besides that captain tomlinson was gone down with hopes to prevail upon her uncle harlow to come up in person in order to present to me the greatest blessing that man ever received 
but the utmost I could obtain was that she would take no resolution in my favour till she received Miss Howe's next letter. I will not repeat the arguments I used, but I will give thee the substance of what she said in answer to them. She had considered of everything, she told me. My whole conduct was before her. The house I carried her to must be a vile house. The people early showed what they were capable of in the earnest attempt made to fasten Miss Partington upon her, as she doubted not, with my approbation. Surely, thought I, she has not received the duplicate of Miss Howe's letter of detection? They heard her cries. My insult was undoubtedly premeditated by my whole recollected behaviour to her. Previous to it, it must be so. I had the vilest of views, no question, and my treatment of her put it out of all doubt. Soul over all, Belford, she seems sensible of liberties that my passion made me insensible of having taken, or she could not so deeply resent. She besought me to give over all thoughts of her. Sometimes, she said, she thought herself cruelly treated by her nearest and dearest relations. At such times, a spirit of repining, and even of resentment, took place, and the reconciliation at other times so desirable was not then so much the favourite wish of her heart, as was the scheme she had formerly planned, of taking her good Norton for her directress and guide, and living upon her own estate, in the manner her grandfather had intended she should live. This a scheme, she doubted not that her cousin Morden, who was one of her trustees for that estate, would enable her, and that, as she hoped, without litigation, to pursue. And if he can, and does, what, sir, let me ask you, said she, have I seen in your conduct that should make me prefer to it an union of interest where there is such a disunion in minds? Ha! So, thou seest, Jack, there is reason as well as resentment in the preference she makes against me. Thou seest that she presumes to think that she can be happy without me, and that she must be unhappy with me. I had besought her, in the conclusion of my re-urged arguments, to write to Miss Howe, before Miss Howe's answer could come, in order to lay before her the present state of things, and if she would pay a deference to her judgment, to let her have an opportunity to give it, on the full knowledge of the case. So I would, Mr. Lovelace, was the answer, if I were in doubt myself which I would prefer, marriage, or the scheme I have mentioned. You cannot think, sir, but the latter must be my choice. I wish to part with you with temper. Don't put me upon repeating. Part with me, madam, interrupted I. I cannot bear those words. But let me beseech you, however, to write to Miss Howe, I hope, 
if Miss Howe is not my enemy. She is not the enemy of your person, sir, as you would be convinced if you saw her last letter to me. The lady innocently means Mr. Lovelace's forged one. See volume 5, letter 30. But were she not an enemy to your actions, she would not be my friend, nor the friend of virtue. Why will you provoke from me, Mr. Lovelace, the harshness of expression which, however, which, however, deserved by you, I am unwilling just now to use, having suffered enough in the two past days from my own vehemence. I bit my lip for vexation, and was silent. Miss Howe, proceeded she, knows the full state of matters already, sir. The answer I expect from her respects myself, not you. Her heart is too warm in the cause of friendship to leave me in suspense one moment longer than is necessary as to what I want to know. Nor does her answer absolutely depend upon herself she must see a person first, and that person, perhaps, see others. The cursed smuggler woman, Jack! Miss Howe's town's end, I doubt not. Plot, contrivance, intrigue, stratagem, underground moles, these women. But let the earth cover me, let me be a mole too, thought I, if they carry their point and if this lady escape me now. She frankly owned that she had once thought of embarking out of all our ways for some one of our American colonies. But now that she had been compelled to see me, which had been her greatest dread, and which she might be happiest in the resumption of her former favourite scheme, if Miss Howe could find her a reputable and private asylum, till her cousin Morden could come. But if he came not soon, and if she had a difficulty to get to a place of refuge, whether from her brother or from anybody else, meaning me, I suppose, she might yet perhaps go abroad, for to say the truth, she could not think of returning to her father's house, since her brother's rage, her sister's upbraidings, her father's anger, her mother's still more affecting sorrowings, and her own consciousness under them all, would be unsupportable to her. Oh, Jack, I am sick to death. I pine, I die for miss howe's next letter i would bind gag strip rob and do anything but murder to intercept it but determined as she seems to be it was evident to me nevertheless that she had still some tenderness for me she often wept as she talked and much often aside she looked at me twice with an eye of undoubted gentleness, and three times oh, with an eye tending to compassion and softness. But its benign rays were as often snatched back, as I may say, and her face averted, as if her sweet eyes were not to be trusted, and could not stand against my eager eyes, seeking, as they did, for a lost heart in hers, and endeavouring to penetrate to her very soul. More than once I took her hand. She struggled not much against the freedom. I pressed it once with my lips. She was not very angry. A frown, indeed, but a frown that had more distress in it than indignation. 
how came the dear soul clothed as it is with such a silken vesture by all its steadiness was it necessary that the active gloom of such a tyrant of a father should commix with such a passive sweetness of a willless mother to produce a constancy an equanimity a steadiness in the daughter which never woman before could boast of if so she is more obliged to that despotic father than i could have imagined a creature to be who gave distinction to every one related to her beyond what the crown itself can confer see volume one letters nine fourteen and nineteen for what she herself says on that steadiness which mr lovelace though a deserved sufferer by it cannot help admiring i hoped i said that she would admit of the intended visit which i had so often mentioned of the two ladies she was here she had seen me she could not help herself at present she even had the highest regard for the ladies of my family because of their worthy characters there she turned away her sweet face and vanquished and half risen sigh i kneeled to her then it was upon a verdant cushion for we were upon the grass walk i caught her hand i besought her with an earnestness that called up as i could feel my heart to my eyes to make me by her forgiveness and example more worthy of them and of her own kind and generous wishes by my soul madam said i you stabbed me with your goodness your undeserved goodness and i cannot bear it why why thought i as i did several times in this conversation will she not generously forgive me why will she make it necessary for me to bring lady betty and my cousin to my assistance can the fortress expect the same advantageous capitulation which yields not to the summons of a resistless conqueror as if it gave not the trouble of bringing up and raising its heavy artillery against it what sensibilities said the divine creature withdrawing her hand must thou have suppressed what a dreadful what a judicial hardness of heart must thine be who canst be capable of such emotions as sometimes thou hast shown and of such sentiments as sometimes have flowed from thy lips yet canst have so far overcome them all as to be able to act as thou hast acted and that from subtle purpose and premeditation and this as it is said throughout the whole of thy life from infancy to this time i told her that i had hoped from the generous concern she had expressed for me when i was so suddenly and dangerously taken ill the ipacacuna experiment jack she interrupted me well have you rewarded me for the concern you speak of however i will frankly own now that i am determined to think no more of you that you might unsatisfied as i nevertheless was with you have made an interest she paused i besought her to proceed do you suppose sir and turned away her sweet face as we walked do you suppose that i had not thought of laying down a plan to govern myself by when i found myself so unhappily overreached and cheated as i may say out of myself 
when I found that I could not be and do what I wished to be and to do. Do you imagine that I had not cast about what was the next proper course to take? And do you believe that this next course has not caused me some pain to be obliged to? There again she stopped. But let us break off discourse, resumed she. The subject grows too. She sighed. Let us break off discourse. I will go in. I will prepare for church. The devil, thought I. Well, as I can appear in these everyday worn clothes, looking upon herself, I will go to church. She then turned from me to go into the house. Bless me, my beloved creature. Bless me with the continuance of this affecting conversation. Remorse has seized my heart. I have been excessively wrong. Give me farther cause to curse my heedless folly by the continuance of this calm but soul-penetrating conversation. No, no, Mr. Lovelace, I have said too much. Impatience begins to break in upon me. If you can excuse me to the ladies, it will be better for my mind's sake and for your credit's sake that I do not see them. Call me to them over nice, petulant, prudish, what you please call me to them. Nobody but Miss Howe, to whom, next to the Almighty and my own mother, I wish to stand acquitted of wilful error, shall know the whole of what has passed. Be happy as you may, deserve to be happy, and happy you will be, in your own reflection at least, were you to be ever so unhappy in other respects. For myself, if I ever shall be enabled, on due reflection, to look back upon my own conduct without the great reproach of having wilfully and against the light of my own judgment erred, I shall be more happy than if I had all that the world accounts desirable. The noble creature proceeded, for I could not speak. This self-acquittal when spirits are lent me to dispel the darkness which at present too often overclouds my mind, will, I hope, make me superior to all the calamities that can befall me. Her whole person was informed by her sentiments. She seemed to be taller than before. How the God within her exalted her, not only above me, but above herself. Divine creature! As I thought her, I called her. I acknowledged the superiority of her mind, and was proceeding, but she interrupted me. All human excellence, said she, is comparative only. My mind, I believe, is indeed superior to yours, debased as yours is by evil habits. But I had not known it to be so, if you had not taken pains to convince me of the inferiority of yours. How great, how sublimely great, this creature! By my soul, I cannot forgive her for her virtues. There is no bearing the consciousness of the infinite inferiority she charged me with. But why will she break from me when good resolutions are taking place? The red-hot iron she refuses to strike. Oh, why will she suffer the yielding wax to harden? We had gone but a few paces towards the house, when we were met by the impertinent woman, with notice that breakfast was ready. I could only with uplifted hands beseech her to give me hope of renewed conversation after breakfast. No! She would go to church, and into the house she went, and upstairs directly, nor would she oblige me with her company at the tea-table. I offered by Mrs. Moore, to quit both the table and the parlour, rather than she should exclude herself, or deprive the two widows of the favour of her company. That was not all the matter, she told Mrs. Moore. She had been struggling to keep down her temper. It had cost her some pains to do it. She was desirous to compose herself, in hopes to receive benefit by the divine worship she was going to join in. Mrs. Moore, hooped for her presence at dinner. She had rather be excused. Yet, if she could obtain the frame of mind she hoped for, 
she might not be averse to show that she had got above those sensibilities which gave consideration to a man who deserved not to be to her what he had been this said no doubt to let mrs moore know that the garden conversation had not been a reconciling one mrs moore seemed to wonder that we were not upon a better foot of understanding after so long a conference and the more as she believed that the lady had given in to the proposal for the repetition of the ceremony which i had told them was insisted upon by her uncle harlow but i accounted for this by telling both widows that she was resolved to keep on the reserve till she heard from captain tomlinson whether her uncle would be present in person at the solemnity or would name that worthy gentleman for his proxy again i enjoyed strict secrecy as to this particular which was promised by the widows as well as for themselves as for miss rawlins of whose taciturnity they gave me such an account as showed me that she was secret keeper general to all the women of fashion at hempstead the lord jack what a world of mischief at this rate must miss rawlins know what a pandora's box must her bosom be yet had i nothing that was more worthy of my attention to regard i would engage to open it and make my uses of the discovery and now belford thou perceivest that all my reliance is upon the mediation of lady betty and miss montague and upon the hope of intercepting miss howe's next letter End of letter three. A letter four of Clarissa Harlowe, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Clarissa Harlow Volume 6 Letter 4 Mr. Lovelace To John Belford Esquire This fair inexorable Is actually gone to church With Mrs. Moore And Mrs. Bevis but will closely attends her motions and i am in the way to receive any occasional intelligence from him she did not choose a mighty word with the sex as if they were always to have their own wills that i should wait upon her i did not much press it that she might not apprehend that i thought i had reason to doubt her voluntary return i once had it in my head to have found the widow bevis other employment and i believe she would have been as well pleased with my company as to go to church for she seemed irresolute when i told her that two out of the family were enough to go to church for one day but having her things on as the women call everything and her aunt more expecting her company she thought it best to go lest it should look oddly you know whispered she to one who was above regarding how it looked so here am i in my dining-room and have nothing to do but to write till they return and what will be my subject thinkest thou why the old beaten one to be sure self-debate through temporary remorse for the blow being not struck her guardian angel is redoubling his efforts to save her if it be not that 
and yet what power should her guardian angel have over me i don't know what it is that gives a check to my revenge whenever i meditate treason against so sovereign a virtue conscience is dead and gone as i told thee so it cannot be that a young conscience growing up like the phoenix from the ashes of the old one it cannot be surely ah oh, but if it were it would be hard if i could not overlay a young conscience well then it must be love i fancy love itself inspiring love of an object so adorable some little attention possibly paid likewise to thy whining arguments in her favour let love then be allowed to be the moving principle and the rather as love naturally makes the lover loath to disoblige the object of its flame and knowing that to an offence of the meditated kind will be a mortal offence to her cannot bear that i should think of giving it let love and me talk together a little on this subject be it a young conscience or love or thyself jack thou seest that i am forgiving every whiffler audience but this must be the last debate on this subject for is not her fate in a manner at its crisis and must not my next step be an irretrievable one tend it which way it will and now the debate is over a thousand charming things for love is gentler than conscience has this little urchin suggested in her favour he pretended to know both our hearts and he would have it that though my love was a prodigious strong and potent love and though it has the merit of many months faithful service to plead and has had infinite difficulties to struggle with yet that it is not the right sort of love right sort of love a puppy but with due regard to your deityship said i what merits has she with you that you should be of her party is hers i pray you a right sort of love is it love at all she don't pretend that it is she owns not your sovereignty what the devil moves you to plead thus earnestly for a rebel who despises your power and then he came with his apes and hands and it would have been and still as he believed would be love and a love of the exalted kind if i would encourage it by the right sort of love he talked of and in justification of his opinion pleaded her own confessions as well those of yesterday as of this morning and even went so far back as to my ipecacuana illness i never talked so familiarly with his godship before thou mayest think therefore that his dialect sounded oddly in my ears and then he told me how often i had thrown cold water upon the most charming flame that ever warmed a lady's bosom while but young and rising i require the definition of this right sort of love he tried at it but made a um, sorry hand of it nor could i for the soul of me be convinced that what he meant to extol was love upon the whole we had a noble controversy upon this subject in which he insisted upon the unprecedented merit of the lady nevertheless i got the better of him for he was struck absolutely dumb when waiving her present perverseness which yet was a sufficient answer to all his pleas i asserted and offered to prove it by a thousand instances impromptu that love was not governed by merit nor could be under the dominion of prudence 
or any other reasoning power. And if the lady were capable of love, it was of such a sort as he had nothing to do with, and which never before reigned in a female heart. I asked him what he thought of her flight from me, at a time when I was more than half overcome by the right sort of love he talked of. And then I showed him the letter she wrote, and left behind her for me, with an intention, no doubt, absolutely to break my heart, or to provoke me to hang, drown, or shoot myself, to say nothing of a multitude of declarations from her, defying his power, and imputing all that looked like love in her behaviour to me, to the persecution and rejection of her friends, which made her think of me but as a last resort. Love, then, gave her up. The letter, he said, deserved neither pardon nor excuse. He did not think he had been pleading for such a declared rebel, and as to the rest, he should be a betrayer of the right of his own sovereignty, if what I had alleged were true, and he was still to plead for her. I swore to the truth of all, and truly I swore, which perhaps I do not always do. And now what thinkest thou must become of the lady whom love itself gives up, and conscience cannot plead for? End of Letter 4letter five of clarissa harlowe volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org clarissa harlowe Volume six by Samuel Richardson Letter five Mr Lovelace to John Belford Esquire Sunday afternoon Oh Belford, what a hair's breadth escape have I had such a one that I tremble between terror and joy at the thought of what might have happened and did not what a perverse girl is this to contend with her fate yet has reason to think that her very stars fight against her <laughs> i am the luckiest of men ah but my breath almost fails me when i reflect upon what a slender thread my destiny hung but not to keep thee in suspense i have within this half hour obtained possession of the expected letter from miss howe and by such an accident but here, with the former, I dispatch this. Thy messenger waiting. End of letter five. Letter six of Clarissa Harlowe, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 6. Mr. Lovelace, in continuation thus it was my charmer accompanied mrs moore again to church this afternoon i had been in very earnest in the first place to obtain her company at dinner but in vain according to what she had said to mrs moore see letter three of this volume i was too considerable to her to be allowed that favour. In the next place, I besought her to favour me after dinner with another garden walk, 
but she would again go to church. And what reason have I to rejoice that she did? My worthy friend, Mrs. Bevis, thought one sermon a day well observed enough, so stayed at home to bear me company. The lady and Mrs. Moore had not been gone a quarter of an hour when a young country fellow on horseback came to the door and inquired for Mrs. Harriet Lucas. The widow and I, undetermined how we were to entertain each other, were in the parlour next the door, and hearing the fellow's inquiry, Oh, my dear Mrs. Bevis, said I, I am undone, undone for ever, if you don't help me out, since here, in all probability, is a messenger from that implacable Miss Howe, with a letter which, if delivered to Mrs. Lovelace, may undo all we have been doing. What? said she. Would you have me do? Call the maid in this moment, that I may give her her lesson, and if it be as I imagined, I'll tell you what you shall do. Margaret! Margaret, come in this minute! What answer, Mistress Margaret, did you give the man, upon his asking for Mrs. Harriet Lucas? He only asked what was his business and who he came from. For, sir, your honour's servant had told me how things stood, and I came at your call, madam, afore he answered me. Well, child, if ever you wish to be happy in wedlock yourself, and would have people disappointed who want to make mischief between you and your husband, get out of him his message, or letter if he has one, and bring it to me and say nothing to Mrs. Lovelace when she comes in, and here is a guinea for you. I will do all I can to serve your honour's worship for nothing. Nevertheless, with a ready hand, taking the guinea. For Mr. William tells me what a good gentleman you be. Away went Peggy to the fellow at the door. What is your business, friend, with Mrs. Harry Lucas? I must speak to her, her own self. My dearest widow, do you personate Mrs. Lovelace, for heaven's sake? Do you personate Mrs. Lovelace? I personate Mrs. Lovelace, sir? How can I do that? She is fair, I am brown. She is slender, I am plump. No matter, no matter. The fellow may be a new-come servant. He is not in livery, I see. You may not know her person. You can but be bloated and in a dropsy. Dropsical people look not so fresh and ruddy as I do. True, but the clown may not know that. Tis but for a present deception. Peggy, Peggy, called I, in a female tone, softly at the door. Madam, answered Peggy, and came up to me to the parlour door. Tell him the lady is ill, and has lain down upon the couch, and get his business from him, whatever ye do. Away went Peggy. Now, my dear widow, lie along the settee, and put your handkerchief over your face, that if he will speak to you himself, he may not see your eyes and your hair, sir. That's right. I'll step into the closet by you. I did so, returning. He won't deliver his business to me. He'll speak to Mrs. Harriet Lucas her own self. Holding the door in my hand. Tell him that this is Mrs. Harriet Lucas, and let him come in. Whisper him, if he doubts, that she is bloated, dropsical, and not the woman she was. Away went Marjorie. And now, my dear widow, let me see what a charming Mrs. Lovelace you'll make. Ask if he comes from Miss Howe. Ask if he lives with her. Ask how she does. Call her at every word, your dear Miss Howe. Offer him money. Take this half guinea for him. Complain of your head to have a pretence to hold it down, and cover your forehead and eyes with your hand, where your handkerchief hides not your face. That's right. And dismiss the rascal. Here he comes, as soon as you can. In came the fellow, 
bowing and scraping, his hat poked out before him with both his hands. I am sorry, madam, ain't please you, to find you bent well. What is your business with me, friend? You are Mrs. Harriet Lucas, I suppose, madam. Yes. Do you come from Miss Howe? I do, madam. Dost thou know my right name, friend? I can give a shrewd guess, but that is none of my business. What is thy business? I hope Miss Howe is well? Yes, madam, pure well. I thank God. I wish you were so too. I am too full of grief to be well. So belike I have hard to say. My head aches so dreadfully, I cannot hold it up. I must beg of you to let me know your business. Nay, and that be all my business is soon known. It is but to give this letter into your own particular hands. Here it is. From my dear friend, Miss Howe? Ah, oh, my head! Yes, madam, but I am sorry you are so bad. Do you live with Miss Howe? No, madam. I am one of her tenant's sons. Her lady mother must not know as how I came of this errand. But the letter, I suppose, will tell you all. How shall I satisfy you for this kind trouble? No how at all. What I do is for love of Miss Howe. She will satisfy me more than enough. But mayhap you can send no answer, you are so ill. Was you ordered to wait for an answer? No, I cannot say as that I was, but I was bidden to observe how you looked and how you was, and if you did write a line or two, to take care of it, and give it only to our young landlady in secret. You see I look strangely, not so well as I used to do. Nay, I don't know that I ever saw you but once before, and that was at a stile where I met you and my young landlady, but knew better than to stare a gentlewoman in the face, especially at a stile. Will you eat or drink, friend? A cup of small ale, I don't care if I do. Margaret, take the young man down and treat him with what the house affords. Your servant, madam. But I stayed to eat as I came along just upon the heath yonder, or else, to say the truth, I had been here sooner. Thank my stars, thought I, thou didst. A piece of powdered beef was upon the table at the sign of the castle, where I stopped to inquire for this house, and so, though I only intended to wet my whistle, I could not help eating. So shall only taste of your ale, for the beef was woundily corned. Prating dog pox on thee, thought I. He withdrew, bowing and scraping. Margaret, whispered I in a female voice, whispering out of the closet and holding the parlour door in my hand, get him out of the house as fast as you can, lest they come from church and catch him here. Never fear, sir. The fellow went down, and it seems, drank a large draught of ale. And Margaret, finding him very talkative, told him she begged his pardon, but she had a sweetheart, just come from sea, whom she was forced to hide in the pantry, so was sure he would excuse her from staying with him. Ay, ay, to be sure, the clown said, for if he could not make sport, he would spoil none. But, he whispered her, that one squire Lovelace was a damnation rogue, if the truth might be told. For what? said Margaret, and could have given him, she told the widow, who related to me all this, a good douse of the chaps, for kissing all the women he came near. At the same time, the dog wrapped himself round Marjorie, and gave her a smack that, she told Mrs. Bevis afterwards, she might have heard into the parlour. Such, Jack, is human nature. Thus does it operate in all degrees, and so does the clown, as well as his practices. Yet this sly dog knew not, but the wench had a sweetheart locked up in the pantry. If the truth were known, some of the ruddy-faced dairy wenches might perhaps call him a damnation rogue, as justly as their betters of the same sex might squire lovelies. The fellow told the maid that, by what he discovered of the young lady's face, it looked very rosy to what he took it to be, and he thought her a good deal fatter as she lay, and not so tall. All women are born to intrigue, Jack, 
and practice it more or less, as fathers, guardians, governesses from dear experience can tell, and in love affairs are naturally expert and quicker in their wits by half than men. This ready, the raw wench, gave an instance of this, and improved on the dropsical hint I had given her. The lady's seeming plumpness was owing to a dropsical disorder, and to the round posture she lay in, very likely, truly. Her appearing to him to be shorter, he might have observed, was owing to her drawing her feet up from pain, and because the couch was too short, she supposed. Add so, he did not think of that. Her rosy colour was owing to her grief and headache. Ay, that might very well be, but he was highly pleased that he had given the letter into Mrs. Harriet's own hand, as he should tell Miss Howe. He desired once more to see the lady at his going away, and would not be denied. The widow therefore sat up with her handkerchief over her face, leaning her head against the wainscot. He asked if she had any particular message. No, she was so ill she could not write. It was a great grief to her. Should he call the next day? For he was going to London, now he was so near, and should stay at a cousin's that night, uh, who lived in a street called Fetter Lane. No, she would write as soon as able, and send by the poem. Well, then, if she had nothing to send by him, mayhap he might stay in town a day or two, for he had never seen the lions in the town, nor Bedlam, nor the tombs, and he would make a holiday or two, as he had leave to do, if she had no business or message that required his posting down next day. She had not. She offered him the half-guinea I had given her for him, but he refused it, with great professions of disinterestedness and love, as he called it, to Miss Howe, to serve whom he would ride to the world's end, or even to Jericho. And so the shocking rascal went away, and glad at my heart was I when he was gone, for I feared nothing so much as that he would have stayed till they came from church. Thus, Jack, got I my heart's ease the letter of Miss Howe, and through such a train of accidents as makes me say that the lady's stars fight against her, but yet I must attribute a good deal to my own precaution in having taken right measures, for had I not secured the widow by my stories, and the maid by my servant, all would have signified nothing, and so heartily were they secured, the one by a single guinea, the other by half a dozen warm kisses, and the aversion they both had to such wicked creatures as delighted in making mischief between man and wife, that they promised that neither Mrs. Moore, Miss Rawlins, Mrs. Lovelace, nor anybody living should know anything of the matter. The widow rejoiced that I had got the mischief-maker's letter. I excused myself to her, and instantly withdrew with it, and after I had read it, fell to my shorthand, to acquaint thee with my good luck, and they not returning so soon as church was done, stepping, as it proved, into Miss Rawlins's, and tarrying there a while, uh, to bring that busy girl with them to drink tea, I wrote thus far to thee, uh, that thou mightest, when thou camest to this place, rejoice with me upon the occasion. They are all through just come in. I hasten to them. End of Letter 6。Letter 7 of Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Clarissa Harlow Volume 6 By Samuel Richardson Letter 7 
Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. I have begun another letter to thee, in continuation of my narrative, but I believe I shall send thee this, before I shall finish that. By the enclosed thou wilt see that neither of the correspondents deserve mercy from me, and I am resolved to make the ending with one, the beginning with the other. If thou sayest that the provocations I have given to one of them will justify her freedoms, I answer, so they will, to any other person but myself. But he that is capable of giving those provocations, and has the power to punish those who abuse him for giving them, will show his resentment, and the more remorselessly, perhaps, as he has deserved the freedoms. If thou sayest it is, however, wrong to do so, I reply that it is nevertheless human nature. And wouldst thou not have me to be a man, Jack? Here, read the letter, if thou wilt, but thou art not my friend, if thou offerest to plead for either of the saucy creatures, after thou hast read it. To Mrs. Harriot Lucas, at Mrs. Moore's, at Hampstead, June 10. After the discoveries I had made of the villainous machinations of the most abandoned of men, particularized in my long letter of Wednesday last, you will believe, my dearest friend, that my surprise upon perusing yours of Thursday evening from Hampstead was not so great as my indignation. Had the villain attempted to fire a city instead of a house, I should not have wondered at it. All that I am amazed at is that he, whose boast, as I am told, it is, that no woman shall keep him out of her bedchamber, when he has made a resolution to be in it, did not discover his foot before and it is as strange to me that having got you at such a shocking advantage and in such a horrid house you could at the time escape dishonour and afterwards get from such a set of infernals i gave you in my long letter of wednesday and thursday last reasons why you ought to mistrust that specious tomlinson that man my dear must be a solemn villain may lightning from heaven blast the wretch who has set him and the rest of his remorseless gang at work to endeavour to destroy the most consummate virtue heaven be praised you have escaped from all their snares and now are out of danger so i will not trouble you at present with the particulars i have further collected relating to this abominable imposture for the same reason i forbear to communicate to you some new stories of the abhorred wretch himself which have come to my ears one in particular of so shocking a nature indeed my dear the man's a devil the whole story of mrs fretchville and her house i have no doubt to pronounce likewise an absolute fiction fellow how my soul spurns the villain you thought of going abroad and your reasons for so doing most sensibly affect me but be comforted my dear i hope you will not be under a necessity of quitting your native country were i sure that that must be the cruel case i would abandon all my better prospects and soon be with you and i would accompany you whithersoever you went and share fortunes with you for it is impossible that i should be happy if i knew that you were exposed not only to the perils of the sea but to the attempts of other vile men your personal grace is attracting every eye and exposing you to those hourly dangers which others less distinguished by the gifts of nature might avoid all that i know that beauty so greatly coveted and so greatly admired is good for oh my dear were i ever to marry and to be the mother of a clarissa clarissa must be the name if promisingly lovely how often would my heart ache for the dear creature as she grew up when i reflected that a prudence and discretion unexampled in woman had not in you been a sufficient protection to that beauty which had drawn after it as many admirers as beholders how little should i regret the attacks of that cruel distemper as it is called 
which frequently makes the greatest ravages in the finest faces saturday afternoon i have just parted with mrs townsend i thought you had once seen her with me but she says she never had the honour to be personally known to you she has a man-like spirit she knows the world and her two brothers being in town she is sure she can engage them in so good a cause and if there should be occasion both their ships crews in your service give your consent my dear and the horrid villain shall be repaid with broken bones at least for all his vileness the misfortune is mrs townsend cannot be with you till thursday next or wednesday at soonest are you sure you can be safe where you are till then i think you are too near london and perhaps you had better be in it if you remove let me the very moment know whither how my heart is torn to think of the necessity so dear a creature is driven to of hiding herself devilish fellow he must have been sportive and wanton in his inventions yet that cruel that savage supportiveness has saved you from the sudden violence to which he has had recourse in the violation of others of names and families not contemptible for such the villain always gloried to spread his snares the vileness of this specious monster has done more than any other consideration could do to bring mr hickman into credit with me mr hickman alone knows from me of your flight and the reason of it had i not given him the reason he might have thought still worse of the vile attempt i communicated it to him by showing him your letter from hampstead when he had read it and he trembled and reddened as he read he threw himself at my feet and besought me to permit him to attend you and to give you the protection of his house the good-natured man had tears in his eyes and was repeatedly earnest on this subject proposing to take his chariot and four or a set and in person in the face of all the world give himself the glory of protecting such an oppressed innocent i could not but be pleased with him and i let him know that i was i hardly expected so much spirit from him but a man's passiveness to a beloved object of our sex may not perhaps argue want of courage on proper occasions i thought i ought in return to have some consideration for his safety as such an open step would draw upon him the vengeance of the most villainous enterpriser in the world who has always a gang of fellows such as himself at his call ready to support one another in the vilest outrages but yet as mr hickman might have strengthened his hands by legal recourses i should not have stood upon it had i not known your delicacy since such a step must have made a great noise and given occasion for scandal as if some advantage had been gained over you and were there not the greatest probability that all might be more silently and more effectually managed by mrs townsend's means mrs townsend will in person attend you she hopes on wednesday her brothers and some of their people will scatteringly and as if they knew nothing of you so we have contrived see you safe not only to london but to her house at deptford she has a kinswoman who will take your commands there if she herself be obliged to leave you and there you may stay till the wretch's fury on losing you and his search are over he will very soon tis likely enter upon some new villainy which may engross him and it may be given out that you are gone to lay claim to the protection of your cousin morden at florence possibly if he can be made to believe it he will go over in hopes to find you there after a while i can procure you a lodging in one of our neighbouring villages where i may have the happiness to be your daily visitor and if this hickman be not silly and appish and if my mother do not do unaccountable things i may the sooner think of marrying that i may without control receive and entertain the darling of my heart many very many happy days do i hope we shall yet see together and as this is my hope i expect that it will be your consolation as to your estate since you are resolved not to litigate for it we will be patient either till colonel morden arrives or till shame compels some people to be just upon the whole i cannot but think your prospects now much happier than they could have been had you been actually married to such a man as this i must therefore congratulate you upon your escape not only from a horrid libertine but from so vile a husband as he must have made to any woman but more especially to a person of your virtue and delicacy you hate him heartily hate him i hope my dear i am sure you do 
it would be strange if so much purity of life and manners were not to abhor what is so repugnant to itself in your letter before me you mention one written to me for a faint i have not received any such depend upon it therefore that he must have it and if he has it is a wonder that he did not likewise get my long one of the seventh heaven be praised that he did not and that it came safe to your hands i send this by a young fellow whose father is one of our tenants with command to deliver it to no other hands but yours he is to return directly if you give him any letter if not he will proceed to london upon his own pleasures he is a simple fellow but very honest so you may say anything to him if you write not by him i desire a line or two as soon as possible my mother knows nothing of his going to you nor yet of your abandoning the fellow forgive me but he is not entitled to good manners i shall long to hear how you and mrs townsend order matters i wish she could have been with you sooner but i have lost no time in engaging her as you will suppose i refer to her what i have further to say and advise so shall conclude with my prayers that heaven will direct and protect my dearest creature and make your future days happy anna howe and now jack i will suppose that thou hast read this cursed letter allow me to make a few observations upon some of its contents it is strange to miss howe that having got her friend at such a shocking advantage etc and it is strange to me too if ever i have such another opportunity given to me the cause of both our wonder i believe will cease so thou seest tomlinson is further detected no such person as mrs fretchville may lightning from heaven o oh lord o oh lord o oh lord what a horrid vixen is this my gang my remorseless gang too is brought in and thou wilt plead for these girls again wilt thou heaven be praised she says that her friend is out of danger miss her should be sure of that and that she herself is safe but for this termagant as i often said i must surely have made a better hand of it new stories of me jack what can they be i have not found that my generosity to my rosebud ever did me due credit with this pair of friends very hard belford that credits cannot be set against debits and a balance struck in a rake's favour as well as in that of every common man but he from whom no good is expected is not allowed the merit of the good he does i ought to have been a little more attentive to character than i have been for notwithstanding that the measures of right and wrong are said to be so manifest let me tell thee that character biases and runs away with all mankind let a man or woman once establish themselves in the world's opinion and all that either of them do will be sanctified nay in the very courts of justice does not character acquit or condemn as often as facts and sometimes even in spite of facts yet impolitic that i have been and am to be so careless of mine and now i doubt it is irretrievable but to leave moralizing thou jack knowest almost all my enterprises worth remembering can this particular story which this girl hints at be that of lucy villas or can she have heard of my intrigue with the pretty gypsy who met me in norwood and of the trap i caught her cruel husband in a fellow as gloomy and tyrannical as old harlow when he pursued a wife who would not have deserved ill of him if he had deserved well of her but he was not quite drowned the man is alive at this day and miss howe mentions the story as a very shocking one besides both these are a twelve-month-old or more but evil payment scandal are always new 
when the offender has forgot a vile fact it is often told to one and to another who having never heard of it before trumpet it about as a novelty to others but well said the honest corregidor at madrid a saying with which i encroached lord m s collection good actions are remembered but for a day bad ones for many years after the life of the guilty such is the relish that the world has for scandal in other words such is the desire which every one has to exculpate himself by blackening his neighbour you and i belford have been very kind to the world in furnishing it with opportunities to gratify its devil miss howe will abandon her own better prospects and share fortunes with her were she to go abroad charming romancer i must set about this girl jack i have always had hopes of a woman whose passions carry her to such altitudes had i attacked miss howe first her passions inflamed and guided as i could have managed them would have brought her into my lure in a fortnight but thinkest thou and yet i think thou dost that there is anything in these high flights among the sex verily jack these vehement friendships are nothing but chaff and stubble liable to be blown away by the very wind that raises them apes mere apes of us they think the word friendship has a pretty sound with it and it is much talked of a fashionable word and so truly a single woman who thinks she has a soul and knows that she wants something will be thought to have found a fellow soul for it in her own sex but i repeat that the word is a mere word the thing a mere name with them a cork-bottomed shuttlecock which they are fond of striking to and fro to make one another glow in the frosty weather of a single state but which when a man comes in between the pretended inseparables is given up like their music and other maidenly amusements which nevertheless may be necessary to keep the pretty rogues out of active mischief they then in short having caught the fish lay aside the net he alludes here to the story of a pope who once a poor fisherman through every preferment he rose to even to that of the cardinalate hung up in view of all his guests his net as a token of humility but when he arrived at the pontificate he took it down saying that there was no need of the net when he had caught the fish thou hast a mind perhaps to make an exception for these two ladies with all my heart my clarissa has if woman has a soul capable of friendship her flame is bright and steady but miss howe's were it not kept up by her mother's opposition is too vehement to endure how often have I known opposition not only cement friendship, but create love? I doubt not, but poor Hickman would fare the better with this vixen, if her mother were as heartily against him as she is for him. Thus much, indeed, as to these two ladies, I will grant thee that the active spirit of the one and the meek disposition of the other may make their friendship more durable than it would otherwise be for this is certain that in every friendship whether male or female there must be a man and a woman spirit that is to say one of them must be a forbearing one to make it permanent but this i pronounce as a truth which all experience confirms that friendship between women 
never holds to the sacrifice of capital gratifications, or to the endangering of life, limb, or estate, as it often does in our nobler sex. Well, but next comes an indictment against poor beauty. What has beauty done that Miss Howe should be offended at it? Miss Howe, Jack, is a charming girl. She has no reason to quarrel with beauty. Didst ever see her? Too much fire and spirit in her eye, indeed, for a girl, but oh, that's no fault with a man that can lower that fire and spirit of pleasure, and I know I am the man that can. For my own part, when I was first introduced to this lady, which was by my goddess, when she herself was a visitor at Mrs. Howe's, I had not been half an hour with her, but I even hungered and thirsted after a romping bout with a lively rogue, and in the second or third visit was more deterred by the delicacy of her friend than by what I apprehended from her own. This charming creature's presence, thought I, awes us both, and I wished her absence, though any other woman were present, that I might try the differences in Miss Howe's behaviour before her friend's face or behind her back. Delicate women make delicate women, as well as decent men. With all Miss Howe's fire and spirit, it was easy to see by her very eye that she watched for lessons and feared reproof from the penetrating eye of her milder dispositioned friend. Miss Howe, in volume three, letter nineteen, says that she was always more afraid of Clarissa than of her mother and in volume three, letter forty-four, that she fears her almost as much as she loves her, and in many other places in her letters, verifies this observation of Lovelace. And yet it was as easy to observe in the candour and sweet manners of the other that the fear which Miss Howe stood in of her was more owing to her own generous apprehension that she fell short of her excellences than to Miss Harlowe's consciousness of excellence over her. I have often, since I came at Miss Howe's letters, revolved this just and fine praise contained in one of them. See Volume 4, Letter 31. Every one saw that the preference they gave you to themselves exalted you, not into any visible triumph over them, for you had always something to say on every point you carried, that raised the yielding heart, and left every one pleased and satisfied with themselves, though they carried not off the palm. As I propose, in a more advanced life, to endeavour to atone for my useful freedoms with individuals of the sex, by giving cautions and instructions to the whole, I have made a memorandum to enlarge upon this doctrine, to wit, that it is full as necessary to direct daughters in the choice of their female companions, as it is to guard them against the designs of men. I say not this, however, to the disparagement of Miss Howe. She has, from pride, what her friend has from principle. The Lord help the sex if they had not pride. But yet I am confident that Miss Howe is indebted to the conversation and correspondence of Miss Harlowe for her highest improvements. But both these ladies out of the question. I make no scruple to aver, and I, Jack, should know something of the matter, that there have been more girls ruined, at least prepared for ruin, by their own sex, taking in servants as well as companions, than directly 
by the attempts and delusions of men. But it is time enough when I am old and joyless to enlarge upon this topic. As to the comparison between the two ladies, I will expatiate more on that subject, for I like it, when I have had them both. Which this letter of the vixen girls, I hope thou wilt allow, warrants me to try for. I return to the consideration of a few more of its contents to justify my vengeances so nearly now in view. As to Mrs. Townsend, the man-like spirit, the two brothers, and the ship's crews, I say nothing but this to the insolent threatening, let him come. But as to her sordid menace, to repay the horrid villain, as she calls me, for all my vileness by broken bones. Broken bones, Belford, who can bear this portly threatening? Broken bones, Jack, damn the little bogger, give me a name for her. But I banish all furious resentment. If I get these two girls into my power, heaven forbid that I should be a second Phalaris, who turned his bull upon the artist. No bones of theirs will I break. They shall come off with me upon much lighter terms. But these fellows are smugglers, it seems, and am not I a smuggler too? I am, and have not the least doubt but I shall have secured my goods before Thursday or Wednesday either. But did I want a plot? What a charming new one! Does this letter of Miss Howe strike me out? I am almost sorry that I have fixed upon one, for here how easy would it be for me to assemble a crew of swabbers, and to create a Mrs. Townsend, whose person, thou seest, my beloved knows not, to come on Tuesday at Miss Howe's repeated solicitations, in order to carry my beloved to a warehouse of my own providing. Ah, this, however, is my triumphant hope that at the very time that these ragamuffins will be at Hampstead looking for us, my dear Miss Harlow and I, so the fates I imagine have ordained, shall be fast asleep in each other's arms in town. Lie still, villain, till the time come, my heart, Jack, my heart, it is always thumping away on the remotest prospects of this nature. But it seems that the vileness of this specious monster, meaning me, Jack, has brought Hickman into credit with her, so I have done some good, but to whom I cannot tell, for this poor fellow, should I permit him to have this termagant, will be punished, as many times we all are, by the enjoyment of his own wishes, nor can she be happy as I take it with him were he to govern himself by her will and have none of his own since never was there a directing wife who knew where to stop power makes such a one wanton she despises the man she can govern like alexander who wept that he had no more worlds to conquer she will be looking out for new exercises for her power till she grow uneasy to herself a discredit to her husband and a plague to all about her but this honest fellow, it seems, with tears in his eyes, and with humble prostration, besought the vixen to permit him to set out in his chariot and four, in order to give himself the glory of protecting such an oppressed innocent in the face of the whole world. Oh, nay, he reddened, it seems, and trembled, too, as he read the fair complainant's letter how valiant is all this women love brave men and no wonder that his tears his trembling and his prostration gave him high reputation with the meek miss how but dost think jack that i in the like case and equally affected with the distress should have acted thus dost think that i should not first have rescued the lady and then if needful have asked excuse for it the lady in my hand wouldst not thou have done thus as well as i but tis best as it is 
Honest Hickman may now sleep in a whole skin, and yet that is more, perhaps, than he would have done, the lady's deliverance unattempted, had I come at this requested permission of his any other way than by a letter that it must not be known that I have intercepted. Miss Howe thinks I may be diverted from pursuing my charmer by some new started villainy. Villainy is a word that she is extremely fond of, but I can tell her that it is impossible I should till the end of this villainy be obtained. A difficulty is a stimulus with such a spirit as mine. I thought Miss Hearn knew me better. Were she to offer herself person for person in the romancing zeal of her friendship to save her friend, it should not do while the dear creature is on this side the moon. She thanks heaven that her friend has received her letter of the seventh. We are all glad of it. She ought to thank me too, but I will not at present claim her thanks. But when she rejoices that the letter went safe, does she not, in effect, call out for vengeance and expect it? All in good time, Miss Howe. When settest thou out for the Isle of Wight, love? I will close at this time, with desiring thee to make a list of the virulent terms with which the enclosed letter abounds, and then, if thou supposest that I have made such another, and have added to it all the flowers of the same blow, in the former letters of the same saucy creature, and those in that of Miss Harlowe, which she left for me on her elopement, thou wilt certainly think that I have provocation sufficient to justify me in all that I shall do to either. Return the enclosed the moment thou hast perused it. End of Letter 7 Letter 8 of Clarissa Harlowe, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Clarissa Harlow Volume 6 by Samuel Richardson Letter 8 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire Sunday night, Monday morning I went down with revenge in my heart the contents of Miss Howe's letter almost engrossing me, the moment that Miss Harlow and Mrs. Moore, accompanied by Miss Rawlins, came in. But in my countenance all the gentle, the placid, the serene that the glass could teach, and in my behaviour all the polite that such an unpolite creature as she has often told me I am, could put on. Miss Rawlins was sent for home, almost as soon as she came in, to entertain an unexpected visitor, to her great regret, as well as to the disappointment of my fair one, as I could perceive from the looks of both, for they had agreed, it seems, if I went to town, as I said I intended to do, to take a walk upon the heath, at least in Mrs. Moore's garden, and who knows what might have been the issue, had the spirit of curiosity in the one met with the spirit of communication in the other. Miss Rawlins promised to return, if possible, but sent to excuse herself her visitor intending to stay with her all night. I rejoiced in my heart at her message, 
and after much supplication, obtained the favour of my beloved's company for another walk in the garden, having, as I told her, abundance of things to say, to propose, and to be informed of, in order, ultimately, to govern myself in my future steps. She had vouchsafed, I should have told thee, with eyes turned from me, and in a half-aside attitude, to sip two dishes of tea in my company. Dear soul, how anger unpolishes the most polite, for I never saw Miss Harlow behave so awkwardly. I imagine she knew not how to be awkward. When we were in the garden, I poured my whole soul into her attentive ear, and besought her returning favour. She told me that she had formed her scheme for her future life, that vile as the treatment was which she had received from me, that was not all the reason she had for rejecting my suit but that, on the maturest deliberation, she was convinced that she could neither be happy with me, nor make me happy, and she enjoined me, for both our sakes, to think no more of her. The captain, I told her, was rid down post in a manner to forward my wishes with her uncle. Lady Betty and Miss Montague were undoubtedly arrived in town by this time. I would set out early in the morning to attend them. They adored her. They longed to see her. They would see her. They would not be denied her company in Oxfordshire. Whither could she better go to be free from her brother's insults? Whither to be absolutely made unapprehensive of anybody else? Might I have any hopes of her returning favour, if Miss Howe could be prevailed upon to intercede for me? <laughs> Miss Howe prevailed upon to intercede for you, repeated she, with a scornful bridle, but a very pretty one. And there she stopped. I repeated the concern it would be to me to be under a necessity of mentioning the misunderstanding to Lady Betty and my cousin, as a misunderstanding still to be made up and as if I were of very little consequence to a dear creature who was of so much to me, urging that these circumstances would extremely lower me, not only in my own opinion, but in that of my relations. But still she referred to Miss Howe's next letter and all the concession I could bring her to in this whole conference was that she would wait the arrival and visit of the two ladies, if they came in a day or two, or before she received the expected letter from Miss Ham. Thank heaven for this, thought I, and now may I go to town with hopes at my return to find thee, dearest, where I shall leave thee. But yet, as she may find reasons to change her mind in my absence, I shall not entirely trust to this. My fellow, therefore, who is in the house, and who, by Mrs. Bevis's kind intelligence, will know every step she can take, shall have Andrew and a horse ready to give me immediate notice of her motions and, moreover, go whither she will, he shall be one of her retinue, though unknown to herself, if 
possible. This was all I could make of the fair inexorable. Should I be glad of it, or sorry for it? Glad, I believe. And yet my pride is confoundedly abated, to think that I had so little hold in the affections of this daughter of the Harlows. Don't tell me that virtue and principle are her guides on this occasion. Tis pride, a greater pride than my own, that governs her. Love she has none, thou seest, nor ever had, at least not in a superior degree. Love that deserves the name never was under the dominion of prudence or of any reasoning power. She cannot bear to be thought a woman, I warrant, and if in the last attempt I find her not one, what will she be the worse for the trial? No one is to blame for suffering an evil he cannot shun or avoid. Were a general to be overpowered and robbed by a highwayman, would he be less fit for the command of an army on that account? If, indeed, the general, pretending great valour, and having boasted that he never would be robbed, were to make but faint resistance when he was brought to the test, and to yield his purse when he was master of his own sword, then, indeed, will the highwayman who robs him be thought the braver man. But from these last conferences am I furnished with one argument in defence of my favourite purpose, which I never yet pleaded. Oh, Jack, what a difficulty must a man be allowed to have to conquer a predominant passion, be it what it will, when the gratifying of it is in his power, however wrong he knows it to be, to resolve to gratify it. Reflect upon this, and then wilt thou be able to account for, if not to excuse, a projected crime which has habit to plead for it, in a breast as stormy, as uncontrollable. This that follows is my new argument. Should she fail in the trial? Should I succeed? And should she refuse to go on with me? And even resolve not to marry me, of which I can have no notion? And should she disdain to be obliged to me for the handsome provision I should be proud to make for her? even to the half of my estate. Yet cannot she be altogether unhappy? Is she not entitled to an independent fortune? Will not Colonel Morton, as her trustee, put her in possession of it? And did she not, in our former conference, point out the way of life that she always preferred to the married life? to wit, to take her good Norton for her directress and guide, and to live upon her own estate, in the manner her grandfather desired she should live. See letter three of this volume. It is moreover to be considered that she cannot, according to her own notions, recover above one half of her fame were we not to intermarry. So much does she think she has suffered by her going off with me. And will she not be always repining and mourning for the loss of the other half? And if she must live a life of such uneasiness and regret for half, may she not as well repine and mourn for the whole? Nor, let me tell thee, will her own scheme of penitence in this case be half so perfect if she do not fall as if she does. 
for what a foolish penitent will she make, who has nothing to repent of. She piques herself, thou knowest, and makes it matter of reproach to me that she went not off with me by her own consent, but was tricked out of herself. Nor upbraid thou me upon the meditated breach of vows so repeatedly made. She will not, thou seest, permit me to fulfil them. And if she would, this I have to say, that at the time I made the most solemn of them, I was fully determined to keep them. But what prince thinks himself obliged any longer to observe the articles of treaties the most sacredly sworn to, than suits with his interest or inclination, although the consequence of the infraction must be, as he knows, the destruction of thousands. Is not this, then, the result of all, that Miss Clarissa Harlowe, if it be not her own fault, may be as virtuous after she has lost her honour, as it is called, as she was before. She may be a more eminent example to her sex, and if she yield, a little yield, in the trial, may be a complete penitent. Nor can she, but by her own wilfulness, be reduced to low fortunes. And thus may her old nurse and she, an old coachman, and a pair of old coach-horses, and two or three old maid-servants, and perhaps a very old footman or two, for everything will be old and penitential about her, live very comfortably together, reading old sermons and old prayer-books, and relieving old men and old women, and giving old lessons and old warnings upon new subjects as well as old ones to the young ladies of her neighbourhood, and so pass on to a good old age, doing a great deal of good, both by precept and example in her generation. And is a woman who can live thus prettily without control, whoever did prefer, and who still prefers, the single to the married life, and who will be enabled to do everything that the plan she had formed will direct her to do, be said to be ruined, undone, and such sort of stuff. I have no patience with the pretty fools who use these strong words to describe a transit of evil, an evil which a mere church form makes none. At this rate of romancing, how many flourishing ruins dost thou as well as I know? Let us but look about us, and we shall see some of the haughtiest and most censorious spirits among our acquaintance of that sex now passing for chaste wives, of whom strange stories might be told, and others whose husbands' hearts have been made to ache for their gaieties, both before and after marriage, and yet know not half so much of them as some of us honest fellows could tell em. But having thus satisfied myself in relation to the worst that can happen to this charming creature, and that it will be her own fault if she be unhappy, I have not at all reflected upon what is likely to be my own lot. This has always been my notion though Miss Howe grudges us rakes the best of the sex, and says that the worst is too good for us, that the wife of a libertine ought to be pure, spotless, uncontaminated. To what purpose has such a one lived a free life, but to know the world, 
and to make his advantages of it. And to be very serious, it would be a misfortune to the public for two persons, heads of a family, to be both bad. Sins between two such, a race of varlets might be propagated, Lovelaces and Belfords, if thou wilt, who might do great mischief in the world. Thou seest at bottom that I am not an abandoned fellow, and that there is a mixture of gravity in me. This, as I grow older, may increase, and when my active capacity begins to abate, I may sit down with the preacher and resolve all my past life into vanity and vexation of spirit. This is certain, that I shall never find a woman so well suited to my taste as Miss Clarissa Harlow. I only wish that I may have such a lady as her to comfort and adorn my setting sun. I have often thought it very unhappy for us both that so excellent a creature sprang up a little too late for my setting out, and a little too early in my progress before I can think of returning. And yet, as I have picked up the sweet traveller in my way, I cannot help wishing that she would bear me company in the rest of my journey, although she were stepping out of her own path to oblige me. And then, perhaps, we could put up in the evening at the same inn, and be very happy in each other's conversation, recounting the difficulties and dangers we had passed in our way to it. I imagine that thou wilt be apt to suspect that some passages in this letter were written in town. Why, Jack, I cannot but say, that the Westminster air is a little grosser than that at Hampstead, and the conversation of Mrs. Sinclair and the nymphs less innocent than Mrs. Moore's and Miss Rowland's. And I think in my heart I can say and write those things at one place, which I cannot at the other, nor indeed anywhere else. I came to town about seven this morning, all necessary directions and precautions remembered to be given. I besought the favour of an audience before I set out. I was desirous to see which of her lovely faces she was pleased to put on, after another night had passed. But she was resolved, I found, to leave our quarrel open. She would not give me an opportunity so much as to entreat her again to close it, before the arrival of Lady Betty and my cousin. I had notice from my proctor, by a few lines brought by a man and horse just before I set out, that all difficulties had been for two days past surmounted, and that I might have the license for fetching. I sent up the letter to my beloved by Mrs. Bevis, with a repeated request for admittance to her presence upon it, but neither did this stand me instead. I suppose she thought it would be allowing of the consequences that were naturally to be expected to follow the obtaining of this instrument, if she had consented to see me on the contents of this letter, having refused me that honour before I sent it up to her. No surprising her. No advantage to be taken of her in attention to the nicest circumstances. And now, Belford, I set that upon business. End of letter eight. Letter nine of Clarissa Harlow, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
Please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlowe, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 9 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, Monday, June 12th. Does there ever see a license, Jack? Edmund, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of London, to our well-beloved in Christ, Robert Lovelace, your servant, my good lord. What have I done to merit so much goodness, who never saw your lordship in my life? Of the parish of St. Martin's in the Fields, bachelor, and Clarissa Hollow of the same parish, spinster, sandeth greeting whereas ye are as is alleged determined to enter into the holy state of matrimony this is only alleged thou observest by and with the consent of etc 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 and are very desirous of obtaining your marriage to be solemnized in the face of the church we are willing that your honest desires honest desires jack may more speedily have their due effect and therefore that ye may be able to procure such marriage to be freely and lawfully solemnized in the parish church of st martin's in the fields or st charles's in the fields in the county of Middlesex, by the rector, vicar, or curate thereof, at any time of the year. At any time of the year, Jack, without publication of bans, provided that, by reason of any pre-contract, I verily think that I have had three or four pre-contracts in my time, but the good girls have not claimed upon them of a long while consanguinity affinity or any other lawful cause whatsoever there be no lawful impediment on this behalf and that there be not at this time any action suit plaint quarrel or demand moved or depending before any judge ecclesiastical or temporal for or concerning any marriage contracted by or with either of you and that the said marriage be openly solemnized in the church above mentioned between the hours of eight and twelve in the forenoon and without prejudice to the minister of the place where the said woman is a parishioner we do hereby for good causes it cost me let me see jack what did it cost me give and grant our license as well to you as to the parties contracting as to the rector vicar or curate of the said church where the said marriage is intended to be solemnized to solemnize the same in manner and form above specified according to the rites and ceremonies prescribed in the book of common prayer in that behalf published by authority of parliament provided always that if hereafter any fraud shall appear to have been committed at the time of granting this license either by false suggestions or concealment of the truth now this belford is a little hard upon us for i cannot say that every one of our suggestions is literally true so in good conscience i ought not to marry under this license the license shall be void to all intents and purposes as if the same had not been granted and in that case we do inhibit all ministers whatsoever if anything of the premises shall come to their knowledge from proceeding to the celebration of the said marriage 
without first consulting us or our vicar general given etc then follow the register's name and a large pendant seal with these words round it seal of the vicar general and official principal of the diocese of london a good whimsical instrument take it altogether but what thinkest thou are the arms to this matrimonial harbinger why in the first place two crossed swords to show that marriage is a state of offence as well as defence three lions to denote that those who enter into the state ought to have a triple proportion of carriage and couldst thou have imagined that these priestly fellows in so solemn a case would cut their jokes upon poor souls who come to have their honest desires put in a way to be gratified there are three crooked horns smartly top-knotted with ribbons which being the ladies wear seem to indicate that they may very probably adorn as well as bestow the bull's feather to describe it according to heraldry art if i am not mistaken ghouls two swords saltier wise or second coat a chevron sable between three bugle horns or so it ought to be on a chief of the second three lions rampant of the first but the devil take them for their hieroglyphics should i say if i were determined in good earnest to marry and determined to marry i would be were it not for this consideration that once married and i am married for life well that is the plague of it could a man do as the birds do change every valentine's day a natural appointment for birds have not the sense forsooth to petter themselves as we wiseacre men take great and solemn pains to do there would be nothing at all in it and what a glorious time would the lawyers have on the one hand with the novarini universes and suits commensable on restitution of goods and chattels and the parsons on the other with their indulgences renewable annually as other licenses to the honest desires of their clients then were a stated mullet according to rank or fortune to be paid on every change towards the exigencies of the state but none on renewals with the old lives for the sake of encouraging constancy especially among the minores the change would be made sufficiently difficult and the whole public would be the better for it while those children which the parents could not agree about maintaining might be considered as the children of the public and provided for like the children of the ancient spartans who were as ours would in this case be a nation of heroes how jack could i have improved upon lycurgus's institutions had i been a lawgiver did i never show thee a scheme which i drew up on such a notion as this in which i demonstrated the conveniences and obviated the inconveniences of changing the present mode to this i believe i never did i remember i proved to a demonstration that such a change would be a mean of annihilating absolutely annihilating four or five very atrocious and capital sins rapes vulgarly so called adultery and fornication nor would polygamy be panted after frequently would it prevent murders and duelling hardly any such thing as jealousy the cause of shocking violences would be heard of and hypocrisy between man and wife be banished the bosoms of each nor probably would the reproach of barrenness rest as it now too often does where it is least deserved nor would there possibly be such a person as a barren woman moreover what a multitude of domestic quarrels would be avoided were such a scheme carried into execution since both sexes would bear with each other in the view that they could help themselves in a few months and then what a charming subject for conversation would be the gallant and generous last partings between man and wife each 
perhaps a new maiden eye, and rejoicing secretly in the manumission, could afford to be complacently sorrowful in appearance. He presented her with this jewel, it will be said by the reporter, for example's sake. She him with that, how he wept, how she sobbed, how they looked after one another. Well, yet that is the jest of it, neither of them wishing to stand another twelve months' trial. And if giddy fellows or giddy girls misbehave in a first marriage, whether from novishship, having expected to find more in the matter than can be found, or from perverseness on her part, or positiveness on his, each being mistaken in the other, a mighty difference, Jack, in the same person, an inmate or a visitor, what a fine opportunity will each have by this scheme of recovering a lost character, and of setting all right in the next adventure. And, oh, Jack, with what joy, with what rapture, would the changelings, or changeables, if thou like that word better, number the weeks, the days, the hours, as the annual obligation approached to its desirable period. As for the spleen or vapours, and no such malady would be known or heard of. The physical tribe would indeed be the sufferers, and the only sufferers, since fresh health and fresh spirits, the consequences of sweet blood and sweet humours, the mind and body continually pleased with each other, would perpetually flow in, and the joys of expectation, the highest of all our joys, would invigorate and keep all alive. But uh, that no body of men might suffer, the physicians, I thought, might turn parsons, as there would be a great demand for parsons. Besides, as they would be partakers in the general benefit, they must be sorry fellows indeed, if they preferred themselves to the public. Every one would be married a dozen times at least. Both men and women would be careful of their characters, and polite in their behaviour, as well as delicate in their persons, and elegant in their dress. A great matter each of these, let me tell thee, to keep passion alive, either to induce a renewal with the old love, or to recommend themselves to a new, while the newspapers would be crowded with paragraphs, all the world their readers, as all the world would be concerned to see who and who is together, yesterday, for instance, entered into the holy state of matrimony, we should all speak reverently of matrimony then, the right honourable Robert Earl Lovelace, I shall be an earl by that time, with her grace, the Duchess Dowager of Fifty Manors, his lordship's one-and-thirtieth wife, I shall then be contented, perhaps, to take up, as it is called, with a widow. But you must not have had more than one husband, neither. Thou knowest that I am nice in these particulars. I know, Jack, that thou, for thy part, wilt approve of my scheme. As Lord M. and I, between us, have three or four boroughs at command, I think I will get into Parliament, in order to bring in a bill for this good purpose. Neither will the House of Parliament, nor the Houses of Convocation, have reason to object it, and all the courts, whether spiritual or sensual, civil or uncivil, will find their account in it when passed into a law. By my soul, Jack, I should be apprehensive of a general insurrection, and that incited by the women, were such a bill to be thrown out. For here is the excellency of the scheme. The women will have equal reason with the men to be pleased with it. Dost think that old prerogative Harlow, for example, must not, if such a law were in being, have pulled in his horns, so excellent a wife as he has, would never else have renewed with such a gloomy tyrant, who, as well as all other married tyrants, must have been upon good behaviour from year to year. A termagant wife, if such a law were to pass, would be a phoenix. The churches would be the only market-place for the fair sex, and domestic excellence the capital recommendation. Nor would there be an old maid in Great Britain, and all its territories, for what an odd soul must she be, who could not have her twelve months' trial. In short, a total alteration for the better, in the morals and way of life in both sexes, must, in a very few years, be the consequence of such a salutary law. Who would have expected such a one from me? 
I wish the devil owe me not a spite for it. Then would not the distinction be very pretty, Jack, as in flowers? Such a gentleman, or such a lady, is an annual. Such a one is a perennial. One difficulty, however, as I remember, occurred to me upon the probability that a wife might be on sound, as the lawyers call it. But thus I obviated it, that no man should be allowed to marry another woman without his then wife's consent, till she were brought to bed, and he had defrayed all incident charges, until it was agreed upon between them whether the child should be his, hers, or the public's. The women, in this case, to have what I call the coercive option, for I would not have it in the man's power to be a dog neither. And, indeed, I gave the turn of the scale in every part of my scheme in the women's favour, for dearly do I love the sweet rogues. How infinitely more preferable this my scheme to the polygamy of one of the old patriarchs who had wives and concubines without number. I believe David and Solomon had their hundreds at the time, had they not, Jack? Let me add that annual parliaments and annual marriages are the projects next my heart. How could I expatiate upon the benefits that would arise from both? End of Letter 9. Letter 10 of Clarissa Harlow Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 10. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire. Well, but now my plot's thicken, and my employment of writing to thee on this subject will soon come to a conclusion. For now, having got the license, and Mrs. Townsend with her tars being to come to Hampstead next Wednesday or Thursday, and another letter, possibly, or message from Miss Howe to express her wonder that she has not heard from her in answer to hers on her escape. I must soon blow up the lady, or be blown up myself. And so I am preparing with Lady Betty and my cousin Montague to wait upon my beloved with a coach and four, or set. For Lady Betty will not stir out with a pair for the world, though but for two or three miles, and this is a well-known part of her character. But as to the arms and crest upon the coach and trappings, dost thou not know that a blunt must supply her, while her own is new lining and repairing, an opportunity she is willing to take now she is in town? Nothing of this kind can be done to her mind in the country." liveries nearly lady betty's thou hast seen lady betty lawrence several times hast thou not belford no never in my life but thou hast and lain with her too or fame does thee more credit than thou deservest why jack knowest thou not lady betty's other name other name has she too she has and what thinkst thou of Lady Bab Wallace? Oh, the devil, now thou hast it. Lady Barbara, thou knowest, lifted up in circumstances and by pride, never appears or produces herself but on occasion special, um, to pass to men of quality or price, for a duchess or countess at least, she has always been admired for a grandeur in her air that few women of quality can come up to, and never was supposed to be other than what she passed for, though often and often a 
paramour for lords. And who thinkest thou is my cousin Montague? Nay, how should I know? How indeed? Why, my little Joannetta Golding, a lively yet modest-looking girl, is my cousin Montague. There, Belford, is an aunt. There's a cousin. Both have wit at will. Both are accustomed to ape quality. Both are genteelly descended. Mistresses of themselves, and well educated, yet past pity. True Spartan dames, ashamed of nothing but detection. Always, therefore, upon their guard against that. And in their own conceit, when assuming top part, the very quality they ape. And how dost think I dress them out? I'll tell you. Lady Betty, in a rich gold tissue, adorned with jewels of high price. My cousin Montague, in a pale pink, uh, standing on end with silver flowers of her own working. Charlotte, as well as my beloved, is admirable at her needle. Not quite so richly jewelled out as Lady Betty, but earrings and solitaire very valuable, and infinitely becoming. Joannetta, thou knowest, has a good complexion, a fine neck, and ears remarkably fine, so has Charlotte. She is nearly of Charlotte's stature, too. Laces both, the richest that could be procured. Thou canst not imagine what a sum the loan of the jewels cost me, though but for three days. This sweet girl will half ruin me. But seest thou not by this time that her reign is short? It must be so. And Mrs. Sinclair has already prepared everything for her reception once more. Here come the ladies, attended by Susan Morrison, a tenant farmer's daughter, as Lady Betty's woman, with her hands before her, and thoroughly instructed. How dress advantages women, especially those who have naturally a genteel air and turn, and have had education. Hadst thou seen how they paraded it? Cousin and cousin and nephew at every word, Lady Betty bridling and looking haughtily condescending, Charlotte gallanting her fan and swimming over the floor without touching it. How I long to see my niece elect, cries one, for they are told that we are not married, and are pleased that I have not put the slight upon them that they had apprehended from me. How I long to see my dear cousin that is to be the other. Your ladyship and your ladyship, and an awkward curtsy at every address. Prim, Susan Morrison. Top your parts, ye villains. You know how nicely I distinguish. There will be no passion in this case to blind the judgment, and to help on meditated delusion as when you engage with titled sinners. My charmer is as cool and as distinguishing, though not quite so learned in her own sex as I am. Your commonly assumed dignity won't do for me now. Airs of superiority as if born to rank, but no overdue. Doubting nothing. Let not your faces arraign your heart. Easy and unaffected. Your very dresses will give you pride enough. A little graver, Lady Betty. More significance, less bridling in your dignity. That's the air charmingly hit again. You have it. Devil take your less arrogance. You are got into airs of young quality. Be less sensible of your new condition. People born to dignity command respect without needing to require it. Now for your part, cousin Charlotte, pretty well. But a little too frolicky, that air. 
Yet have I prepared my beloved to expect in you both great vivacity and quality freedom. Oh, curse those eyes, those glancings will never do. A downcast, bashful turn, if you can command it. Look upon me. Suppose me now to be my beloved. Devil take that leer, or oh, too significantly arch. Once I knew you the girl I would now have you to be. Sprightly but not confident, cousin Charlotte, be sure forget not to look down or aside when looked at, when eyes meet eyes, be yours the retreating ones. Your face will bear examination. O oh, Lord, Lord, that so young a creature can so soon forget the innocent appearance she first charmed by, and which I thought born with you all. Five years to ruin what twenty had been building up. How natural the latter lesson, how difficult to regain the former. A stranger, as I hope to be saved, to the principal arts of your sex once more what a devil has your heart to do in your eyes have i not told you that my beloved is a great observer of the eyes she once quoted upon me a text ecclesiastes twenty six which showed me how she came by her knowledge dorcases were found guilty of treason the first moment she saw her. The whoredom of a woman may be known in her haughty looks and eyelids. Watch over an impudent eye, and marvel not if it trespass against thee. Once more, suppose me to be my charm. Now you are to encounter my examining eye, and my doubting heart, that's my dear, study that air in the pier-glass charmingly, perfectly right, your honours now, devils, pretty well, cousin Charlotte, for a young country lady, to form yields to familiarity, you may curtsy low, you must not be supposed to have forgot your boarding-school airs, but too low, too low, Lady Betty, for your years and your quality. The common fault of your sex will be your danger. Aiming to be young too long are the devils in you all when you judge of yourselves by your wishes and by your vanity. Fifty, in that case, is never more than fifteen graceful ease conscious dignity like that of my charmer oh how hard to hit both together now charming that's the air lady betty that's the cue cousin charlotte suited to the character of each but once more be sure to have a guard upon your eyes. Never fear, nephew, never fear, cousin. A drama Barbados each. And now we are gone. End of letter 10《Letter 11 of Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 by Samuel Richardson. Letter 11. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, at Mrs. Sinclair's, Monday afternoon, 
all's right as heart can wish in spite of all objection in spite of a reluctance next to faintings in spite of all foresight vigilance suspicion once more as the charmer of my soul in her old lodgings now throbs away every pulse now thumb thumb thumbs my bounding heart for something but i have not time for the particulars of our management my beloved is now directing some of her clothes to be packed up never more to enter this house nor ever more will she i dare say when once again out of it yet not so much as a condition of forgiveness the hollow spirited fair one will not deserve my mercy she will wait for miss howe's next letter and then if she find a difficulty in her new schemes thank her for nothing will will what why even then will take time to consider whether i am to be forgiven or for ever rejected an indifference that revives in my heart the remembrance of a thousand of the like nature and yet lady betty and miss montague a man would be tempted to think jack that they wish her to provoke my vengeance declare that i ought to be satisfied with such a proud suspension they are entirely attached to her whatever she says is must be gospel they are guarantees for her return to hampstead this night they are to go back with her a supper bespoken by lady betty at mrs moore's all the vacant apartments there by my permission for i had engaged them for a month certain to be filled with them and their attendants for a week at least or till they can prevail upon the dear perverse as they hope they shall to restore me to her favour and to accompany lady betty to oxfordshire the dear creature has thus far condescended that she will write to miss howe and acquaint her with the present situation of things if she write i shall see what she writes but i believe she will have other employment soon lady betty is sure she tells her that she shall prevail upon her to forgive me though she dares say that i deserve not forgiveness lady betty is too delicate to inquire strictly into the nature of my offence but it must be an offence against herself against miss montague against the virtues of the whole sex or it could not be so highly resented yet she will not leave her till she forgive me until she see our nuptials privately celebrated meantime as she approves of her uncle's expedient she will address her as already my wife before strangers steadman her solicitor may attend her for orders in relation to her chancery affair at hampstead not one hour they can be favoured with will they lose from the company and conversation of so dear so charming a new relation hard then if she had not obliged them with her company in their coach and four to and from their cousin leeson's who longed as they themselves had done to see a lady so justly celebrated how will lord m be raptured when he sees her and can salute her as his niece how will lady sarah bless herself she will now think her loss of the dear daughter she mourns for happily supplied miss montague dwells upon every word that falls from her lips she perfectly adores her new cousin for her cousin she must be and her cousin will she call her she answers for equal admiration in her sister patty i cry i whispering loud enough for her to hear how will my cousin patty's dove's eyes glisten and run over on the very first interview so gracious so noble so unaffected a dear creature 
what a happy family chorus we all will ours be these and such like congratulatory admirations every hour repeated her modesty hurt by the ecstatic praises her graces are too natural to herself for her to be proud of them but she must be content to be punished for excellences that cast a shade upon the most excellent in short we are here as at hampstead all joy and rapture all of us except my beloved in whose sweet face her almost fainting reluctance to re-enter these doors not overcome reigns a kind of anxious serenity but how will even that be changed in a few hours methinks i begin to pity the half-apprehensive beauty but of warmth thou unseasonably intruding pity thou hast more than once already well nigh undone me the due reflection begone consideration and commiseration i dismiss ye all for at least a week to come but be remembered her broken word her flight when my fond soul was meditating mercy to her be remembered her treatment of me in her letter on her escape to hampstead her hampstead virulence what is it she ought not to expect from an unchained beelzebub and a plotting villain be her preference of the single life to me also remembered that she despises me that she even refuses to be my wife a proud loveless to be denied a wife to be more proudly rejected by a daughter of the harlows the ladies of my own family she thinks them the ladies of my family supplicating in vain for her returning favour to their despised kinsmen and taking laws from her still prouder punctilio be the execrations of her vixen friend likewise remembered poured out upon me from her representations and thereby made her own execrations be remembered still more particularly the town's end plot set on foot between them and now in a day or two ready to break out and the sordid threatening thrown out against me by that little fury is not this the crisis for which i have been long waiting shall tomlinson shall these women be engaged shall so many engines be set at work at an immense expense with infinite contrivance and all to no purpose is not this the hour of her trial and in her of the trial of the virtue of her whole sex so long premeditated so long threatened whether her thrust be thrust indeed whether her virtue be principle whether if once subdued she will not be always subdued and will she not want the crown of her glory the proof of her till now all surpassing excellence if i stop short of the ultimate trial now is the end of purposes long overawed often suspended at hand and need i go throw the sins of her cursed family into the too weighty scale abhorred be force be the thoughts of force there's no triumph over the will in force this i know i have said volume four letter forty eight but would i not have avoided it if i could have i not tried every other method and have i any other resource left me can she resent the last outrage more than she has resented a fainter effort and if her resentments run ever so high cannot i repair by matrimony she will not refuse me i know jack the haughty beauty will not refuse me when her pride of being corporally inviolate is brought down when she can tell no tales but when be her resistance what it will 
even her own sex will suspect a yielding in resistance and when that modesty which may fill her bosom with resentment will lock up her speech but how know i that i have not made my own difficulties is she not a woman what redress lies for a perpetuated evil must she not live her piety will secure her life and will not time be my friend what in a word will be her behaviour afterwards she cannot fly me she must forgive me and as i have often said once forgiven will be for ever forgiven why then should this enervating pity unsteal my foolish heart it shall not all these things will i remember and think of nothing else in order to keep up a resolution which the women about me will have it i shall be still unable to hold i'll teach the dear charming creature to emulate me in contrivance i'll teach her to weave webs and plots against her conqueror i'll show her that in her smuggling schemes she is but a spider compared to me and that she has all this time been spinning only cobweb what shall we do now we are immersed in the depth of grief and apprehension how ill do women bear disappointment set upon going to hampstead and upon quitting for ever how she re-entered with infinite reluctance what things she intended to take with her ready packed up herself on tiptoe to be gone and i prepared to attend her thither she begins to be afraid that she shall not go this night and in grief and despair has flung herself into her old apartment locked herself in and through the keyhole dorcas sees her on her knees praying i suppose for a safe deliverance and from what and wherefore these agonizing apprehensions why here this unkind lady betty with the dear creature's knowledge though to her concern and this mad-headed cousin montague without it while she was employed in directing her package have hurried away in the coach to their own lodgings only indeed to put up some night clothes and so forth in order to attend their sweet cousin to hampstead and no less to my surprise than hers are not yet returned i have sent to know the meaning of it in a great hurry of spirits she would have had me to go myself hardly any pacifying her the girl god bless her is wild with her own idle apprehensions what is she afraid of i curse them both for their delay my tardy villain how he stays devil fetch them let them send their coach and we'll go without them in her hearing i bid the fellow tell them so perhaps he stays to bring the coach if anything happens to hinder the ladies from attending my beloved this night devil take them again say i they promised too they would not stay because it was but two nights ago that a chariot was robbed at the foot of hampstead hill which alarmed my fair one when told of it oh here's lady betty's servant with a billet to robert lovelace esquire monday night excuses my dear nephew i beseech you to my dearest kinswoman one night cannot break squares for here miss montague has been taken violently ill with three fainting fits one after another the hurry of her joy i believe to find your dear lady so much surpassed all expectations never did family love you know reign so strong as among us and the too eager desire she had to attend her have occasioned it for she has but weak spirits poor girl well as she looks if she be better we will certainly go with you to-morrow morning after we have breakfasted with her at your lodgings but whether she be or not i will do myself the pleasure to attend your lady to hampstead and will be with you for that purpose about nine in the morning 
with due compliments to your most worthily beloved I am, yours affectionately, Elizabeth Lawrence. Faith and troth, Jack, I know not what to do with myself. For here just now, having sent in the above note by Dorcas, out came my beloved with it, in her hand, in a fit of frenzy, not true by my soul. She had indeed complained of her head all the evening. Dorcas ran to me, out of breath, to tell me that a lady was coming in some strange way, but she followed her so quick that the frighted wench had not time to say in what way. It seems, when she read the billet, now, indeed, said she, am I a lost creature? Oh, the poor Clarissa Harlow! She tore off her headclothes, inquired where I was, and in she came, her shining tresses flowing about her neck, her ruffles torn, and hanging in tatters about her snowy hands, with her arms spread out, her eyes wildly turned, as if starting from their orbits. Down sunk she at my feet, as soon as she approached me, her charming bosom heaving to her uplifted face, and clasping her arms about my knees. Dear Lovelace, said she, if ever, if ever, if ever, and unable to speak another word, quitting her clasping hold, down prostrate on the floor, sunk she, neither in a fit nor out of one. I was quite astonished. All my purposes suspended for a few moments. I knew neither what to say nor what to do. But recollecting myself, am I again, thought I, in a way to be overcome and made a fool of? If I now recede, I am gone for ever. I raised her, but down she sunk, as if quite disjointed, her limbs failing her, yet not in a fit neither. I never heard of or saw such a dear unaccountable, almost lifeless and speechless too for a few moments. What must her apprehensions be at that moment, and for what? An high notion, dear soul, pretty ignorance, thought I. Never having met with so sincere, so unquestionable a repugnance, I was staggered. I was confounded. Yet how should I know that it would be so till I tried? And how, having proceeded thus far, could I stop? were I not to have had the women to goad me on, and to make light of circumstances, which they pretended to be better judges of than I. I lifted her, however, into a chair, and in words of disordered passion told her all her fears were needless, wondered at them, begged of her to be pacified, besought her reliance on my faith and honour, and revowed all my old vows, and poured forth new ones. At last, with a heart-breaking sob, I see, I see, Mr. Lovelace, in broken sentences she spoke, I see, I see, that at last I am ruined, ruined, if your pity let me implore your pity, and down on her bosom like a half-broken stalk, lily top-heavy with the overcharging dews of the morning, sunk her head with a sigh that went to my heart all i could think of to reassure her when a little recovered i said why did i not send for their coach as i had intimated it might return in the morning for the ladies i had actually done so i told her on seeing her strange uneasiness but it was then gone to fetch a doctor for miss montague lest his chariot should not be so ready. Ah, oh, loveless, said she, with a doubting face, anguish in her imploring eye. Lady Betty would think it very strange, I told her, if she were to know it was so disagreeable to her, to stay one night for her company, in the house where she had passed so many. She called me names upon this. She had called me names before. I was patient. Let her go to Lady Betty's lodgings, then. Directly go. If the person I called Lady Betty was really Lady Betty. If, my dear, good heaven. What a villain does that if show you believe me to be? 
I cannot help it. I beseech you once more. Let me go to Mrs. Leeson's. If that if ought not to be said, then, assuming a more resolute spirit, I will go. I will inquire my way. I will go by myself, and would have rushed by me. I folded my arms about her to detain her, pleading the bad way I heard poor Charlotte was in, and what a farther concern her impatience, if she went, would give to poor Charlotte. She would believe nothing I said, unless I would instantly order a coach, since she was not to have Lady Betty's, nor was permitted to go to Mrs. Leeson's and let her go in it to Hampstead, late as it was, and all alone, so much the better, for in the house of people, of whom Lady Betty, upon inquiry, had heard a bad character, dropped foolishly this by my prating new relation, in order to do credit to herself by depreciating others. Everything and every face, looking with so much meaning, vileness as well as my own, thou art still too sensible thought i my charmer she was resolved not to stay another night dreading what might happen as to her intellects and being very apprehensive that she might possibly go through a great deal before morning though more violent she could not well be with the worst she dreaded i humoured her and ordered Will to endeavour to get a coach directly to carry us to Hampstead. I cared not at what price. Robbers, with whom I would have terrified her, she feared not. I was all her fear I found, and this house her terror, for I saw plainly that she now believed that Lady Betty and Miss Montague were both impostors but her mistrust is a little the latest to do her service and oh jack the rage of love the rage of revenge is upon me by turns they tear me the progress already made the women's instigation the power i shall have to try her to the utmost and still to marry her if she be not to be brought to cohabitation let me perish belford if she escape me now will is not yet come back near eleven will is this moment returned no coach to be got either for love or money once more she urges to mrs leeson's let me go loveless good loveless let me go to mrs leeson's what is miss montague's illness to my terror for the almighty's sake mr loveless her hands clasped oh my angel what a wildness is this do you know do you see my dearest life what appearances your causeless apprehensions have given you do you know it is past eleven o'clock twelve one two three four my any hour i care not if you mean me honourably let me go out of this hated house thou'lt observe belford that though this was written afterwards yet as in other places i write it as it was spoken and happened, as if I had retired to put down every sentence spoken. I know thou likest this lively present tense manner, as it is one of my peculiars. Just as she had repeated the last words, If you mean me honourably, let me go out of this hated house. In came Mrs. Sinclair in a great ferment. And what, pray, madam, has this house done to you? mr lovelace you have known me some time and if i have not the niceness of this lady i hope i do not deserve to be treated thus she set her huge arms akimbo ho oh, madam let me tell you that i am amazed at your freedoms with my character and mr lovelace holding up and violently shaking her head if you are a gentleman and a man of honour having never before seen anything but obsequiousness in this woman little as she liked her she was frightened at her masculine air and fierce look god help me cried she what will become of me now then turning her head hither and thither in a wild kind of amaze 
whom have I for a protector? What will become of me now? I will be your protector, my dearest love. But, indeed, you are uncharitably severe upon poor Mrs. Sinclair. Indeed you are. She is a gentlewoman born, and the relict of a man of honour, and though left in such circumstance as to oblige her to let lodgings, yet would she scorn to be guilty of a wilful baseness. I hope so, it may be so, I may be mistaken, but, but, there is no crime, I presume no treason, to say I don't like her house. The old dragon straddled up to her with her arms kemboed again, her eyebrows erect like the bristles upon a hog's back and scowling over her shortened nose more than half hid her ferret eyes her mouth was distorted she pouted out her blubber lips as if to bellows up wind and sputter into her hoarse nostrils and her chin was curdled and more than usually prominent with passion with two ho oh, madams she accosted the frighted fair one who terrified caught hold of my sleeve i feared she would fall into fits and with a look of indignation told mrs sinclair that these apartments were mine and i could not imagine what she meant either by listening to what passed between me and my spouse or to come in uninvited and still more i wondered at her giving herself these strange liberties I may be to blame, Jack, for suffering this wretch to give herself these airs, but her coming in was without my orders. The old beldam, throwing herself into a chair, fell a-blubbering and exclaiming, and the pacifying of her, and endeavouring to reconcile the lady to her, took up till near one o'clock, and thus, between terror and the late hour, and what followed, she was diverted from the thoughts of getting out of the house to Mrs. Leeson's, or anywhere else. End of letter 11all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 12 Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Tuesday morning, June 13. And now, Belford, I can go no farther. The affair is over. Clarissa lives? And I am. Your humble servant, Ah, loveless. The whole of this black transaction is given by the injured lady to Miss Howe in her subsequent letters, dated Thursday, July 6th. See letters 67, 68, 69. End of letter 12
Clarissa Harlowe, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 13. Mr. Belford, to Robert Lovelace Esquire, Watford, Wednesday, January 14th. O oh, thou savage-hearted monster! What work hast thou made in one guilty hour for a whole age of repentance? I am inexpressibly concerned at the fate of this matchless lady. She could not have fallen into the hands of any other man breathing, and suffered as she has done with thee. I had written a great part of another long letter to try to soften thy flinty heart in her favour, for I thought it but too likely that thou shouldst succeed in getting her back again to the accursed woman's. But I find it would have been too late had I finished it, and sent it away. Yet cannot I forbear writing, to urge thee to make the only amends thou now canst make her, by a proper use of the license thou hast obtained. Poor, poor lady! It is a pain to me that I ever saw her. Such an adorer of virtue to be sacrificed to the vilest of her sex, and thou their implement in the devil's hand, for a purpose so base, so ungenerous, so inhumane. Pride thyself, O cruelest of men, in this reflection, and that thy triumph over a woman who for thy sake was abandoned of every friend she had in the world, was effected not by advantages taken of her weakness and credulity, but by the blackest artifice, after a long course of studied deceits had been tried to no purpose. I can tell thee it is well either for thee or for me that I am not the brother of the lady. Had I been her brother— her violation must have been followed by the blood of one of us. Excuse me, Lovelace, and let not the lady fare the worse for my concern for her. And yet I have but one other motive to ask thy excuse, and that is, because I owe to thy own communicative pen the knowledge I have of thy barbarous villainy, since thou mightest if thou wouldst, have passed it on to me for a common seduction. Clarissa lives, thou sayest. That she does so is my wonder, and these words show that thou thyself, though thou couldst nevertheless proceed, hardly expectst she should have survived the outrage. What must have been the poor lady's distress, watchful as she had been over her honour, when dreadful certainty took place of cruel apprehension. And yet a man may guess what must have been, by that which thou paintest, when she suspected herself tricked, deserted, and betrayed by the pretended ladies. That thou couldst behold her frenzy on this occasion, and her half-speechless, half-fainting prostration at thy feet, and yet retain thy evil purposes, will hardly be thought credible, even by those who know thee, if they had seen her. Poor, poor lady, with such noble qualities as would have adorned the most exalted married life, to fall into the hands of the only man in the world, who could have treated her as thou hast treated her, and to let loose the old dragon, as thou properly callest her, upon the before-affrighted innocent, what a barbarity was that! What a poor piece of barbarity! In order to obtain by terror what thou despairedst to gain by love, though supported by stratagems the most insidious. Oh, Lovelace, Lovelace! Had I doubted it before, 
I should now be convinced that there must be a world after this, to do justice to injured merit, and to punish barbarous perfidy. Could the divine Socrates and the divine Clarissa otherwise have suffered? But let me, if possible, for one moment, try to forget this villainous outrage on the most excellent of women. I have business here which will hold me yet a few days, and then perhaps I shall quit this house for ever. I have had a solemn and tedious time of it. I should never have known that I had half the respect I really find I had for the old gentleman, had I not so closely at his earnest desire attended him and been a witness of the tortures he underwent. This melancholy occasion may possibly have contributed to humanize me, but surely I never could have been so remorseless a caitiff as thou hast been to a woman of half this lady's excellence. But prithee, dear Lovelace, if thou art a man, and not a devil, resolve out of hand to repair thy sin of ingratitude, by conferring upon thyself the highest honour thou canst receive in making her lawfully thine. But if thou canst not prevail upon thyself to do her this justice, I think I should not scruple a tilt with thee. An everlasting rupture at least must follow, if thou sacrificest her to the accursed women. Thou art desirous to know what advantage I reap from my uncle's demise. I do not certainly know, for I have not been so greedily solicitous on this subject as some of the kindred have been, who ought to have shown more decency, as I have told them, and suffered the corpse to have been cold before they had begun their hungry inquiries. But— by what I gathered from the poor man's talk to me, who oftener than I wished, touched upon the subject, I deem it will be upwards of five thousand pound in cash, and in the funds, after all legacies paid, besides the real estate, which is a clear one thousand pound a year. I wish from my heart thou wert a money-lover, were the estate to be of double the value, Thou shouldst have it every shilling, only upon one condition. For my circumstances before were as easy as I wish them to be while I am single. That thou wouldst permit me the honour of being this fatherless lady's father, as it is called, at the altar. Think of this, my dear Lovelace. Be honest and let me present thee with the brightest jewel that man ever possessed. And then, body and soul, wilt thou bind to thee for ever thy Belford. End of letter 13this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 by Samuel Richardson Letter 14 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, Thursday, June 15th. Let me alone, you great dog, you let me alone. Have I heard lesser boy, his coward arms held over his head and face, say to a bigger who was pummeling him for having run away with his apple, his orange, or his gingerbread? So say I to thee, on occasion of thy severity to thy poor friend, who, as thou ownest, has furnished the ungenerous as thou art with the weapons thou brandishest so fearfully against him. Unto what purpose, when the mischief is done, when, of consequence, the affair is irretrievable, 
and when a Clarissa could not move me, well, but after all, I must own, that there is something very singular in this lady's case, and at times I cannot help regretting that ever I attempted her, since not one power either of body or soul could be moved in my favour, and since, to use the expression of the philosopher on a much graver occasion, there is no difference to be found between the skull of King Philip and that of another man. But people's extravagant notions of things alter not facts, Belford, and when all is done, Miss Clarissa Harlowe has but run the fate of a thousand others of her sex, only that they did not set such a romantic value upon what they call their honour. That's all. And yet I will allow thee this, that if a person sets a high value upon anything, be it ever such a trifle in itself or in the eye of others, the robbing of that person of it is not a trifle to him. Take the matter in this light, I own I have done wrong, great wrong, to this admirable creature. But have I not known twenty and twenty of the sex, who have seemed to carry their notions of virtue high, yet when brought to the test, have abated of their severity? And how should we be convinced that any of them are proof till they are tried? A thousand times have I said that I never yet met with such a woman as this. If I had, I hardly ever should have attempted Miss Clarissa Harlowe. Hitherto she is all angel. And was not that the point which at setting out I proposed to try? See Volume 3, Letter 18 And was not cohabitation ever my darling view? And am I not now at last in the high road to it? It is true that I have nothing to boast of as to her will, the very contrary. But now are we come to the test, whether she cannot be brought to make the best of an irreparable evil. If she exclaim, she has reason to exclaim, and I will sit down with patience by the hour together to hear her exclamations, till she is tired of them. She will then descend to expostulation, perhaps. Expostulation will give me hope expostulation will show that she hates me not and if she hate me not she will forgive and if she now forgive then will all be over and she will be mine upon my own terms and it shall then be the whole study of my future life to make her happy so belford thou seest that i have journeyed on to this stage indeed through infinite mazes and as infinite remorses with one determined point in view from the first. To thy urgent supplication, then, that I will do her grateful justice by marriage. Let me answer in Matt Pryor's two lines on his hoped-for auditorship, as put into the mouths of his St. John and Harley. Let that be done, which Matt doth say. Yea, quoth the Earl, but not to-day. <laughs> Thou seest, Jack, that I make no resolutions, however, against doing her, one time or other, the wished-for justice, even were I to succeed in my principal view, cohabitation. And of this I do assure thee, that if I ever marry, it must, it shall be, Miss Clarissa Harlowe. Nor is our honour at all impaired with me, by what she has so far suffered, but the contrary. She must only take care that, if she be at last brought to forgive me, she show me that her Lovelace is the only man on earth whom she could have forgiven on the like occasion. But, ah, oh, Jack, what in the meantime shall I do with this admirable creature? At present, I am loath to say it, but at present she is quite stupefied. I had rather, methinks, she should have retained all her active powers, though I had suffered by her nails and her teeth than that she should be sunk into such a state of absolute insensibility, shall I call it, as she has been in ever since Tuesday morning. Yet as she begins a little to revive, and now and then to call names and to exclaim, I dread almost to engage with the anguish of a spirit that owes its extraordinary agitations to a niceness that has no example, either in ancient or modern story. For after all, what is there in her case that should stupefy such a glowing, such a blooming charmer? 
excess of grief, excess of terror, have made a person's hair stand on end, and even, as we have read, change the colour of it. But that it should so stupefy as to make a person at times insensible to those imaginary wrongs which would raise others from stupefaction is very surprising. But I will leave this subject, lest it should make me too grave. I was yesterday at Hampstead, and discharged all obligations there with no small applause. I told them that the lady was now as happy as myself, and that is no great untruth, for I am not altogether so when I allow myself to think. Mrs. Townsend, with her tars, had not been then there. I told them what I would have them say to her if she came. Well, but, after all, how many after alls have I? I could be very grave were I to give way to it. The devil take me for a fool. What is the matter with me, I wonder? I must breathe a fresher air for a few days. But what shall I do with this admirable creature the while? Hang me if I know. For if I stir, the venomous spider of this habitation will want to set upon the charming fly, whose silken wings are already so entangled in my enormous web that she cannot move hand or foot, for so much as grief stupefied her that she is at present destitute of will, as she always seemed to be of desire. I must not therefore think of leaving her yet for two days together. End of letter 14「Letter 15 of Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 – by Samuel Richardson Letter 15 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire I have just now had a specimen of what the resentment of this dear creature will be when quite recovered, an affecting one, for entering her apartment after Dorcas, and endeavouring to soothe and pacify her disordered mind, in the midst of my blandishments, she held up to heaven, in a speechless agony, the innocent license which she has in her own power, as the poor distressed Catalans held up their English treaty on an occasion that keeps the worst of my actions in countenance. She seemed about to call down vengeance upon me, when happily the leaden god, in pity to her trembling Lovelace, waved over her half-drowned eyes his somniferous wand and laid asleep the fair exclaimer before she could go half through with her intended imprecation. Thou wilt guess by what I have written that some little art has been made use of, but it was with a generous design, if thou wilt allow me the word on such an occasion, in order to lessen the too quick sense she was likely to have of what she was to suffer, a contrivance I never had occasion for before, and had not thought of now, if Mrs. Sinclair had not proposed it to me, to whom I left the management of it, and I have done nothing but curse her ever since, lest the quantity should have forever dampened her charming intellects. Hence my concern, for I think the poor lady ought not to have been so treated, poor lady, did I say? What have I to do with thy creeping style? But have not I the worst of it? since her insensibility has made me but a thief to my own joys. I did not intend to tell thee of this little innocent trick, for such I designed it to be, but that I hate disingenuousness, to thee especially, and as I cannot help writing in a more serious vein than usual, thou wouldst perhaps, had I not hinted the true cause, have imagined that I was sorry for the fact itself, and this would have given thee a good deal of trouble in scribbling dull persuasives to repair by matrimony, 
and me in reading thy cruel nonsense. Besides, one day or other thou mightest, had I not confessed it, have heard of it in an aggravated manner, and I know thou hast such an high opinion of this lady's virtue, that thou wouldst be disappointed, if thou hadst reason to think that she was subdued by her own consent, or any the least yielding in her will. And so is she beholden to me in some measure, that, at the expense of my honour, she may so justly form a plea which will entirely salve hers. And now is the whole secret out. Thou wilt say I am a horrid fellow, as the lady does, that I am the unchained Beelzebub, and a plotting villain. And as this is what you both said beforehand, and nothing worse can be said, I desire, if thou wouldst not have me quite serious with thee, that I should think thou meanest more by thy tilting hint than I am willing to believe thou dost, that thou wilt forbear thy invectives. For is not the thing done? Can it be helped? And must I not now try to make the best of it? And the rather do I enjoin to make thee this and inviolable secrecy, because I begin to think that my punishment will be greater than the fault, were it to be only from my own reflection. End of letter 15Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, Letter 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 16. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Friday, June 16. I am sorry to hear of thy misfortune, but hope thou wilt not long lie by it. Thy servant tells me what narrow escape thou hadst with thy neck. I wish it may not be ominous, but I think thou seemest not to be in so enterprising a way as formerly. And yet, merry or sad, thou seest a rake's neck is always in danger, if not from the hangman, from his own horse. But tis a vicious toad, it seems, and I think thou shouldst never venture upon his back again, for tis a plaguy thing for rider and horse both to be vicious. The fellow tells me, thou desirest me to continue to write to thee, in order to divert thy chagrin on thy forced confinement. But how can I think it in my power to divert, when my subject is not pleasing to myself? Caesar never knew what it was to be hipped, I will call it, till he came to be what Pompey was, that is to say, till he arrived at the height of his ambition nor did thy lovelace know what it was to be gloomy, till he had completed his wishes upon the most charming creature in the world. And yet why say I completed, when the will, the consent, is wanting, and I have still views before me of obtaining that? Yet I could almost join with thee in the wish which thou sendest me up by thy servant, unfriendly as it is, that I had had thy misfortune before Monday night last, for here the poor lady has run into a contrary extreme to that I told thee of in my last, for now is she as much too lively as before she was too stupid, and baiting that she has pretty frequent lucid intervals, would be deemed raving mad, and I should be obliged to confine her. I am most confoundedly disturbed about it, for I begin to fear that her intellects are irreparably hurt. Who the devil could have expected such strange effects from a cause so common and so slight? But these high-souled and 
high-sensed girls, who had set up for shining lights and examples to the rest of the sex, or with such difficulty brought down to the common standard, that a wise man, who prefers his peace of mind to his glory, in subduing one of that exalted class, would have nothing to say to them. I do all in my power to quiet her spirits, when I force myself into her presence. I go on begging pardon one minute, and vowing truth and honour another. I would at first have persuaded her, and offered to call witnesses to the truth of it, that we were actually married. Though the license was in her hands, I thought the assertion might go down in her disorder, and charming consequences, I hope, would follow, but this would not do. I therefore gave up that hope, and now I declare to her that it is my resolution to marry her. The moment her uncle Harlow informs me that he will grace the ceremony with his presence. But she believes nothing I say, nor, whether in her senses or not, bears me with patience in her sight. I pity her with all my soul, and I curse myself when she is in her wailing fits, and when I apprehend that intellect so charming are for ever damned. But more, I curse these women who put me upon such an expedient. Lord, Lord, what a hand have I made of it, and all for what? Last night, for the first time since Monday night, she got to her pen and ink. But she pursues her writing with such eagerness and hurry as show too evidently her discomposure. I hope, however, that this employment will help to calm her spirits. Just now, Dorcas tells me that what she writes she tears, and throws the paper in fragments under the table, either as not knowing what she does, or disliking it, then gets up, wrings her hands, weeps, and shifts her seat all round the room, then returns to her table, sits down, and writes again. One odd letter, as I may call it, Dorcas has this moment given me from her. Carry this, said she, to the vilest of men. Dorcas, a toad, brought it without any further direction to me. I sat down, intending, though it is pretty long, to give thee a copy of it. But for my life I cannot, tis so extravagant. And the original is too much an original to let it go out of my hands. But some of these scraps and fragments, as either torn through or flung aside, I will copy, for the novelty of the thing and to show thee how her mind works, now she is in the whimsical way. Yet I know I am still furnishing thee with new weapons against myself, but spare thy comments. My own reflections render them needless. Dorcas thinks her lady will ask for them, so wishes to have them to lay again under the table. By the first thou wilt guess that I have told her that Miss Howe is very ill and can't write, that she may account the better for not having received the letter designed for her. Paper 1. Torn in two pieces. My dearest Miss Howe, oh, what dreadful, dreadful things have I to tell you! But yet I cannot tell you neither. But say, are you really ill, as a vile, vile creature informs me you are? But he never yet told me truth, and I hope has not in this. And yet, if it were not true, surely I should have heard from you before now. But what have I to do to upbraid? You may well be tired of me. And if you are, 
I can forgive you, for I am tired of myself, and all my own relations were tired of me long before you were. How good you have always been to me, mine own dear Anna Howe! But how I ramble! I sat down to say a great deal. My heart was full. I did not know what to say first, and thought, and grief, and confusion, and, oh, my poor head, I cannot tell what, and thought, and grief, and confusion, came crowding so thick upon me. One would be first, another would be first, all would be first, so I can write nothing at all. Only that, whatever they have done to me, I cannot tell. But I am no longer what I was. In any one thing, did I say? Yes, but I am. For I am still, and I ever will be. Your true... Plague on it. I can write no more of this eloquent nonsense myself which rather shows a raised than a quenched imagination. But Dorcas shall transcribe the others in separate papers, as written by the whimsical charmer. And some time hence, when all is over, and I can better bear to read them, I may ask thee for a sight of them. Preserve them, therefore, for we often look back with pleasure even upon the heaviest griefs, when the cause of them is removed. Paper two, scratched through and thrown under the table. And can you, my dear honoured papa, resolve for ever to reprobate your poor child? But I am sure you would not, if you knew what she has suffered since her unhappy— And will nobody plead for your poor suffering girl? No one good body? Why then, dearest sir, let it be an act of your own innate goodness— which I have so much experienced, and so much abused. I don't presume to think you should receive me. No, indeed. My name is— I don't know what my name is. I never dare to wish to come into your family again. But your heavy curts, my papa. Yes, I will call you papa, and help yourself as you can. For you are my own dear papa, whether you will or not. And though I am an unworthy child, yet I am your child— Paper 3. A lady took a great fancy to a young lion, or a bear, I forget which. But a bear or a tiger, I believe it was. It was made her a present when a whelp. She fed with her own hand. She nursed up the wicked cub with great tenderness, and would play with it without fear of apprehension or danger. And it was obedient to all her commands. And its tameness, as she used to boast, increased with its growth, so that, like a lapdog, it would follow her all over the house. But mind what followed, at least somehow neglecting to satisfy its hungry maw, or having otherwise disobliged it on some occasion, it resumed its nature, and on a sudden fell upon her, and tore her to pieces. And who was more to blame, I pray? The brute, or the lady? The lady, surely! For what she did was out of nature, out of character, at least, what it did was in its own nature. Paper 4. How art thou now humbled in the dust, Thou proud Clarissa Harlow, thou that never steppedst out of thy father's house but to be admired, who wert wont to turn thine eye, sparkling with healthful life and self-assurance, to different objects at once, as thou passedst, as if, for so thy penetrating sister used to say, to plume thyself upon the expected applauses of all that beheld thee, thou that usedst to go to rest satisfied with the adultations paid thee in the past day, and couldst put off everything but thy vanity. Paper 5. Rejoice not now, my Bella, my sister, my friend, but pity the humbled creature, whose foolish heart you used to say you beheld through the thin veil of humility which covered it. It must have been so. My fall had not else been permitted. You penetrated my proud heart with the jealousy of an eldest sister searching eye. You knew me better than I knew myself. Hence your upbraidings and your chidings, when I began to totter. But forgive now those vain triumphs of my heart. I thought, poor, proud wretch that I was, that what you said was owing to your envy. I thought I could acquit my intention of any such vanity. I was too secure in the knowledge I thought I had of my own heart. My supposed advantages became a snare to me, and what now is the end of all? Paper 6 
what now is become of the prospects of a happy life which once i thought opening before me who now shall assist in the solemn preparations who now shall provide the nuptial ornaments which soften and divert the apprehensions of the fearful virgin no court now to be paid to my smiles no encouraging compliments to inspire thee with hope of laying a mind not unworthy of thee under obligation no elevation now for conscious merit and applauded purity to look down from on a prostrate adorer and an admiring world and up to pleased and rejoicing parents and relations paper seven thou pernicious caterpillar that preyest upon the fair leaf of a virgin fame and poisonest those leaves which thou canst not devour thou fell blight thou eastern blast thou overspreading mildew that destroyest the early promises of the shining year that mockest the laborer's toil and blastest the joyful hopes of the painful husbandman thou fretting moth that corruptest the fairest garment thou eating canker-worm that preyest upon the opening bud and turnest the damask rose into livid yellowness if as religion teaches us god will judge us in a great measure by our own benevolent or evil actions to one another o oh, wretch bethink thee in time bethink thee how great must be thy condemnation paper eight at first i saw something in your air and person that displeased me not your birth and fortunes were no small advantages to you you acted not ignobly by my passionate brother everybody said you were brave everybody said you were generous a brave man i thought could not be a base man a generous man could not i believed be ungenerous where he acknowledged obligation thus prepossessed all the rest that my soul loved and wished for in your reformation i hoped i knew not but by report any flagrant instances of your wildness you seemed frank as well as generous frankness and generosity ever attracted me whoever kept up those appearances i judged of their hearts by my own and whatever qualities i wished to find in them i was ready to find and when found i believed them to be natives of the soil my fortunes my rank my character i thought of further security i was in none of those respects unworthy of being the niece of lord m and of his two noble sisters your vows your impreciations but oh you have barbarously and basely conspired against that honour which you ought to have protected and now you have me what is it of vile that you have not made me yet god knows my heart i had no culpable inclinations i honoured virtue i hated vice but i knew not that you were the vice itself paper nine had the happiness of any of the poorest outcasts in the world whom i have never seen never known never before heard of lain as much in my power as my happiness did in yours my benevolent heart would have made me fly to the succour of such a poor distressed with what pleasure would i have raised the dejected head and comforted the desponding heart but who now shall pity the poor wretch who has increased instead of diminished the number of the miserable paper ten lead me where my own thoughts themselves may loose me where i may doze out what i've left of life forget myself and that day's guile cruel remembrance how shall i appease thee death only can be dreadful to the bad the innocence tis like a bugbear dress to frighten children pull but off the mask and he'll appear a friend oh you have done an act that blots the face and blush of modesty take off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and makes a blister there then down i laid my head down on cold earth and for a while was dead and my freed soul to a strange somewhere fled ah sottis soul said i when back to its cage again i saw it fly fool to resume her broken chain and row the galley here again fool that a body to return where it condemned and destined is to mourn i could a tale unfold would harrow up thy soul o oh, miss ho if thou hast friendship help me and speak the words of peace to my divided soul that was within me and raise every sense to my confusion i'm tottering on the brink of peace and thou art all the hold i have left assist me in the pangs of my affliction when honour's lost tis a relief to die death's but a sure retreat from infamy 
by swift misfortunes, how I am pursued, which on each other are like waves renewed, the farewell youth, and all the joys that dwell with youth and life, and life itself farewell. For life can never be sincerely blessed. Heaven punish the bad, and proves the best. After all, Belford, I have just skimmed over these transcriptions of Dorcas, and I see there are method and good sense in some of them, wild as others of them are, and that her memory, which serves her so well for these poetical flights, is far from being impaired. And this gives me hope that she will soon recover her charming intellects, though I shall be the sufferer by their restoration, I make no doubt. But in the letter she wrote to me, there are yet greater extravagances, and though I said it was too affecting to give thee a copy of it, yet, after I have let thee see the loose papers enclosed, I think I may throw in a transcript of that. Dorcas, therefore, shall here transcribe it. I cannot. The reading of it affected me ten times more than the severest reproaches of a regular mind could do. To Mr. Lovelace, I never intended to write another line to you. I would not see you if I could help it. Oh, that I never had! But tell me, of a truth, is Miss Howe really and truly ill? Very ill. And is not her illness poison? And don't you know who gave it to her? What you, or Mrs. Sinclair, or somebody, I cannot tell who, have done to my poor head you best know. But I shall never be what I was. My head is gone. I have wept away all my brain, I believe. For I can weep no more. Indeed, I have had my full share, so it is no matter. But, good now, Lovelace, don't set Mrs. Sinclair upon me again. I never did her any harm. She so affrights me when I see her. Ever since, when was it, I cannot tell. You can, I suppose. She may be a good woman, as far as I know. She was the wife of a man of honour, very likely, though forced to let lodgings for a livelihood. Poor gentlewoman. Let her know I pity her. But don't let her come near me again. Pray don't. Yet she may be a very good woman. What would I say? I forget what I was going to say. Oh, Lovelace, you are Satan himself, or he helps you out in everything, and that's as bad. But have you really and truly sold yourself to him? And for how long? What duration is your reign to have? Poor man, the contract will be out, and then what will be your fate? Oh, Lovelace, if you could be sorry for yourself, I would be sorry too. But when all my doors are fast, and nothing but the keyhole open, and the key of late put into that, to be where you are, in a manner, without opening any of them, oh, wretched, wretched Clarissa Harlowe, for I never will be Lovelace. Let my uncle take it as he pleases. Well, but now I remember what I was going to say. It is for your good, not mine, for nothing can do me good now. Oh, thy villainous man, thou hated Lovelace! but Mrs. Sinclair may be a good woman. If you love me, but that you don't, but don't let her bluster up with her worse and mannish airs to me again. Oh, she is a frightful woman, if she be a woman. She needed not to put on that fearful mask to scare me out of my poor wits. But don't tell her what I said. I have no hatred to her. It is only fright, and a foolish fear, that's all. She may not be a bad woman, but neither are all men, any more than all women alike." God forbid they should be like you. Alas, you have killed my head among you. I don't say who did it. God forgive you all. But had it not been better to have put me out of all your ways at once? You might safely have done it, for nobody would require me at your hands. No, not a soul, except indeed Miss Howe would have said, when she should see you. What, Lovelace, have you done with Clarissa Harlowe? And then you could have given any slight, gay answer— sent her beyond sea, or she has run away from me, as she did from her parents. And this would have been easily credited, for you know, Lovelace, she that could run away from them might very well run away from you. But this is nothing to what I wanted to say. Now I have it. 
I have lost it again. This foolish wench comes teasing me. For what purpose should I eat? For what end should I wish to live? I tell thee, Dorcas, I will never eat nor drink. I cannot be worse than I am. I will do as you'd have me. Good Dorcas, look not upon me so fiercely. But thou canst not look so bad as I have seen somebody look. Mr. Lovelace, now that I remember what I took pen in hand to say, let me hurry off my thoughts, lest I lose them again. Here I am sensible, and yet I am hardly sensible neither, but I know my head is not as it should be, for all that. Therefore let me propose one thing to you. It is for your good, not mine, and this is it. I must needs be both a trouble and an expense to you. And here my uncle Harlow, when he knows how I am, will never wish any man to have me. No, not even you, who have been the occasion of it. Barbarous and ungrateful. A less complicated villainy cost a talking. But I forget what I would say again. Then this is it. I never shall be myself again. I have been a very wicked creature. A vain, proud, poor creature, full of secret pride. Which I carried off under a humble guise, and deceived everybody. My sister says so. And now I am punished. So let me be carried out of this house, and out of your sight and let me be put into that bedlam privately, which once I saw. But it was a sad sight to me then, little as I thought what I should come to myself. That is all I would say. This is all I have to wish for. Then I shall be out of all your ways, and I shall be taken care of, and bread and water without your tormentings will be dainties, and my straw bed the easiest I have lain in, for I cannot tell how long. My clothes will sell for what will keep me there, perhaps as long as I shall live. But Lovelace, dear Lovelace, I will call you, for you have cost me enough, I am sure. Don't let me be made a show of, for my family's sake. Nay, for your own sake, don't do that, for when I know all I have suffered, which yet I do not, and no matter if I never do, I may be apt to rave against you by name, and tell of all your baseness to a poor humbled creature that once was as proud as anybody. But of what I can tell, except of my own folly and vanity, but let that pass, since I am punished enough for it. So, suppose, instead of Bedlam, it were a private madhouse, when nobody comes. That will be better a great idea. But another thing, Lovelace, don't let them use me cruelly when I am there. You have used me cruelly enough, you know. Don't let them use me cruelly, for I will be very tractable, and do as anybody would have me to do, except what you would have me do. For that I never will. Another thing, Lovelace, don't let this good woman, I was going to say vile woman, but I'll tell her that, because she won't let you send me to this happy refuge, perhaps, if she were to know it. Another thing, Lovelace, and let me have pen and ink and paper allowed me. It will be all my amusement, but they need not send to anybody I shall write to what I write, because it will but trouble them, and somebody may do you a mischief, maybe... I wish not that anybody do anybody a mischief upon my account. You tell me that Lady Betty Lawrence and your cousin Montague were here to take leave of me, but that I was asleep and could not be wakened. So you told me at first I was married, you know, and that you were my husband. Ah, Lovelace, look at what you say, but let not them, for they will sport with my misery. Let not that Lady Betty, let not that Miss Montague, whatever the real ones may do, nor Mrs. Sinclair neither, nor any of her lodgers, nor her nieces, come to see me in my place. Real ones, I say, for, Lovelace, I shall find out all your villainies in time. Indeed I shall. So put me there as soon as you can. It is for your good. Then all will pass for ravings that I can say as, I doubt no many poor creatures' exclamations do pass, though there may be too much truth in them for all that. And you know I began to be mad at Hampstead. So you said. Ah! "'Villainous man, what have you not to answer for?' "'A little interval seems to be lent me. "'I had begun to look over what I have written. "'It is not fit for any one to see, "'so far as I have been able to reperuse it, "'but my head will not hold, I doubt, to go through it all. "'If therefore I have not already mentioned my earnest desire, "'let me tell you it is this, "'that I be sent out of this abominable house without delay, "'and locked up in some private madhouse about this town, "'for such, it seems, there are, never more to be seen, or to be produced to anybody, except in your own vindication, if you should be charged with the murder of my person, a much lighter crime than that of honour, which the greatest villain on earth has robbed me of. 
and deny me not this last request, I beseech you, and one other, and that is, never to let me see you more. This surely may be granted to the miserably abused Clarissa Harlowe. I will not bear thy heavy preachments, Belford, upon this affecting letter. So not a word of that sort. The paper thou see is blistered with the tears even of the hardened transcriber, which has made her ink run here and there. Mrs. Sinclair is a true heroine, and I think shames us all, and she is a woman too. Thou'lt say the best things corrupted become the worst, but this is certain, that whatever the sex set their hearts upon, they make thorough work of it, and hence it is that a mischief which would end in simple robbery among men rogues becomes murder if a woman be in it. I know thou wilt blame me for having had recourse to art, but do not physicians prescribe opiates in acute cases where the violence of the disorder would be apt to throw the patient into a fever or delirium. I aver that my motive for this expedient was mercy, nor could it be anything else, for a rake, thou knowest, to us rakes, is far from being an undesirable thing. Nothing but the law stands in our way. Upon that account, and the opinion of what a modest woman will suffer rather than become a viva voce accuser lessens much an honest fellow's apprehensions on that score. Then, if these somnivolences, I hate the word opiates on this occasion, have turned her head, that is an effect they frequently have upon some constitutions, and in this case was rather the fault of the doze than the design of the giver. But is not wine itself an opiate in degree? How many women have been taken advantage of by wine, and other still more intoxicating viands? Let me tell thee, Jack, that the experience of many of the passive sex, and the consciences of many more of the active appealed to, will testify that thy lovelace is not the worst of villains, nor would I have thee put me upon clearing myself by comparisons. If she escape a settled delirium when my plots unravel, I think it is all I ought to be concerned about. What, therefore, I desire of thee, is that if two constructions may be made of my actions, thou wilt afford me the most favourable. For this not only friendship, but my own ingenuousness, which has furnished thee with the knowledge of the facts against which thou art so ready to inveigh, require of thee. Will is just returned from an errand to Hampstead, and acquaints me that Mrs. Townsend was yesterday at Mrs. Moore's, accompanied by three or four rough fellows, a greater number, as supposed, at the distance. She was strangely surprised at the news that my spouse and I are entirely reconciled, and that two fine ladies, my relations, came to visit her, and went to town with her, where she is very happy with me. She was sure we were not married, she said, unless it was while we were at Hampstead, and they were sure the ceremony was not performed there. But that the lady is happy and easy is unquestionable, and a fling was thrown out by Mrs. Moore and Mrs. Bevis at mischief-makers, as they knew Mrs. Townsend to be acquainted with Miss Howe. Now, since my fair one I can neither receive nor send away letters, 
I am pretty easy as to this Mrs. Townsend and her employer, and I fancy Miss Howe will be puzzled to know what to think of the matter, and afraid of sending by Wilson's conveyance, and perhaps suppose that her friend slights her, or has changed her mind in my favour, and is ashamed to own it, as she has not had an answer to what she wrote and will believe that the rustic delivered her last letter into her own hand. Meantime, I have a little project come into my head, of a new kind, just for amusement's sake, that's all. Variety has irresistible charms. I cannot live without intrigue. My charmer has no passions, that is to say, none of the passions that I want her to have. She engages all my reverence. I am at present more inclined to regret what I have done than to proceed to new offences, and shall regret it till I see how she takes it when recovered. Shall I tell thee my project? Tis not a high one. Tis this. To get hither Mrs. Moore, Miss Rawlins, and my widow Bevis, for they are desirous to make a visit to my spouse now we are so happy together, and if I can order it right, Belton, Mowbray, Tourville, and I will show them a little more of the ways of this wicked town than they at present know. Why should they be acquainted with a man of my character, and not be the better and wiser for it? I would have everybody rail against rakes with judgment and knowledge, if they will rail. Two of these women gave me a great deal of trouble, and the third, I am confident, will forgive a merry evening. Thou wilt be curious to know what the persons of these women are, to whom I intend so much distinction. I think I have not heretofore mentioned anything characteristic of their persons. Mrs. Moore is a widow of about thirty-eight, a little mortified by misfortunes, but those are often the merriest folks, when warmed. She has good features still, and is what they call much of a gentlewoman, and very neat in her person and dress. She has given over, I believe, all thoughts of our sex. But when the dying embers are raked up about the half-consumed stump, there will be fuel enough left, I dare say, to blaze out, and to give a comfortable warmth to a half-starved bystander. Mrs. Bevis is comely, that is to say plump, a lover of mirth, and one whom no grief ever dwelt with, I dare say, for a week together, about twenty-five years of age. Mowbray will have very little difficulty with her, I believe, for one cannot do everything oneself. And yet sometimes women of this free caste, when it comes to the point, answer not the promises their cheerful forwardness gives a man who has a view upon them. Miss Rawlins is an agreeable young lady enough, but not beautiful. She has sense, and would be thought to know the world, as it is called, but for her knowledge is more indebted to theory than experience. A mere whipped syllabub knowledge, this, Jack, that always fails the person who trusts to it, when it should hold to do her service for such young ladies have so much dependence upon their own understanding and wariness, are so much above the cautions that the less opinionative may be benefited by, that their presumption is generally their overthrow, when attempted by a man of experience, who knows how to flatter their vanity, and to magnify their wisdom, in order to take advantage of their folly. But for Miss Rawlins, if I can add experience to her theory, what an accomplished person will she be, and how much will she be obliged to me? And not only she, 
but all those who may be the better for the precept she thinks herself already so well qualified to give. Dearly, Jack, do I love to engage with these precept-givers and example-setters. Now, Belford, although there is nothing striking in any of these characters, yet may we, at a pinch, make a good frolicky half-day with them, if, after we have softened their wax at table by encouraging viands, we can set our women and them into dancing, dancing which all women love, and all men should therefore promote for both their sakes. And thus, when Tourville sings, Belton fiddles, Mowbray makes rough love, and I smooth, and thou, Jack, wilt be by that time well enough to join in the chorus. The devil's in it, if we don't mould them into what shape we please. Our own women, by their laughing freedoms, encouraging them to break through all their customary reserves. For women to women, thou knowest, are great darers and incentives, not one of them loving to be outdone or outdared when their hearts are thoroughly warmed. I know, at first, the difficulty will be the accidental absence of my dear Mrs. Lovelace, to whom principally they will design their visit. But if we can exhilarate them, they won't then wish to see her, and I can form twenty accidents and excuses from one hour to another for her absence, till each shall have a subject to take up all her thoughts. I am really sick at heart for a frolic, and have no doubt but this will be an agreeable one. These women already think me a wild fellow, nor do they like me the less for it, as I can perceive, and I shall take care that they shall be treated with so much freedom before one another's faces, that in policy they shall keep each other's counsel. And won't this be doing a kind thing by them, since it will knit an indissoluble band of union and friendship between three women who are neighbours, and at present have only common obligations to one another? For thou wantest not to be told that secrets of love and secrets of this nature are generally the strongest cement of female friendships. But after all, if my beloved should be happily restored to her intellects, we may have scenes arise between us that will be sufficiently busy to employ all the faculties of thy friend without looking out for new occasions. Already, as I have often observed, has she been the means of saving scores of her sex, yet without her own knowledge. Saturday night by Dorcas's account of her lady's behaviour, the dear creature seems to be recovering. I shall give the earliest notice of this to the worthy Captain Tomlinson, that he may apprise Uncle John of it. I must be properly enabled from that quarter to pacify her, or at least to rebate her first violence. End of Letter 16letter seventeen of clarissa harlowe volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org clarissa harlowe volume six by Samuel Richardson Letter 17 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, 
Sunday afternoon, six o'clock, June eighteenth. I went out early this morning, and returned not till just now, when I was informed that my beloved, in my absence, had taken it into her head to attempt to get away. She tripped down, with a parcel tied up in a handkerchief, her hood on, and was actually in the entry when Mrs. Sinclair saw her. Pray, madam, whipping between her and the street door, be pleased to let me know where you are going. Who has a right to control me? was the word. I have, madam, by order of your spouse, and kemboing her arms as she owned, I desire you will be pleased to walk up again. She would have spoken, but could not, and bursting into tears turned back and went up to her chamber, and Dorcas was taken to task for suffering her to be in the passage before she was seen. This shows, as we hoped last night, that she is recovering her charming intellects. Dorcas says she was visible to her but once before the whole day, and then she seemed very solemn and sedate. I will endeavour to see her. It must be in her own chamber, I suppose, for she will hardly meet me in the dining-room. What advantage will the confidence of our sex give me over the modesty of hers if she be recovered? I, the most confident of men, she, the most delicate of women, sweet soul, methinks I have her before me, her face averted, speech lost in sighs, abashed, conscious, what a triumphant aspect will this give me, when I gaze on her downcast countenance. This moment, Dorcas tells me she believes she is coming to find me out. She asked her after me, and Dorcas left her, drying her red swollen eyes at her glass, no design of moving me by tears, sighing too sensibly for my carriage. But to what purpose have I gone thus far, if I pursue not my principal end? Niceness must be a little abated. She knows the worst, that she cannot fly me, that she must see me, and that I can look her into a sweet confusion. Our circumstance is greatly in my favour. What can she do but rave and exclaim? I am used to raving and exclaiming, but if recovered, I shall see how she behaves upon this, our first sensible interview, after what she has suffered. Here she comes. End of letter 17 Letter 18 Of Clarissa Harlow Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 By Samuel Richardson Letter 18 Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire Sunday night. Never blame me for giving way to have art used with this admirable creature. All the princes of the air or beneath it, joining with me, could never have subdued her while she had her senses. I will not anticipate, only to tell thee that I am too much awakened by her to think of sleep were I to go to bed, and so shall have nothing to do but to write an account of our odd conversation, while it is so strong upon my mind that I can think of nothing else. She was dressed in a white damask nightgown, with less negligence than for some days past. I was sitting with my pen in my fingers, and stood up when I first saw her, 
with great complacence, as if the day were still her own, and so indeed it is. She entered with such dignity in her manner, as struck me with great awe, and prepared me for the poor figure I made in the subsequent conversation. A poor figure indeed! But I will do her justice. She came up with quick steps pretty close to me, a white handkerchief in her hand, her eyes neither fierce nor mild, but very earnest, and a fixed sedateness in her whole aspect, which seemed to be the effect of deep contemplation, and thus she accosted me with an air and action that I never saw equalled. You see before you, sir, the wretch whose preference of you to all your sex you have rewarded, as it indeed deserved to be rewarded. My father's dreadful curse has already operated upon me in the very letter of it, as to this life, and it seems to me too evident that it will not be your fault, that it is not entirely completed in the loss of my soul, as well as of my honour, which you, villainous man, have robbed me of, with a baseness so unnatural, so inhuman, that it seems you, even you, had not the heart to attempt it, till my senses were made the previous sacrifice. Here I made an hesitating effort to speak, laying down my pen, but she proceeded. Hear me out, guilty wretch, abandoned man. Man, did I say, yet what name else can I, since the mortal worryings of the fiercest beast would have been more natural and infinitely more welcome than what you have acted by me, and that with a premeditation and contrivance worthy only of that single heart which now base as well as ungrateful as thou art seems to quake within thee and well mayest thou quake well mayest thou tremble and falter and hesitate as thou dost when thou reflectest upon what i have suffered for thy sake and upon the returns thou hast made me by my soul belford my whole frame was shaken for not only her looks and her action, but her voice, so solemn, was inexpressibly affecting. And then my cursed guilt, and her innocence, and merit, and rank, and superiority of talents, all stared me at that instant in the face so formidably, that my present account, to which she unexpectedly called me, seemed, as I then thought, to resemble that general one, to which we are told we shall be summoned when our conscience shall be our accuser. But she had had time to collect all the powers of her eloquence, the whole day, probably, in her intellects. And then I was the more disappointed, as I had thought I could have gazed the dear creature into confusion. But it is plain that the sense she has of her wrongs sets this matchless woman above all lesser, all weaker considerations, my dear, my love, I, 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 never, no, never, lips trembling, limbs quaking, voice inward, hesitating, broken, never surely did miscreant look so like a miscreant. While thus she proceeded, waving her snowy hand with all the graces of moving oratory. I have no pride in the confusion visible in thy whole person. I have been all the day praying for a composure, if I could not escape from this vile house, that should once more enable me to look up to my destroyer with the consciousness of an innocent sufferer. Thou seest me, since my wrongs are beyond the power of words to express, thou seest me calm enough to wish that thou mayst continue harassed by the workings of thy own conscience, till effectual repentance take hold of thee, that so thou mayest not forfeit all title to that mercy which thou hast not shown to the poor creature now before thee, who had so well deserved to meet with a faithful friend, where she met with the worst of enemies. But tell me, 
for no doubt thou hast some scheme to pursue. Tell me, since I am a prisoner, as I find, in the vilest of houses, and have not a friend to protect or save me, what thou intendest shall become of the remnant of a life not worth the keeping. Tell me if yet there are more evils reserved for me, and whether thou hast entered into a compact with the grand deceiver in the person of his horrid agent in this house, and if the ruin of my soul, that my father's curse may be fulfilled, is to complete the triumphs of so vile a confederacy. Answer me. Say, if thou hast courage to speak out to her whom thou hast ruined, tell me what father I am to suffer from thy barbarity. She stopped here, and sighing, turned her sweet face from me, drying up with her handkerchief those tears which she endeavoured to restrain, and when she could not, to conceal from my sight. As I told thee, I had prepared myself for high passions, raving, flying, tearing execration. These transient violences, the workings of sudden grief and shame and vengeance, would have set us upon a par with each other, and quitted scores. These have I been accustomed to, and as nothing violent is lasting with these, I could have wished to encounter. But such a majestic composure, seeking me, whom yet it is plain by her attempt to get away she would have avoided seeking, no Lucretia-like vengeance upon herself in her thought, yet swallowed up, her whole mind swallowed up, as I may say, by a grief so heavy as in her own words, to be beyond the power of speech to express, and to be able, discomposed as she was, to the very morning, to put such a home question to me, as if she had penetrated my future view, how could I avoid looking like a fool, and answering as before, in broken sentences, and confusion? What? What a, uh, what, what has been done? I, 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 I cannot but say a stone, uh, must confess. Um, um, I, it's not right. It's not what should have been, but, uh, but, but I, I am truly, truly sorry for it. Upon my soul I am, and, and will do all, do, do everything, do what, what, whatever is incumbent upon me, all that you, that you, that you shall require to make you amends. Oh, Belford, Belford, who's the triumph now, hers or mine? Amends, oh, the truly despicable wretch. Then lifting up her eyes, good heaven, who shall pity the creature who could fall by so base a mind? Yet, and then she looked indignantly upon me, yet I hate thee not, base and low-souled as thou art, half so much as I hate myself, that I saw thee not sooner in thy proper colours, that I hoped either morality, gratitude, or humanity from a libertine, who, to be a libertine, must have got over and defied all moral sanctions. Her cousin Morton's words to her in his letter from Florence. See volume four, letter nineteen. She then called upon her cousin Morden's name, as if he had warned her against a man of free principles, and walked towards the window, her handkerchief at her eyes, but turning short towards me with an air of mingled scorn and majesty, what, at the moment, would I have given never to have injured her? What amends hast thou to propose? What amends can such a one as thou make to a person of spirit, or common sense, for the evils thou hast so inhumanely made me suffer. As soon, madam, uh, as soon as, uh, as soon as your uncle, or, or, or not waiting, thou wouldst tell me, I suppose, I know what thou wouldst tell me, but thinkest thou that marriage will satisfy for a guilt like thine? destitute as thou hast made me both of friends and fortune, 
I too much despise the wretch who could rob himself of his wife's virtue, to endure the thoughts of thee and the light thou seemest to hope I will accept thee in. I hesitated an interruption, but my meaning died away upon my trembling lips. I could only pronounce the word marriage, and thus she proceeded. Let me, therefore, know whether I am to be controlled in the future disposal of myself, or whether in a country of liberty as this, where the sovereign of it must not be guilty of your wickedness, and where you neither durst have attempted it, had I one friend or relation to look upon me, I am to be kept here a prisoner, to sustain fresh injuries, whether, in a word, you intend to hinder me from going or where my destiny shall lead me. After a pause, for I was still silent. Can you not answer me this plain question? I quit all claim, all expectation upon you. What right have you to detain me here? I could not speak. What could I say to such a question? Oh, wretch! wringing her uplifted hands, had I not been robbed of my senses, and that in the basest manner you best know how, had I been able to account for myself and your proceedings, or to have known but how the days passed, a whole week should not have gone over my head as I find it has done, before I had told you what I now tell you, that the man who has been the villain to me you have been shall never make me his wife. I will write to my uncle, to lay aside his kind intentions in my favour, all my prospects are shut in. I give myself up for a lost creature as to this world. Hinder me not from entering upon a life of severe penitence, for corresponding after prohibition with a wretch who has too well justified all their warnings and inveteracy, and for throwing myself into the power of your vile artifices. Let me try to secure the only hope I have left, this is all the amends I ask of you. I repeat, therefore, am I now at liberty to dispose of myself as I please? Now comes the fool, the miscreant again, hesitating his broken answer. My dearest love, I am confounded, quite confounded, at the thought of what, of what has been done, and at the thought of to whom I see. I see there is no withstanding your eloquence. Such irresistible proofs of the love of virtue for its own sake did I never hear of, nor meet with, in all my reading. And if you can forgive a repentant villain, who thus on his knees implores your forgiveness, then down I dropped, absolutely in earnest in all I said. I vow by all that's sacred and just, and may a thunderbolt strike me dead at your feet, if I am not sincere, that I will by marriage before to-morrow noon, without waiting for your uncle, or anybody, do you all the justice I now can do you, and you shall ever after control and direct me as you please, till you have made me more worthy of your angelic purity than now I am, nor will I presume so much as to touch your garment, till I have the honour to call so great a blessing lawfully mine." Oh, thou guileful betrayer! There is a just God whom thou invokest, yet the thunderbolt descends not, and thou livest to imprecate and deceive. My dearest life, rising, for I hoped she was relenting, hadst thou not sinned beyond the possibility of forgiveness, interrupted she, and this had been the first time that thus thou solemnly promisest and invokest the vengeance thou hast as often defied. The desperateness of my condition might have induced me to think of taking a wretched chance with a man so profligate. But after what I have suffered by thee, it would be criminal in me to wish to bind my soul in covenant to a man so nearly allied to perdition. Good God! How uncharitable! I offer not to defend. Would to heaven that I could recall. So nearly allied to perdition, madam! 
so profligate a man, madam? Oh, how short is expression of thy crimes, and of my sufferings, such premeditation in thy baseness, to prostitute the characters of persons of honour of thy own family, and all to delude a poor creature whom thou oughtest. But why talk I to thee? Be thy crimes upon thy head. Once more I ask thee, am I, or am I not, at my own liberty now? I offered to speak in defence of the women, declaring that they really were the very persons. Presume not, interrupted she, base as thou art, to say one word in thine own vindication. I have been contemplating their behaviour, their conversation, their over-ready acquiescences, to my declarations in thy disfavour, their free, yet affectedly reserved, light manners, and now that the sad event has opened my eyes, and I have compared facts and passages together, in the little interval that has been lent me, I wonder I could not distinguish the behaviour of the unmatronlike jilt, and thou broughtest to betray me from the worthy lady whom thou hast the honour to call thy aunt, and that I could not detect the superficial creature whom thou passest upon me for the virtuous Miss Montague. Amazing uncharitableness in a lady so good herself, that the high spirits those ladies were in to see you should subject them to such censures. I do most solemnly bow, madam. That they were, interrupting me, verily and indeed, Lady Betty Lawrence, and thy cousin Montague. O oh, wretch, I see by thy solemn averment, I had not yet averted, what credit ought to be given to all the rest, had I no other proof. Interrupting her, I besought her patient ear. I had found myself, I told her, almost avowedly despised and hated. I had no hope of gaining her love or her confidence. The letter she had left behind her on her removal to Hampstead sufficiently convinced me that she was entirely under Miss Howe's influence, and waited but the return of a letter from her to enter upon measures that would deprive me of her for ever. Miss Howe had ever been my enemy. More so then, no doubt, from the contents of the letter she had written to her on her first coming to Hampstead, that I dared not to stand the event of such a letter, and was glad of an opportunity, by Lady Betty's and my cousin's means, though they knew not my motive, to get her back to town. For, at that time, from intending the outrage which my despair, and her want of confidence in me, put me so vilely upon. I would have proceeded, and particularly would have said something of Captain Tomlinson and her uncle, but she would not hear me further, and indeed it was with visible indignation, and not without several angry interruptions, that she heard me say so much. Would I dare, she asked me, to offer at a palliation of my baseness. The two women, she was convinced, were impostors. She knew not, but Captain Tomlinson and Mr. Mennell were so too. But whether they were so or not, I was. And she insisted upon being at her own disposal for the remainder of her short life, for indeed she abhorred me in every light, and more particularly in that in which I offered myself to her acceptance and saying this she flung from me, leaving me absolutely shocked and confounded at her part of a conversation which she began with such uncommon, however severe, composure, and concluded with so much sincere and unaffected indignation. And now, Jack, I must address one serious paragraph particularly to thee. I have not yet touched upon cohabitation, her uncle's mediation she does not absolutely discredit, as I had the pleasure to find by one hint in this conversation, 
yet she suspects my future views, and has doubt about Menel and Tomlinson. I do say, if she come fairly at her lights, at her clues, or what shall I call them? Her penetration is wonderful. But if she do not come at them fairly, then is her incredulity, then is her antipathy to me, evidently accounted for. I will speak out. Thou couldst not, surely, play me booty, Jack. Surely thou couldst not let thy weak pity for her lead thee to an unpardonable breach of trust to thy friend, who has been so unreserved in his communications to thee. I cannot believe thee capable of such a baseness. Satisfy me, however, upon this head. I must make a cursed figure in her eye, bowing and protesting, as I shall not scruple occasionally to bow and protest, if all the time she has had unquestionable informations of my perfidy. I know thou as little fearest me as I do thee, if any point of manhood, and wilt scorn to deny it, if thou hast done it, when thus home pressed. And here I have a good mind to stop, and write no farther, till I have thy answer. And so I will. Monday morning, past three. End of letter 18「A Letter Nineteen of Clarissa Harlow, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume Six, by Samuel Richardson. A Letter Nineteen. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, Monday morn, five o'clock, June 19. I must write on, nothing else can divert me, and I think thou canst not have been a dog to me. I would fain have closed my eyes, but sleep flies me. Well, says Horace, as translated by Cowley, the halcyon sleep will ever build his nest. Well, says Horace, as translated by Cowley, the halcyon sleep will never build his nest in any stormy breast. Tis not enough that he does find clouds and darkness in the mind. Darkness but half his work will do. Tis not enough. He must find quiet too. Now indeed do I from my heart wish that I had never known this lady. But who would have thought there had been such a woman in the world? Of all the sex I have hitherto known or heard or read of, it was once subdued and always subdued. The first struggle was generally the last, or at least the subsequent struggles were so much fainter and fainter, that a man would rather have them than be without them. But how know I yet? It is now near six. The sun for two hours past has been illuminating everything about me, for that impartial orb shines upon Mother Sinclair's house as well as upon any other but nothing within me can it illuminate. At day-dawn I looked through the keyhole of my beloved's door. She had declared she would not put off her clothes any more in this house. There I beheld her in a sweet slumber, which I hope will prove refreshing to her disturbed senses, sitting in her elbow-chair, her apron over her head, her head supported by one sweet hand, the other hand hanging down upon her side in a sleepy lifelessness, half of one pretty foot only visible. See the difference in our cases, thought I, she the charming injured, 
can sweetly sleep while the violet injurer cannot close his eyes and has been trying to no purpose the whole night to divert his melancholy and to fly from himself as every vice generally brings on its own punishment even in this life if anything were to tempt me to doubt of future punishment it would be that there can hardly be a greater than that in which i at this instance experience in my own remorse i hope it will go off if not well will the dear creature be avenged for i shall be the most miserable of men six o'clock just now dorcas tells me that her lady is preparing openly and without disguise to be gone very probable the humour she flew away from me in last night has given me expectation of such an enterprise now jack to be thus hated and despised and if i have sinned beyond forgiveness but she has sent me a message by dorcas that she will meet me in the dining-room and desires oddly enough th that the wretch may be present at the conversation that shall pass between us this message gives me hope nine o'clock confounded art cunning villainy by my soul she had liked to have slipped through my fingers she meant nothing by her message but to get dorcas out of the way and a clear coast is a fancied distress sufficient to justify this lady for dispensing with her principles does she not show me that she can wilfully deceive as well as i had she been in the forehouse and no passage to go through to get at the street door she had certainly been gone but her haste betrayed her for sally martin happening to be in the fore parlour and hearing a swifter motion than usual and a rustling of silks as if from somebody in a hurry looked out and seeing who it was stepped between her and the door and set her back against it you must not go madam indeed you must not by what right and how dare you and such like imperious airs the dear creature gave herself while sally called out for her aunt and half a dozen voices joined instantly in the cry for me to hasten down to hasten down in a moment i was gravely instructing dorcas above stairs and wondering what would be the subject of the conversation to which the wench was to be a witness when these outcries reached my ears and down i flew and there was the charming creature the sweet deceiver panting for breath her back against the partition a parcel in her hand women make no excursions without their parcels sally polly but polly obligingly pleaded for her the mother mabel and peter the footman of the house about her all however keeping their distance the mother and sally between her and the door in her soft rage the dear soul repeating i will go nobody has a right i will go if you kill me women i won't go up again as soon as she saw me she stepped a pace or two towards me mr lovelace i will go said she do you authorize these women what right have they or you either to stop me is this my dear preparative to the conversation you led me to expect in the dining-room and do you think say, i can part with you thus do you think i will and am i sir to be thus beset surrounded thus what have these women to do with me i desired them to leave us all but dorcas who was down as soon as i i then thought it right to assume an air of resolution having found my tameness so greatly triumphed over and now my dear said i urging her reluctant feet be pleased to walk into the fore parlour here since you will not go upstairs here we may hold our parley and dorcas will be witness to it and now madam seating her and sticking my hands in my sides your pleasure insolent villain said the furious lady and rising ran to the window and threw up the sash she knew not i suppose 
that there were iron rails before the windows, and when she found she could not get out into the street, clasping her uplifted hands together, having dropped her parcel, for the love of God, good, honest man, for the love of God, mistress, to two passers-by, a poor, a poor creature, said she, ruined. I clasped her in my arms, people beginning to gather about the window, and then she cried out, Murder! Help! Help! and carried her up to the dining-room, in spite of her little plotting heart, as I may now call it. Although she violently struggled, catching hold of the banisters here and there as she could, I would have seated her there, but she sunk down half motionless, pale as ashes, and a violent burst of tears happily relieved her. Dorcas wept over her. The wench was actually moved for her. Violent hysterics succeeded. I left her to Mabel, Dorcas, and Polly, the latter the most supportable to her of the sisterhood. This attempt, so resolutely made, alarmed me not a little. Mrs. Sinclair and her nymphs are much more concerned because of the reputation of their house, as they call it, having received some insults, broken windows threatened, to make them produce the young creature who cried out. While the mobbish inquisitors were in the height of their office, the women came running up to me to know what they should do, a constable being actually fetched. Get the constable into the parlour, said I, with three or four of the forwardest of the mob and produce one of the nymphs, onion-eyed, in a moment, with disordered headdress and handkerchief, and let her own herself the person, the occasion a female skirmish, but satisfied with the justice done her. Then give a dram or two to each fellow, and all will be well. Eleven o'clock. All done as I advised, and all is well. Mrs. Sinclair wishes she had never seen the face of so skittish a lady, and she and Sally are extremely pressing with me to leave the perverse beauty to their breaking, as they call it, for four or five days. But I cursed them into silence, only ordering double precaution for the future. Polly, though she consoled the dear perverse one all she could when with her, insists upon it to me, that nothing but terror will procure me tolerable usage. Dorcas was challenged by the woman upon her tears. She owned them real, said she was ashamed of herself, but could not help it. So sincere, so unyielding a grief, and so sweet a lady. The women laughed at her, but I bid her make no apologies for her tears, nor mind their laughing. I was glad to see them so ready. Good use might be made of such strangers. In short, I would not have her indulge them often, and try if it were not possible to gain her lady's confidence by her concern for her. She said that her lady did take kind notice of them to her, and was glad to see such tokens of humanity in her. Well then, said I, your part, whether anything come of it or not, is to be tender-hearted. It can do no harm if no good. But take care you are not too suddenly or too officiously compassionate. So Dorcas will be a humane, good sort of creature, I believe, very quickly with her lady. And so, as it becomes women to be so, and as my beloved is willing to think highly of her own sex, it will the more readily pass with her. I thought to have had one trial, having gone so far for cohabitation, but what hope can there be of succeeding? She is invincible. Against all my motions, against all my conceptions, thinking of her as a woman, and in the very bloom of her charms, she is absolutely invincible. My whole view at the present is to do her legal justice, if I can but once more get her out of her altitudes. The consent of such a woman must make her ever new, ever charming. But astonishing! Can the want of a church ceremony make such a difference? She owes me her consent, for hitherto I have had nothing to boast of. All of my side has been deep remorse, anguish of mind, 
and love increased rather than abated. How her proud rejection stings me! And yet I hope still to get her to listen to my stories of the family reconciliation, and of her uncle and Captain Tomlinson, and as she has given me a pretence to detain her against her will, she must see me, whether in temper or not, she cannot help it. And if love will not do, terror, as the women advise, must be tried. A nice part, after all, has my beloved to act. If she forgive me easily, I resume, perhaps, my projects. If she carry her rejection into violence, that violence may make me desperate, and occasion fresh violence. She ought, since she thinks she has found the women out, to consider where she is. I am confoundedly out of conceit with myself. If I give up my contrivances, my joy in stratagem and plot and invention, I shall be but a common man, such another dull, heavy creature as thyself. Yet what does even my success in my machinations bring me but regret, disgrace, repentance? But I am overmatched, egregiously overmatched by this woman. What to do with her, or without her, I know not. End of letter 19
she would never see me more, and that she had been asking after the characters and conditions of the neighbours, I suppose, now she has found her voice, to call out for help from them, if there were any to hear her. She will have it now, it seems, that I had the wickedness from the very beginning to contrive for her ruin, a house so convenient for dreadful mischief. Dorcas begs of her to be pacified, entreats her to see me with patience, tells her that I am one of the most determined of men, as she has heard say that gentleness may do with me, but that nothing else will, she believes, and want, as her ladyship, as she always styles her, is married, if I had broken my oath, or intended to break it. She hinted plain enough to the honest wench that she was not married, but Dorcas would not understand her. This shows she is resolved to keep no measures, and now is to be a trial of skill, whether she shall or not. Dorcas has hinted to her my lord's illness as a piece of intelligence that dropped in conversation from me. But here I stop. My beloved, pursuant to my peremptory message, is just gone up into the dining-room. End of letter 20Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, Monday afternoon. Pity me, Jack, for pity's sake, since if thou dost not, nobody else will, and yet never was there a man of my genius and lively temper that wanted it more. We are apt to attribute to the devil everything that happens to us which we would not have happen, but here being as Perhaps thou wilt say, the devil myself, my plagues arise from an angel. I suppose all mankind is to be plagued by its contrary. She began with me like a true woman, she in the fault I to be blamed. The moment I entered the dining-room, not the least apology, not the least excuse for the uproar she had made and the trouble she had given me. I come, said she, into thy detested presence, because I cannot help it, but why am I to be imprisoned here, although to no purpose I cannot help? Dearest madam, interrupted I, give not way to so much violence. You must know that your detention is entirely owing to the desire I have to make you all the amends that is in my power to make you, and this as well for your sake as my own. Surely there is still one way left to repair the wrongs you have suffered? Canst thou blot out the past week, several weeks past, I should say, ever since I have been with thee? Canst thou call back time, if thou canst? Surely, madam, again interrupting her, if I may be permitted to call you legally mine, I might have but anticipated wretch that thou art say not another word upon this subject when thou vowedst when thou promisedst at hampstead i had begun to think that i must be thine if i had consented at the request of those i thought thy relations this would have been a principal inducement 
that I could then have brought thee what was most wanted, an unsullied honour in dowry, to a wretch destitute of all honour, and could have met the gratulations of a family to which thy life has been one continued disgrace, with a consciousness of deserving their gratulations. But thinkest thou that I will give a harlot niece to thy honourable uncle, and to thy real aunts, and a cousin to thy cousins from a brothel? For such, in my opinion, is this detested house. Then, lifting up her clasped hands, Great and good God of heaven, said she, Give me patience to support myself, under the weight of those afflictions which thou, for wise and good ends, though at present impenetrable by me, hast permitted. Then, turning towards me, who knew neither what to say to her, nor for myself, I renounce thee for ever, loveless, abhorred of my soul, for ever I renounce thee, Seek thy fortunes wheresoever thou wilt, only now that thou hast already ruined me. Ruined you, madam? The world need not. I, I knew not what to say. Ruined me in my own eyes, and that is the same to me as if all the world knew it. Hinder me not from going whither my mysterious destiny shall lead me. Why hesitate you, sir? What right have you to stop me as you lately did, and to bring me up by force, my hands and arms bruised by your violence? What right have you to detain me here? I am cut to the heart, madam, with invective so violent. I am but too sensible of the wrong I have done you, or I could not bear your reproaches. The man who perpetrates a villainy, and resolves to go on with it, shows not the compunction I show. Yet, if you think yourself in my power, I would caution you, madam, not to make me desperate, for you shall be mine, or my life shall be the forfeit, nor is life worth having without you. Be thine. I be thine, said the passionate beauty, oh, how lovely in her violence. Yes, madam, be mine. I repeat, you shall be mine. My very crime is your glory. My love, my admiration of you is increased by what has passed, and so it ought. I am willing, madam, to court your returning favour, but let me tell you, with a house beset by a thousand armoured men, resolved to take you from me, they should not affect their purpose while I had life. I never, never will be yours, said she, clasping her hands together and lifting up her eyes. I never will be yours. We may yet see many happy years, madam. All your friends may be reconciled to you. The treaty for that purpose is in greater forwardness than you imagine. You know better than to think the worse of yourself for suffering what you could not help. And join but the terms I can make my peace with you upon, and I will instantly comply. Never, never, repeated she, will I be yours. Only forgive me, my dearest life, this one time, a virtue so invincible. What further view can I have against you? Have I attempted any further outrage? If you will be mine, your injuries will be injuries done to myself. You have too well guessed at the unnatural arts that have been used, but can a greater testimony be given of your virtue? And now I have only to hope that although I cannot make you complete amends, Yet you will permit me to make you all the amends that can possibly be made. Here, sick, me out, I beseech you, madam. 
for she was going to speak with an aspect unpacifiedly angry. The God whom you serve requires but repentance and amendment. Imitate him, my dearest love, and bless me with the means of reforming a course of life that begins to be hateful to me. That was once your favourite point. Resume it, dearest creature, in charity to a soul as well as body, which once, as I flattered myself, was more than indifferent to you. Resume it, and let to-morrow's sun be witness to our espousals. I cannot judge thee, said she, but the god to whom thou so boldly referrest can, and assure thyself he will. But if compunction has really taken hold of thee, if indeed thou art touched for thy ungrateful baseness, and meanest anything by this pleading the holy example thou recommendest to my imitation, in this thy pretended repentant moment, let me sift thee thoroughly, and by thy answer I shall judge of the sincerity of thy pretended declarations. Tell me, then, is there any reality in the treaty thou hast pretended to be on foot between my uncle and Captain Tomlinson and thyself? Say, and hesitate not, is there any truth in that story? But remember, if there be not, and thou avowest that there is, what further condemnation attends to thy averment, if it be as solemn as I require it to be? This was her cursed thrust. What could I say? Surely this merciless lady is resolved to damn me, thought I and yet accuses me of a design against her soul. But was I not obliged to proceed as I had begun? In short, I solemnly averred that there was. How one crime, as the good folks say, brings on another. I added that the captain had been in town, and would have waited on her, had she not been indisposed, that he went down much afflicted, as well on her account, as on that of her uncle, though I had not acquainted him either with the nature of her disorder, or the ever-to-be-regretted occasion of it, having told him that it was a violent fever, that he had twice since, by her uncle's desire, sent up to inquire after her health, and that I had already dispatched a man and horse with a letter to acquaint him, and her uncle through him, with her recovery making it my earnest request that he would renew his application to her uncle for the favour of his presence at the private celebrations of our nuptials, and that I expected an answer, if not this night, as to-morrow. Let me ask thee next, said she, thou knowest the opinion I have of the women thou broughtest to me at Hampstead, and to have seduced me hither to my ruin, let me ask thee, if really and truly they were Lady Betty Lawrence and thy cousin Montague? What sayest thou? Hesitate not. What sayest thou to this question? Astonishing, my dear, that you should suspect them, but knowing your strange opinion of them, what can I say to be believed? And is this the answer thou returnest me? Dost thou thus evade my question? But let me know, for I am trying thy sincerity now, and all shall judge of thy new professions by thy answer to this question. Let me know, I repeat, whether those women be really Lady Betty Lawrence and thy cousin Montague. Let me, my dearest love, be enabled to-morrow to call you lawfully mine, and we will set out the next day, if you please, to Berkshire, to my Lord M's, where they both are at this time, 
and you shall convince yourself by your own eyes and by your own ears, which you will believe sooner than all I can say or swear. Now, Belford, I had really some apprehension of treachery from thee, which made me so miserably evade, for else I could as safely have sworn to the truth of this as to that of the former. But she, pressing me still for a categorical answer, I ventured plumb and swore to it, lover's oaths, Jack, that they were really and truly Lady Betty Lawrence and my cousin Montague. She lifted up her hands and eyes. What can I think? What can I think? You think me a devil, madam, a very devil, or you could not, after you have put these questions to me, seem to doubt the truth of answers so solemnly sworn to. And if I do think thee so, have I not cause? Is there another man in the world, I hope, for the sake of human nature there is not, who could act by any poor friendless creature as thou hast acted by me? whom thou hast made friendless, and who before I knew thee had for a friend every one who knew me. I told you, madam, before that Lady Betty and my cousin were actually here in order to take leave of you before they set out for Berkshire, but the effects of my ungrateful crime, such with shame and remorse I own it to be, were the reason you could not see them nor could I be fond that they should see you, since they never would have forgiven me had they known what had passed, and what reason had I to expect your silence on the subject, had you been recovered? It signifies nothing now that the cause of their appearance has been answered in my ruin, who or what they are. But if thou hast averred thus solemnly to two falsehoods, what a wretch do I see before me! I thought she had no reason to be satisfied, and I begged her to allow me to talk to her of to-morrow, as of the happiest day of my life. We have the license, madam, and you must excuse me, that I cannot let you go hence till I have tried every way I can to obtain your forgiveness. And am I then, with a kind of frantic wildness, to be detained a prisoner in this horrid house? Am I, sir? Take care, take care, holding up her hand, menacing. How you make me desperate! If I fall, though by my own hand, inquisition will be made for my blood and be not out in thy plot, Lovelace. If it should be so, make sure work, I charge thee, dig a hole deep enough to cram in, and conceal this unhappy body, for depend upon it that some of those who will not stir to protect me living will move heaven and earth to avenge me dead. A horrid dear creature! By my soul she made me shudder. She had need, indeed, to talk of her unhappiness in falling into the hands of the only man in the world who could have used her as I have used her. She is the only woman in the world who could have shocked and disturbed me as she has done. So we are upon a foot in that respect, and I think I have the worst of it by much, since very little has been my joy, very much my trouble and her punishment, as she calls it, is over. But when mine will, or what it may be, who can tell? Here, only recapitulating, think then how I must be affected at the time. I was forced to leave off and sing a song to myself. I aimed at a lively air, but I croaked rather than sung, and fell into the old dismal thirtieth of January strain. I hemmed up for a sprightlier note, but it would not do, and at last I ended like a malefactor in the dead psalm melody. 
high ho i gape like an unfledged kite in its nest wanting to swallow a chicken bobbed at its mouth by its marauding dam what a devil ails me i can neither think nor write lie down pen for a moment End of letter 21。Letter 22 of Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 22. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. There is certainly a good deal in the observation that it costs a man ten times more pains to be wicked than it would cost him to be good. What a confounded number of contrivances have I had recourse to in order to carry my point with this charming creature. And yet, after all, how have I puzzled myself by it? and yet am near tumbling into the pit which it was the end of all my plots to shun what a happy man had i been with such an excellence could i have brought my mind to marry when i first prevailed upon her to quit her father's house but then as i have often reflected how had i known that a but blossoming beauty who could carry on a private correspondence and run such risks with a notorious wild fellow was not prompted by inclination which one day might give such a free liver as myself as much pain to reflect upon as at the time it gave me pleasure thou rememberest the host's tale in ariosto and thy experience as well as mine can furnish out twenty fionettas in proof of the imbecility of the sex. But to proceed with my narrative. The dear creature resumed the topic her heart was so firmly fixed upon, and insisted upon quitting the odious house, and that in very high terms. I urged her to meet me the next day at the altar, in either of the two churches mentioned in the license and I besought her, whatever was her resolution, to let me debate this matter calmly with her. If, she said, I would have her give what I desired the least moment's consideration, I must not hinder her from being her own mistress. To what purpose did I ask her consent, if she had not a power over either her own person or actions? will you give me your honour madam if i consent to your quitting a house so disagreeable to you my honour sir said the dear creature alas and turned weeping from me with inimitable grace as if she had said alas you have robbed me of my honour i hope then that her angry passions were subsiding, but I was mistaken, for urging her warmly for the day, and that for the sake of our mutual honour, and the honour of both our families, in this high-flown and high-souled strain she answered me. And canst thou, Lovelace, be so mean 
as to wish to make a wife of the creature thou hast insulted, dishonoured, and abused, as thou hast me? Was it necessary to humble me down to the low level of thy baseness, before I could be a wife meet for thee? Thou hadst a father who was a man of honour, a mother who deserved a better son. Thou hast an uncle who was no dishonour to the peerage of a kingdom, whose peers are more respectable than the nobility of any other country. Thou hast other relations also, who may be thy boast, although thou canst not be theirs. And canst thou not imagine that thou hearest them calling upon thee, the dead from their monuments, the living from their laudable pride, not to dishonour thy ancient and splendid house, by entering into wedlock with a creature whom thou hast levelled with the dirt of the street, and classed with the vilest of her sex. I extolled her greatness of soul and her virtue. I execrated myself for my guilt, and told her how grateful to the manes of my ancestors, as well as to the wishes of the living, the honour I supplicated for would be. But still she insisted upon being a free agent, of seeing herself in other lodgings, before she would give what I urged the least consideration. Nor would she promise me favour even then, or to permit my visits. How then, as I asked her, could I comply, without resolving to lose her for ever? She put her hand to her forehead often as she talked, and at last, pleading disorder in her head, retired. Neither of us satisfied with the other, but she ten times more dissatisfied with me than I with her. Dorcas seems to be coming into favour with her. What now, what now? Monday night. How determined is this lady? Again had she liked to have escaped us. What a fixed resentment. She only, I find, assumed a little calm in order to quiet suspicion. She was got down, and actually had unbolted the street door, before I could get to her, alarmed as I was, by Mrs. Sinclair's cookmaid, who was the only one that saw her fly through the passage, yet lightning was not quicker than I. Again I brought her back to the dining-room, with infinite reluctance on her part, and before her face, ordered a servant to be placed constantly at the bottom of the stairs for the future. She seemed even choked with grief and disappointment. Dorcas was exceedingly assiduous about her, and confidently gave it as her own opinion that her dear lady should be permitted to go to another lodging, since this was so disagreeable to her, were she to be killed for saying so, she would say it. And was good, Dorcas, for this afterwards. But for some time the dear creature was all passion and violence. I see, I see, said she, when I had brought her up, what I am to expect from your new professions, O vilest of men. Have I offered to you, my beloved creature, anything that can justify this impatience, after a more hopeful calm? She wrung her hands, she disordered her headdress, she tore her ruffles, she was in a perfect frenzy. I dreaded her returning malady, but in treaty rather exasperating, I affected an angry air. I bid her expect the worst she had to fear, and was menacing on, in hopes to intimidate her, when dropping to my feet. "'Twill be a mercy,' said she, "'the highest act of mercy you can do to kill me outright upon this spot, this happy spot, as I will in my last moments call it. Then, bearing with a still more frantic violence part of her enchanting neck, Here, here, said the soul harrowing beauty, let thy pointed mercy enter, and I will thank thee, and forgive thee for all the dreadful past. With my latest gasp will I forgive and thank thee. Or help me to the means and I will myself put out of the way so miserable a wretch, and bless thee for those means. 
Why all this extravagant passion? Why all these exclamations? Have I offered any new injury to you, my dearest life? What a frenzy is this? Am I not ready to make you all the reparation that I can make you? Had I not reason to hope? No, 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 as before, shaking her head with wild impatience, as resolved not to attend to what I said. My resolutions are so honourable, if you will permit them to take effect, that I need not be solicitous where you go. If you will but permit my visits, and receive my vows, and God is my witness, that I bring you not back from the door with any beauty or dishonour, but the contrary, and this moment I will send for a minister to put an end to all your doubts and fears. Say this, and say a thousand times more, and bind every word with a solemn appeal to that God whom thou art accustomed to invoke to the truth of the vilest falsehoods, and all will still be short of what thou hast vowed and promised to me, and were not my heart to abhor thee, and to rise against thee for thy perjuries as it does, I would not, I tell thee once more, I would not bind my soul in covenant with such a man for a thousand worlds. Compose yourself, however, madam, for your own sake, compose yourself. Permit me to raise you up, abhorred as I am of your soul. Nay, if I must not touch you, for she wildly slapped my hands, but with such a sweet, passionate air, her bosom heaving and throbbing as she looked up to me, that although I was most sincerely enraged, I could with transport have pressed her to mine. If I must not touch you, I will not, but depend upon it. And I assumed the sternest air I could assume, to try what it would do. Depend upon it, madam, that this is not the way to avoid the evils you dread. Let me do what I will. I cannot be used worse. Dorcas, begone! She arose, Dorcas being about to withdraw, and wildly caught hold of her arm. O oh, Dorcas, if thou art of mine own sex, leave me not, I charge thee. Then, quitting Dorcas, down she threw herself upon her knees in the furthermost corner of the room, clasping a chair with her face laid upon the bottom of it. Oh, where can I be safe? Where, where can I be safe from this man of violence? This gave Dorcas an opportunity to confirm herself in her lady's confidence. The wench threw herself at my feet, while I seemed in violent wrath, and embracing my knees, Kill me, sir! Kill me, sir, if you please. I must throw myself in your way to save my lady. I beg your pardon, sir, but you must be set on. God forgive the mischief makers, but your own heart, if left to itself, would not permit these things. Spare, however, sir, spare my lady, I beseech you. Bustling on her knees about me, as if I were intending to approach her lady, had I not been restrained by her this humoured by me begone devil officious devil begone startled the dear creature who snatching up hastily her head from the chair and as hastily popping it down again in terror hit her nose i suppose against the edge of the chair and it gushed out with blood running in a stream down her bosom she herself was too much frighted to heed it Never was mortal man in such terror and agitation as I, for I instantly concluded that she had stabbed herself with some concealed instrument. I ran to her in a wild agony, for Dorcas was frighted out of all her mock interposition. What have you done? Oh, what have you done? Look up to me, my dearest life, sweet injured innocence, look up to me, what have you done? Long will I not survive you? 
and I was upon the point of drawing my sword to dispatch myself, when I discovered what an unmanly blockhead does this charming creature make me at her pleasure, that all I apprehended was but a bloody nose, which, as far as I know, if it could not be stopped in a quarter of an hour, may have saved her head and her intellect. But I see by this scene that the sweet creature is but a pretty coward at bottom, and that I can terrify her out of her virulence against me whenever I put on sternness and anger. But then as a qualifier to the advantage this gives me over her, I find myself to be a coward too, which I had not before suspected, since I was capable of being so easily terrified by the apprehensions of her offering violence to herself. End of letter 22 Letter 23 of Clarissa Harlowe, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 23. Letter 23. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire. But with all this dear creature's resentment against me, I cannot for my heart think but she will get all over, and consent to enter the pale with me. Were she even to die to-morrow, and to know she should, would not a woman of her sense, of her punctilio, and in her situation, and of so proud a family, rather die married than otherwise? No doubt but she would although she were to hate the man ever so heartily. If so, there is now but one man in the world whom she can have, and that is me. Now I talk. Familiar writing is but talking, Jack. Thus glibly of entering the pale, thou wilt be ready to question me, I know, as to my intentions on this head. As much of my heart as I know of it myself will I tell thee. When I am from her, I cannot still help hesitating about marriage, and I even frequently resolve against it, and determine to press my favourite scheme for cohabitation. But when I am with her, I am ready to say, to swear, and to do whatever I think will be the most acceptable to her, and were a parson at hand, I should plunge at once, no doubt of it, into the state. I have frequently thought, in common cases, that it is happy for many giddy fellows, there are giddy fellows as well as giddy girls, Jack, and perhaps those are as often drawn in as these. That ceremony and parade are necessary to the irrevocable solemnity, and that there is generally time for a man to recollect himself in the space between the heated overnight and the cooler next morning, or I know not who could escape the sweet gypsies, whose fascinating powers are so much aided by our own raised imaginations. A wife at any time, I used to say. I had ever confidence and vanity enough to think that no woman breathing could deny her hand when I held out mine. I am confoundedly mortified to find that this lady is able to hold me at bay and to refuse all my honest vows. What force? Allow me a serious reflection, Jack. It will be put down. What force? have evil habits upon the human mind. When we enter upon a devious course, we think we shall have it in our power when we will return to the right path. But it is not so, I plainly see. For who can acknowledge with more justice this dear creature's merits and his own errors than I? Whose regret at times can be deeper than mine for the injuries I have done her? Whose resolutions to repair those injuries stronger Yet how transitory is my penitence! How am I hurried away? Canst thou tell by what? O oh, devil of youth and devil of intrigue, how do you mislead me? 
how often do we end in occasions for the deepest remorse what we begin in wantonness at the present writing however the turn of the scale is in behalf of matrimony for i despair of carrying with her my favourite point the lady tells dorcas that her heart is broken and that she shall live but a little while i think nothing of that if we marry in the first place she knows not what a mind unapprehensive will do for her in a state to which all the sex look forwards with high satisfaction how often had the whole of the sacred conclave been thus deceived in their choice of a pope not considering that the new dignity is of itself sufficient to give new life a few months heart's ease will give my charmer a quite different notion of things and i dare say as i have heretofore said once married and i am married for life see letter nine of this volume i will allow that her pride in one sense has suffered abasement but her triumph is the greater in every other and while i can think that all her trials are but additions to her honour and that i have laid the foundations of her glory in my own shame can i be called cruel if i am not affected with her grief as some men would be and for what should her heart be broken her will is unviolated at present however her will is unviolated the destroying of good habits and the introducing of bad to the corrupting of the whole heart is the violation that her will is not to be corrupted that her mind is not to be debased she has hitherto unquestionably proved and if she give cause for farther trials and hold fast her integrity what ideas will she have to dwell upon that will be able to corrupt her morals what vestigia what remembrances but such as will inspire abhorrence of the attempter what nonsense then to suppose that such a mere notional violation as she has suffered should be able to cut asunder the strings of life her religion married or not married will set her above making such a trifling accident such an involuntary suffering fatal to her such considerations as these they are that support me against all apprehensions of bugbear consequences and i would have them have weight with thee who are such a doughty advocate for her and yet i allow thee this that she really makes too much of it takes it too much to heart to be sure she ought to have forgot it by this time except the charming charming consequence happen that still i am in hopes will happen were i to proceed no farther and if she apprehended this herself then has the dear over nice soul some reason for taking it so much to heart and yet would not i think refuse to legitimate oh jack had i an imperial diadem i swear to thee that i would give it up even to my enemy to have one charming boy by this lady and should she escape me and no such effect follow my revenge on her family and in such a case on herself would be incomplete and i should reproach myself as long as i lived were i to be sure that this foundation is laid and why may i not hope it is i should not doubt to have her still should she withstand her day of grace on my own conditions nor should i if it were so question that revived affection in her which a woman seldom fails to have for the father of her first child whether born in wedlock or out of it and prithee jack see in this my ardent hope a distinction in my favour from other rakes who almost to a man follow their inclinations without troubling themselves about consequences in imitation as one would think of the strutting villain of a bird which from feathered lady to feathered lady pursues his imperial pleasures leaving it to his sleek paramours to hatch the genial product in holes and corners of their own finding out end of letter twenty three Letter twenty four of Clarissa Harlow, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 by Samuel Richardson. Letter 24. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Tuesday morn, June 20. Well, Jack, now are we upon another footing together. This dear creature will not let me be good. She is now authorising all my plots by her own example. Thou must be partial in the highest degree, if now thou blamest me for resuming my former schemes, since in that case I shall but follow her cue. No forced construction of her actions do I make on this occasion, in order to justify a bad cause, or a worse intention. A slight pretence indeed served the wolf, when he had a mind to quarrel with the lamb. But this is not now my case. For here wouldst thou have thought it, taking advantage of Dorcas's compassionate temper, and of some warm expressions which the tender-hearted wench let fall against the cruelty of men, and wishing to have it in her power to serve her, has she given her the following note, signed by her maiden name, for she has thought fit, in positive and plain words, to own to the pitying Dorcas that she is not married. Monday, June 19th when then underwritten to hereby promise that on my coming into possession of my own estate i will provide for dorcas martindale in a gentlewoman like manner in my own house or if i do not soon obtain that possession or should first die i do hereby bind myself my executors and administrators to pay to her or her order during the term of her natural life the sum of five pounds on each of the four usual quarterly days in the year on condition that she faithfully assists me in my escape from an illegal confinement under which i now labour the first quarterly payment to commence and be payable at the end of three months immediately following the day of my deliverance and i do also promise to give her as a testimony of my honour in the rest a diamond ring which i have showed her witness my hand this nineteenth day of june in the year above written clarissa harlowe now jack what terms wouldst thou have me to keep with such a sweet corruptress seest thou not how she hates me seest thou not that she is resolved never to forgive me seest thou not however that she must disgrace herself in the eye of the world if she actually should escape that she must be subjected to infinite distress and hazard for whom has she to receive and protect her yet to determine to risk all these evils, and furthermore to stoop to artifice to be guilty of the reigning vice of the times of bribery and corruption. Oh, Jack, Jack, say not right, not another word in her favour. Thou hast blamed me for bringing her to this house, but had I carried her to any other in England, where there would have been one servant or inmate capable either of compassion or corruption, what must have been the consequence but seest thou not however that in this flimsy contrivance the dear implacable like a drowning man catches at a straw to save herself a straw shall she find to be the refuge she has resorted to end of letter twenty four Letter twenty five of Clarissa Harlow, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume six by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty five. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Tuesday morn, ten o'clock. Very ill, exceedingly ill, as Dorcas tells me, in order to avoid seeing me, and yet the dear soul may be so in her mind. But is not that equivocation, 
some one passion predominating in every human breast breaks through principle and controls us all mine is love and revenge taking turns hers is hatred but this is my consolation that hatred appeased is love begun or love renewed i may rather say if love ever had footing here but reflectioning apart thou seest jack that her plot is beginning to work to-morrow is to break out i have been abroad to set on foot a plot of circumvention all fair now belford i insisted upon visiting my indisposed fair one dorcas made officious excuses for her i cursed the wench in her hearing for her impertinence and stamped and made a clutter which was improved into an apprehension to the lady that i would have flung her faithful confidant from the top of the stairs to the bottom he is a violent wretch but dorcas dear dorcas now it is thou shalt have a friend in me to the last day of my life and what now jack dost think the name of her good angel is why dorcas martindale christian and super no more wicks as in the promissory note in my former and the dear creature has bound her to her by the most solemn obligations besides the tie of interest whither madam do you design to go when you get out of this house i will throw myself into the first open house i can find and beg protection till i can get a coach or a lodging in some honest family what will you do for clothes madam i doubt you'll be able to take any away with you but what you'll have on oh no matter for clothes if i can but get out of this house what will you do for money madam i have heard his honour express his concern that he could not prevail upon you to be obliged to him though he apprehended that you must be short of money oh i have rings and other valuables indeed i have but four guineas and two of them i found lately wrapped up in a bit of lace designed for a charitable use but now alas charity begins at home but i have one dear friend left if she be living as i hope in god she is to whom i can be obliged if i want o oh, dorcas i must ere now have heard from her if i had had fair play well madam yours is a hard lot i pity you at my heart thank you dorcas i am unhappy that i did not think before that i might have confided in thy pity and in thy sex i pitied you madam often and often but you were always as i thought diffident of me and then i doubted not but you were married and i thought his honour was unkindly used by you so that i thought it my duty to wish well to his honour rather than to what i thought to be your humours madam would to heaven that i had known before that you were not married such a lady such a fortune to be so sadly betrayed ah dorcas i was basely drawn in my youth my ignorance of the world and i have some things to reproach myself with when i look back lord madam what deceitful creatures are these men neither oaths nor vows i am sure i am sure and then with her apron she gave her eyes half a dozen hearty rubs i may curse the time that i came into this house here was accounting for her bold eyes and was it not better for dorcas to give up a house which her lady could not think worse of than she did in order to gain the reputation of sincerity than by offering to vindicate it to make her preferred services suspected poor dorcas bless me how little do we who have lived all our time in the country know of this wicked town had i been able to write cried the veteran wench i should certainly have given some other near relations i have in wales a little inkling of matters and they would have saved me from 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 her sobs were enough the apprehensions of women on such subjects are ever aforehand with speech and then sobbing on she lifted her apron to her face again she showed me how poor dorcas again wiping her own charming eyes all love all compassion is this dear creature to every one in affliction but me 
and would not an aunt protect her kinswoman abominable wretch i can't i can't i can't say my aunt was privy to it she gave me good advice she knew not for a great while that i was that i was that i was <coughs> no more no more good dorcas what a world do we live in what a house am i in but come don't weep though she herself could not forbear my being betrayed into it though to my own ruin may be a happy event for thee and if i live it shall i thank you my good lady blubbering i am sorry very sorry you have had so hard a lot but it may be the saving of my soul if i can get to your ladyship's house had i but known that your ladyship was not married i would have ate my own flesh before 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 dorcas sobbed and wept the lady sighed and wept also but now jack for a serious reflection upon the premises how will the good folks account for it that satan has such faithful instruments and that the bond of wickedness is a stronger bond than the ties of virtue as if it were the nature of the human mind to be villainous for here had dorcas been good and been tempted as she was tempted to anything evil i make no doubt but she would have yielded to the temptation and cannot our fraternity in an hundred instances give proof of the like predominance of vice over virtue and that we have risked more to serve and promote the interests of the former than ever a good man did to serve a good man or a good cause for have we not been prodigal of life and fortune have we not defied the civil magistrate upon occasion and have we not attempted rescues and dared all things only to extricate a pounded profligate whence jack can this be oh i have it i believe the vicious are as bad as they can be and do the devil's work without looking after while he is continually spreading snares for the others and like a skilful angler suiting his baits to the fish he angles for nor let even honest people so called blame poor dorcas for her fidelity in a bad cause for does not the general who implicitly serves an ambitious prince in his unjust designs upon his neighbours or upon his own oppressed subjects and even the lawyer who for the sake of a paltry fee undertakes to whiten a black cause and to defend it against one he knows to be good do the very same thing as dorcas and are they not both every whit as culpable yet the one shall be dubbed a hero the other called an admirable fellow and be contended for by every client and his double-tongued abilities shall carry him through all the high preferments of the law with a reputation and applause well but what shall be done since the lady is so much determined on removing is there no way to oblige her and yet to make the very act subservient to my other views i fancy such a way may be found out i will study for it suppose i suffer her to make an escape her heart is in it if she effect it the triumph she will have over me upon it will be a counterbalance for all she has suffered i will oblige her if i can end of letter twenty five Letter twenty six of Clarissa Harlow, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, volume six by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty six. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Tired with a succession of fatiguing days and sleepless nights, and with contemplating the precarious situation I stand in with my beloved, I fell into a profound reverie, which brought on sleep, and that produced a dream, a fortunate dream, which, 
as I imagine, will afford my working mind the means to effect the obliging double purpose my heart is now once more set upon. What, as I have often contemplated, is the enjoyment of the finest woman in the world, to the contrivance, the bustle, the surprises, and at last the happy conclusion of a well-laid plot. The charming roundabouts to come to the nearest way home, the doubts, the apprehensions, the heart-achings, the meditated triumphs, these are the joys that make the blessing dear. For all the rest, what is it? What but to find an angel in imagination dwindled down to a woman in fact? But to my dream. Methought it was about nine on Wednesday morning that a chariot with a dowager's arms upon the doors and in it a grave matronly lady not unlike mother h in the face but in her heart oh how unlike stopped at a grocer's shop about ten doors on the other side of the way in order to buy some groceries and methought dorcas having been out to see if the coast were clear for her lady's flight and if a coach were to be got near the place espied the chariot with the dowager's arms and this matronly lady and what methought did dorcas that subtle traitress do but whip up to the old matronly lady and lifting up her voice say good my lady permit me one word with your ladyship what thou hast to say to me say on quoth the old lady the grocer retiring and standing aloof to give Dorcas leave to speak, who, methought, in words like these, accosted the lady. You seem, madam, to be a very good lady, and here in this neighbourhood, at a house of no high repute, is an innocent lady of rank and fortune, beautiful as a May morning, and youthful as a rosebud, and full as sweet and lovely, who has been tricked thither by a wicked gentleman practised in the ways of the town and this very night will be ruined if she get not out of his hands now o oh lady if you will extend your compassionate goodness to this fair young lady in whom the moment you behold her you will see cause to believe all i say and let her but have a place in your chariot and remain in your protection for one day only till she can send a man and horse to her rich and powerful friends you may save from ruin a lady who has no equal for virtue as well as beauty methought the old lady moved with dorcas's story answered and said hasten o damsel who in a happy moment art come to put it in my power to serve the innocent and virtuous, which it has always been my delight to do. Hasten to this young lady, and bid her hie hither to me with all speed, and tell her that my chariot shall be her asylum, and if I find all that thou sayest true, my house shall be her sanctuary, and I will protect her from all her oppressors. Hereupon, methought, this traitress Dorcas hied back to the lady, and made report of what she had done, and, methought, the lady highly approved of Dorcas's proceeding, and blessed her for her good thought. And I lifted up mine eyes, and, behold, the lady issued out of the house, and, without looking back, ran to the chariot with the dowager's coat upon it, and was received by the matronly lady with open arms, and welcome, 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 fair young lady, who so well answer the description of the faithful damsel, and I will carry you instantly to my house, where you shall meet with all the good usage your heart can wish for, 
till you can apprise your rich and powerful friends of your past dangers and present escape. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, worthy, thrice worthy lady, who affords so kindly your protection to a most unhappy young creature who has been basely seduced and betrayed and brought to the very brink of destruction. Methought then the matronly lady, who had by the time the young lady came to her, bought and paid for the goods she wanted, ordered her coachman to drive home with all speed, who stopped not till he had arrived in a certain street not far from Lincoln's Inn Fields, where the matronly lady lived in a sumptuous dwelling, replete with damsels, who wrought curiously in muslins, cambrics, and fine linen, and in every good work that industrious damsels love to be employed about, except the loom and the spinning-wheel, and methought all the way the young lady and the old lady rode, and after they came in till dinner was ready, the young lady filled up the time with the dismal account of her wrongs and her sufferings, the like of which was never heard by mortal ear, and this in so moving a manner that the good old lady did nothing but weep and sigh and sob, and inveigh against the arts of wicked men, and against that abominable squire Lovelace, who was a plotting villain, methought she said, and, more than that, an unchained Beelzebub. Methought I was in a dreadful agony, when I found the lady had escaped, and in my wrath had liked to have slain Dorcas, and our mother, and every one I met. But by some quick transition, and strange metamorphosis, which dreams do not usually account for, methought all of a sudden, this matronly lady turned into the famous Mother H. herself, and being an old acquaintance of Mother Sinclair, was prevailed upon to assist in my plot upon the young lady. Then, methought, followed a strange scene, for Mother H., longing to hear more of the young lady's story, and night being come, besought her to accept of a place in her own bed, in order to have all the talk to themselves. For, methought, two young nieces of hers had broken in upon them in the middle of the dismal tale. Accordingly, going early to bed, and the sad story being resumed, with as great earnestness on one side as attention on the other, before the young lady had gone far in it, Mother H. methought was taken with a fit of the colic, and her tortures increasing, was obliged to rise to get a cordial she used to find specific in this disorder, to which she was unhappily subject. Having thus risen, and stepped to her closet, methought she let fall the wax taper in her return, and then, O oh, metamorphosis still stranger than the former, what unaccountable things are dreams! Coming to bed again in the dark, the young lady, to her infinite astonishment, grief, and surprise, found Mother H. turned into a young person of the other sex, and although loveless was the abhorred of her soul, yet fearing it was some other person, it was matter of consolation to her, when she found it was no other than himself, and that she had been still the bedfellow of but one and the same ma'am. A strange, promiscuous huddle of adventures followed, scenes perpetually shifting. Now nothing heard from the lady but sighs, groans, exclamations, faintings, dyings, from the gentleman, but vows, promises, protestations, disclaimers of purposes pursued, and all the gentle and ungentle pressures of the lover's warfare. Then, as quick as thought, for dreams thou knowest confine not themselves 
to the rules of the drama, ensued recoveries, lyings in, christenings, the smiling boy, amply, even in her own opinion, rewarding the suffering mother. Then the grandfather's estate yielded up, possession taken of it, living very happily upon it, her beloved Norton, her companion, Miss Howe, her visitor, and admirable, thrice admirable, unable to compare notes with her, a charming girl, by the same father, to her friend's charming boy, who, as they grow up, in order to consolidate their mamma's friendships, for neither have dreams regard to consanguinity, intermarry, change names by act of parliament, to enjoy my estate, and I know not what of the like incongruous stuff. I awoke, as thou mayest believe, in great disorder, and rejoiced to find my charmer in the next room, and Dorcas honest. Now thou wilt say, this was a very odd dream, and yet, for I am a strange dreamer, it is not altogether improbable that something like it may happen, as the pretty simpleton has the weakness to confide in Dorcas, whom till now she disliked. But I forgot to tell thee one part of my dream, and that was, that the next morning, the lady gave way to such transports of grief and resentment that she was with difficulty diverted from making an attempt upon her own life, but, however, at last was prevailed upon to resolve to live and make the best of the matter, a letter methought from Captain Tomlinson helping to pacify her, written to apprise me that her uncle Harlow would certainly be at Kentish Town on Wednesday night, June twenty-eighth, the following day, the twenty-ninth, being his birthday, and be doubly desirous on that account, that our nuptials should be then privately solemnized in his presence. But is Thursday, the twenty-ninth, her uncle's anniversary? Methinks thou askest. It is, or else the day of celebration should have been earlier still. Three weeks ago I heard her say it was, and I have down the birthday of every one in the family, and the wedding day of her father and mother. The minutest circumstances are often of great service in matters of the least importance. And what sayest thou now to my dream? Who says that, sleeping and waking, I have not fine helps from somebody, some spirit rather, as thou'lt be apt to say? But no wonder that a Beelzebub has his devilkins to attend his call. I can have no manner of doubt of succeeding in Mother H.'s part of the scheme, for will the lady, who resolves to throw herself into the first house she can enter, or to bespeak the protection of the first person she meets, and who thinks there can be no danger out of this house, equal to what she apprehends from me in it, scruple to accept of the chariot of a dowager accidentally offered, and the lady's protection engaged by her faithful Dorcas, so highly bribed to promote her escape, and then Mrs. H. has the air and appearance of a venerable matron, and is not such a forbidding devil as Mrs. Sinclair. The pretty simpleton knows nothing in the world, nor that people who have money never want assistance in their view, be they what they will. How else could the princes of the earth be so implicitly served as they are, change their hands ever so often, and be their purposes ever so wicked? If I can but get her to go on with me till Wednesday next week, we shall be settled together pretty quietly by that time. And indeed, if she has any gratitude, and has in her the least of her sex's foibles, she must think I deserve her favour by the pain she has cost me, for dearly do they all love that men should take 
pains about them and for them and here for the present i will lay down my pen and congratulate myself upon my happy invention since her obstinacy puts me once more upon exercising it but with this resolution i think that if the present contrivance fail me i will exert all the faculties of my mind all my talents to procure for myself a regal right to her favour and that in defiance of all my antipathies to the married state and of the suggestions of the great devil out of the house and of his secret agents in it since if now she is not to be prevailed upon or drawn in it will be in vain to attempt her further End of letter twenty six. Letter twenty seven of Clarissa Harlow, volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 27. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Tuesday night, June 20. No admittance yet to my charmer. She is very ill, in a violent fever, Dorcas thinks, yet will have no advice. Dorcas tells her how much I am concerned at it. But again let me ask, does this lady do right to make herself ill when she is not ill? For my own part, libertine as people think me, when I had occasion to be sick, I took a dose of ipecacuana, that I might not be guilty of a falsehood. And most heartily sick was I, as she who then pitied me full well knew but here to pretend to be very ill only to get an opportunity to run away in order to avoid forgiving a man who has offended her how unchristian if good folks allow themselves in these breaches of a known duty and in these presumptuous contrivances to deceive who belford shall blame us i have a strange notion that the matronly lady will be certainly at the grocer's shop at the hour of nine to-morrow morning for dorcas heard me tell mrs sinclair that i should go out at eight precisely and then she is to try for a coach and if the dowager's chariot should happen to be there how lucky will it be for my charmer how strangely will my dream be made out i have just received a letter from captain tomlinson is it not wonderful for that was part of my dream i shall always have a prodigious regard to dreams henceforward i know not but i may write a book upon that subject for my own experience will furnish out a great part of it glanville of witches baxter's history of spirits and apparitions and the royal pedant's demonology will be nothing at all to Lovelace's reveries. The letter is just what I dreamed it to be. I am only concerned that Uncle John's anniversary did not happen three or four days sooner, for should any new misfortune befall my charmer, she may not be able to support her spirit so long as till Thursday in the next week. Yet it will give me the more time for new expedients should my present contrivance fail, which I cannot, however, suppose. This letter I sealed and broke open. It was brought, thou mayst suppose, by a particular messenger, the seal such a one as the writer need be ashamed of. I took care to inquire after the captain's health in my beloved's hearing, and it is now ready to be produced as a pacifier, 
according as she shall take on or resent, if the two metamorphoses happen pursuant to my wonderful dream, as, having great faith in dreams, I dare say they will. I think it will not be amiss in changing my clothes to have this letter of the worthy captain lie in my beloved's way. End of letter 27letter twenty eight of clarissa harlow volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org clarissa harlow volume six by samuel richardson Letter twenty-eight. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire, Wednesday noon, June twenty-one. What shall I say now? I, who but a few hours ago had such faith in dreams, and had proposed out of hand to begin my treatise of dreams sleeping and dreams waking, and was pleasing myself with the dialogues between the old matronal lady and the young lady, and with the metamorphoses absolutely assured that everything would happen as my dream choked it out, shall never more depend upon those flying follies, those illusions of a fancy depraved and run mad. Thus confoundedly have matters happened. I went out at eight o'clock in high good humour with myself, in order to give the sought-for opportunity to the plotting mistress and corrupted maid only ordering Will to keep a good look-out for fear his lady should mistrust my plot, or mistake a hackney-coach for the dowager lady's chariot. But first I sent to know how she did, and, receiving for answer very ill, had a very bad night, which latter was but too probable, since this I know, that people who have plots in their heads as seldom have as deserve good ones. I desired a physician might be called in, but was refused. I took a walk in St. James's Park, congratulating myself all the way on my rare inventions. Then, impatient, I took coach, with one of the windows quite up, the other almost up, playing at Bo Peep in every chariot I saw pass in my way to Lincoln's Inn Fields, and when arrived there, I sent the coachman to desire any one of Mother H.'s family to come to me to the coach-side, not doubting but I should have intelligence of my fair fugitive there, it being then half an hour after ten. A servant came, who gave me to understand that the matronly lady was just returned by herself in the chariot. Frighted out of my wits, I alighted, and heard from the mother's own mouth that Dorcas had engaged her to protect the lady, but came to tell her afterwards that she had changed her mind, and would not quit the house. Quite astonished, not knowing what might have happened, I ordered the coachman to lash away to our mother's. Arriving here in an instant, the first word I asked was, if the lady was safe. Mr. Lovelace here gives a very circumstantial relation of all that passed between the lady and Dorcas, but as he could only guess at her motives for refusing to go off when Dorcas told her that she had engaged for her the protection of the dowager lady, it is thought proper to omit this relation, and to supply it 
by some memoranda of the ladies, but it is first necessary to account for the occasion on which those memoranda were made. The reader may remember that in the letter written to Miss Howe on her escape to Hampstead, see volume 5, letter 21, she promises to give her the particulars of her flight at leisure. She had indeed thoughts of continuing her account of everything that had passed between her and Mr. Lovelace since her last narrative letter. But the uncertainty she was in from that time, with the execrable treatment she met with on her being deluded back again, followed by a week's delirium, had hitherto hindered her from prosecuting her intention. But, nevertheless, having it still in her view to perform her promise as soon as she had opportunity, she made minutes of everything as it passed, in order to help her memory, which, as she observes in one place, she could less trust to since her late disorders than before. In these minutes, or book of memoranda, she observes that, having apprehensions that Dorcas might be a traitress, she would have got away while she was gone out to see for a coach, and actually slid downstairs with that intent, but that, seeing Mrs. Sinclair in the entry, whom Dorcas had planted there while she went out, she speeded up again, unseen. So then went up to the dining-room, and saw the letter of Captain Tomlinson, on which she observes, in her memorandum-book, as follows. How am I puzzled now? He might leave this letter on purpose, none of the other papers left with it being of any consequence. What is the alternative? To stay and be the wife of the vilest of men. How my heart resists that! To attempt to get off, and fail, ruin inevitable. Dorcas may betray me. I doubt she is still his implement. At his going out he whispered her, as I saw unobserved, in a very familiar manner too. Never fear, sir, with a curtsy in her agreeing to connive at my escape, she provided not for her own safety if I got away, yet had reason in that case to expect his vengeance, and wants not forethought. To have taken her with me was to be in the power of her intelligence, if a faithless creature. Let me, however, though I part not with my caution, keep my charity, can there be any woman so vile to a woman? Oh, yes, Mrs. Sinclair, her aunt. The Lord deliver me, but, alas, I have put myself out of the course of his protection by the natural means, and am already ruined, a father's curse likewise against me, having made vain all my friends' cautions and solicitudes. I must not hope for miracles in my favour. If I do escape, what may become of me, a poor, helpless, deserted creature, helpless from sex, from circumstances, exposed to every danger, Lord, protect me. His vile man not gone with him, lurking hereabouts, no doubt, to watch my steps. I will not go away by the chariot, however. That the chariot should come so opportunely, so like his many opportunities, the Dorcas should have the sudden thought, should have the courage with the thought, to address a lady in behalf of an absolute stranger to that lady, that the lady should so readily consent, yet the transaction between them to take up so much time, their distance in degree considered, for arduous as the case was, and precious as the time, Dorcas was gone above half an hour. Yet the chariot was said to be ready at a grocer's not many doors off. Indeed, some elderly ladies are talkative, and there are, no doubt, some good people in the world. But that it should chance to be a widow lady, 
who could do what she pleased, that Dorcas should know her to be so by the lozenge. Persons in her station are not usually so knowing, I believe, in heraldry. Yet some may, for servants are fond of deriving collateral honours and distinctions, as I may call them, from the quality or people of rank whom they serve, but this sly servant not gone with him, then this letter of Tomlinson, although I am resolved never to have this wretch, yet may I not throw myself into my uncle's protection at Kentish Town or Highgate, if I cannot escape before, and so get clear of him, may not the evil I know be less than what I may fall into, if I can avoid farther villainy, farther villainy he has not yet threatened, freely and justly as I have treated him, I will not go, I think, at least, unless I can send this fellow away. She tried to do this, but was prevented by the fellow's pretending to put his ankle out by a slip downstairs. A trick, says his contriving master, in his omitted relation, I had taught him on a like occasion at Amiens. The fellow a villain, the wench I doubt a vile wench. At last, concerned for her own safety, plays off and on about a coach. All my hopes of getting off at present over, unhappy creature, to what farther evils art thou reserved? Oh, how my heart rises at the necessity I must still be under to see and converse with so very vile a man. End of letter 28 Letter 29 of Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 29. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Wednesday afternoon. Disappointed in her meditated escape, obliged against her will to meet me in the dining-room, and perhaps apprehensive of being upbraided for her art in feigning herself ill, I expected that the dear perverse would begin with me with spirit and indignation. But I was in hopes, from the gentleness of her natural disposition, from the consideration which I expected from her on her situation, from the contents of the letter of Captain Tomlinson, which Dorcas told me she had seen, and from the time she had had to cool and reflect, since she last admitted me to her presence, that she would not have carried it so strongly through as she did. As I entered the dining-room, I congratulated her and myself upon her sudden recovery, and would have taken her hand with an air of respectful tenderness, but she was resolved to begin where she left off. She turned from me, drawing in her hand with a repulsing and indignant aspect. I meet you once more, said she, because I cannot help it. What have you to say to me? Why am I to be thus detained against my will? With the utmost solemnity of speech and behaviour, I urged the ceremony. I saw I had nothing else for it. I had a letter in my pocket, I said, feeling for it, 
although I had not taken it from the table where I left it in the same room, the contents of which, if attended to, would make us both happy. I had been loath to show it to her before, because I hoped to prevail upon her to be mine sooner than the day mentioned in it. I felt for it in all my pockets, watching her eye meantime, which I saw glance towards the table where it lay. I was uneasy that I could not find it, at last directed again by her sly eye, I spied it on the table at the farther end of the room. With joy I fetched it. Be pleased to read that letter, madam, with an air of satisfied assurance. She took it and cast her eye over it in such a careless way as made it evident that she had read it before, and then unthankfully tossed it into the window-seat before her. I urged her to bless me to-morrow, or Friday morning, at least that she would not render vain her uncle's journey and kind endeavours to bring about a reconciliation among us all. "'Among us all,' repeated she, with an air equally disdainful and incredulous. O oh, loveless, thou art surely nearly allied to the grand deceiver, in thy endeavour to suit temptations to inclinations. But what honour, what faith, what veracity, were it possible that I could enter into parley with thee on this subject, which it is not, may I expect from such a man as thou hast shown thyself to be. I was touched to the quick. A lady of your perfect character, madam, who has feigned herself sick, on purpose to avoid seeing the man who adored her, should not. I know what thou wouldst say, interrupted she. Twenty and twenty low things that my soul would have been above being guilty of, and which I have despised myself for, have I been brought into by the infection of thy company, and by the necessity thou hadst laid me under of appearing mean. But I thank God destitute as I am, that I am not, however, sunk so low as to wish to be thine. I, madam, as the injurer, ought to have patience. It is for the injured to reproach. But your uncle is not in a plot against you, it is to be hoped. There are circumstances in the letter you cast your eyes over. Again she interrupted me. Why, once more, I ask you, am I detained in this house? Do I not see myself surrounded by wretches, who, though they wear the habit of my sex, may yet, as far as I know, lie in wait for my perdition? She would be very loath. I said, that Mrs. Sinclair and her nieces should be called up to vindicate themselves and their house. Would but they kill me, let them come and welcome. I will bless the hand that will strike the blow. Indeed I will. Tis idle, very idle, to talk of dying. Mere young lady talk when controlled by those they hate. But let me beseech you, dearest creature, beseech me nothing. Let me not be detained thus against my will. Unhappy creature that I am, said she, in a kind of frenzy, wringing her hands at the same time, and turning from me, her eyes lifted up. Thy curse, O oh my cruel father, 
seems to be now in the height of its operation. My weakened mind is full of forebodings that I am in the way of being a lost creature as to both worlds. Blessed, blessed God, said she, falling on her knees, save me, oh, save me, from myself and from this man. I sunk down on my knees by her, excessively affecting. Oh, that I could recall yesterday. Forgive me, my dearest creature, forgive what is past, as it cannot now but by one way be retrieved. Forgive me only on this condition, that my future faith and honour— She interrupted me, rising. If you mean to beg of me, never to seek to avenge myself by law, or by an appeal to my relations, to my cousin Morden in particular, when he comes to England. Damn the law! Rising also, she started. And all those to whom you talk of appealing. I defy both the one and the other. All I beg is your forgiveness, and that you will, on my unfeigned contrition, re-establish me in your favour. Oh, no, no, no! Lifting up her clasped hands, I never, never will, never, never can forgive you, and it is a punishment worse than death to me, that I am obliged to meet you or to see you. This is the last time, my dearest life, that you will ever see me in this posture, on this occasion. And again I kneeled to her. Let me hope that you will be mine next Thursday, your uncle's birthday, if not before. Would to heaven I had never been a villain. Your indignation is not cannot be greater than my remorse. And I took hold of her gown, for she was going from me. Be remorse thy portion, for thine own sake be remorse thy portion. I never, never will forgive thee. I never, never will be thine. Let me retire. Why kneelest thou to the wretch whom thou hast so vilely humbled? Say but, dearest creature, you will consider, say but, you will take time to reflect upon what the honour of both our families requires of you. I will not rise. I will not permit you to withdraw, still holding her gown, till you tell me you will consider. Take this letter, weigh well your situation and mine. Say you will withdraw to consider, and then I will not presume to withhold you. Compulsion shall do nothing with me. Though a slave, a prisoner in circumstance, I am no slave in my will. Nothing will I promise thee. Withheld, compelled, nothing will I promise thee. Noble creature, but not implacable, I hope, promise me but to return in an hour. Nothing will I promise thee. Say but that you will see me again this evening. Oh, that I could say that it were in my power to say, I never will see thee more. Would to heaven I never were to see thee more. Passionate beauty, still holding her, I speak, though with vehemence, the deliberate wish of my heart. All that I could avoid looking down upon thee, mean groveller, and abject as insulting. Let me withdraw. My soul is in tumult. Let me withdraw. I quitted my hold to clasp my hands together. Withdraw, O sovereign of my fate. Withdraw, if you will withdraw. My destiny is in your power. It depends upon your breath. Your scorn but augments my love. Your resentment is but too well founded. But, dearest creature, return, return. 
return with a resolution to bless with pardon and peace your faithful adorer she flew from me the angel as soon as she found her wings flew from me i the reptile kneeler the despicable slave no more the proud victor arose and retiring tried to comfort myself that circumstanced as she is destitute of friends and fortune her uncle moreover who is to reconcile all so soon as i thank my star she still believes expected oh that she would forgive me would she but generously forgive me and receive my vows at the altar at the instant of her forgiving me that i might not have time to relapse into my old prejudices by my soul belf of this dear girl gives the lie to all our rakish maxims there must be something more than a name in virtue i now see that there is once subdued always subdued tis an egregious falsehood but oh jack she never was subdued what have i obtained but an increase of shame and confusion while her glory has been established by her sufferings this one merit is however left me that i have laid all her sex under obligation to me by putting this noble creature to trials which so gloriously supported have done honour to them all however but no more will i add what a force have evil habits i will take an airing and try to fly from myself do not thou upbraid me on my weak fits on my contradictory purposes on my irresolution and all will be well end of letter twenty nine Letter thirty of Clarissa Harlow, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clarissa Harlow, Volume six, by Samuel Richardson. Letter. 30. Mr. Lovelace, to John Belford, Esquire, Wednesday night. A man is just now arrived from M. Hall, who tells me that my lord is in a very dangerous way, the gout in his stomach to an extreme degree, occasioned by drinking a great quantity of lemonade. A man of eight thousand a year to prepare his appetite to his health he deserves to die but we have all of us our inordinate passions to gratify and they generally bring their punishment along with them so witnesses the nephew as well as the uncle the fellow was sent upon other business but stretched his orders a little to make his court to a successor I am glad I was not at M. Hall at the time my lord took the grateful dose. It was certainly grateful to him at the time. There are people in the world who would have had the wickedness to say that I had persuaded him to drink. The man says that his lordship was so bad when he came away that the family began to talk of sending for me in post-haste as i know the old peer has a good deal of cash by him of which he seldom keeps account it behoves me to go down as soon as i can but what shall i do with this dear creature the while to-morrow over i shall perhaps be able to answer my own question i am afraid she will make me desperate for here have i sent to implore her company and am denied with scorn i have been so happy as to receive this moment a third letter from the dear correspondent miss howe a little severe devil 
it would have broke the heart of my beloved had it fallen into her hands. I will enclose a copy of it. Read it. Here. Tuesday, June 20. My dearest Miss Harlowe, again I venture to you, almost against inclination, and that by your former conveyance, little as I like it. I know not how it is with you. It may be bad, and then it would be hard to upbraid you for a silence you may not be able to help but if not what shall i say severe enough that you have not answered either of my last letters the first of which and i think it imported you too much to be silent upon it you owned the receipt of the other which was delivered into your own hands was so pressing for the favour of a line from you that i am amazed i could not be obliged and still more that i have not heard from you since the fellow made so strange a story of the condition he saw you in and of your speech to him that i know not what to conclude from it only that he is a simple blundering and yet conceited fellow who aiming at description and the rustic wonderful gives an air of bumpkinly romance to all he tells that this is his character you will believe when you are informed that he described you in grief excessive yet so improved in your person and features and so rosy that was his word in your face and so flush-coloured and so plump in your arms that one would conclude you were labouring under the operation of some malignant poison and so much the rather as he was introduced to you when you were upon a couch from which you offered not to rise or sit up upon my word miss harlowe I am greatly distressed upon your account, for I must be so free as to say that in your ready return with your deceiver you have not at all answered my expectations, nor acted up to your own character. For Mrs. Townsend tells me, from the women at Hampstead, how cheerfully you put yourself into his hands again, yet at the time it was impossible you should be married. Lord, my dear, what pity it is that you took much pains to get from the man but you know best sometimes i think it could not be you to whom the rustic delivered my letter but it must too yet it is strange that i could not have one line by him not one and you so soon well enough to go with the wretch back again i am not sure that the letter i am now writing will come to your hands so shall not say half that i have upon my mind to say but if you think it worth your while to write to me pray let me know what fine ladies his relations those were who visited you at hampstead and carried you back again so joyfully to a place that i had so fully warned you but i will say no more at least till i know more for i can do nothing but wonder and stand amazed notwithstanding all the man's baseness tis plain there was more than a lurking love good heaven but i have done yet i know how to have done neither yet i must i will only account to me my dear for what i cannot at all account for and inform me whether you are really married or not and then i shall know whether there must or must not be a period shorter than that of one of our lives to a friendship which has hitherto been the pride and boast of your anna howe dorcas tells me that she has just now had a searching conversation as she calls it with her lady she is willing she tells the wench still to place her confidence in her dorcas hopes she has reassured her but wishes me not to depend upon it yet captain tomlinson's letter must assuredly weigh with her i sent it in just now by dorcas desiring her to reperuse it and it was not returned me as i feared it would be and that's a good sign i think I say I think, and I think, for this charming creature, entangled as I am in my own inventions, puzzles me ten thousand times more than I her. End of letter 30letter thirty one of clarissa harlowe volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org clarissa 
Harlow, Volume 6, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 31. Mr. Lovelace to John Belford, Esquire. Thursday noon, June 22nd. Let me perish, if I know what to make either of myself or of this surprising creature, now calm, now tempestuous, but I know thou lovest not anticipation any more than I. At my repeated requests, she met me at six this morning. She was ready dressed, for she had not her clothes off ever since she declared that they never more should be off in this house, and charmingly she looked, with all the disadvantages of a three hours violent stomach ache, for Dorcas told me that she had been really ill. No rest? and eyes red and swelled with weeping. Strange to me that those charming fountains have not been so long ago exhausted. But she is a woman, and I believe anatomists allow that women have more watery heads than men. Well, my dearest creature, I hope you have now thoroughly considered of the contents of Captain Tomlinson's letter, but as we are thus early met, let me beseech you to make this my happy day. She looked not favourably upon me. A cloud hung upon her brow at her entrance, but as she was going to answer me, a still greater solemnity took possession of her charming features. Your air and your countenance, my beloved creature, are not propitious to me. Let me beg of you before you speak to forbear all further recriminations, for already I have such a sense of my vileness to you that I know not how to bear the reproaches of my own mind. I have been endeavouring, said she, since I am not permitted to avoid you, to obtain a composure which I never more expected to see you in. How long I may enjoy it, I cannot tell, but I hope I shall be enabled to speak to you without that vehemence which I expressed yesterday, and could not help it. The lady in her minutes, says, I fear Dorcas is a false one. May I not be able to prevail upon him to leave me at my liberty? Better to try than to trust to her. If I cannot prevail, but must meet him and my uncle, I hope I shall have fortitude enough to renounce him then. But I would fain avoid qualifying with the wretch, or to give him an expectation which I intend not to answer if I am mistress of my own resolutions, my uncle himself shall not prevail with me to bind my soul in covenant with so vile a man. After a pause, for I was all attention, thus she proceeded. It is easy for me, Mr. Lovelace, to see that further violences are intended me if I comply not with your purposes, whatever they are, I will suppose them to be what you solemnly profess they are. But I have told you as solemnly my mind, that I never will, that I never can be yours, nor, if so, any man's upon earth. All vengeance, nevertheless, for the wrongs you have done me, I disclaim. I want but to slide into some obscure corner, to hide myself from you, and from every one who once loved me. The desire lately so near my heart, of a reconciliation with my friends, is much abated. They shall not receive me now, if they would. 
sunk in mine own eyes, I now think myself unworthy of their favour. In the anguish of my soul, therefore, I conjure you, loveless, tears in her eyes, to leave me to my fate. In doing so, you will give me a pleasure the highest I now can know. Where, my dearest life, no matter where, I will leave to Providence, when I am out of this house, the direction of my future steps. I am sensible enough of my destitute condition. I know that I have not now a friend in the world. Even Miss Howe has given me up. Or you are. But I would fain keep my temper. By your means I have lost them all. And you have been a barbarous enemy to me. You know you have. She paused. I could not speak. The evils I have suffered, proceeded she, turning from me, however irreparable, are but temporarily evils. Leave me to my hopes of being enabled to obtain the divine forgiveness for the offence I have been drawn in to give to my parents and to virtue, that so I may avoid the evils that are more than temporary. This is now all I have to wish for. And what is it that I demand, that I have not a right to, and from which it is an illegal violence, to withhold me? It was impossible for me, I told her plainly, to comply. I besought her to give me her hand, as this very day. I could not live without her. I communicated to her my lord's illness, as a reason why I wished not to stay for her uncle's anniversary. I besought her to bless me with her consent, and after the ceremony was passed, to accompany me down to Berks. And thus, my dearest life, said I, will you be freed from a house to which you have conceived so great an antipathy? This thou wilt own, was a princely offer. And I was resolved to be as good as my word. I thought I had killed my conscience, as I told thee, Belford, some time ago. But conscience, I find, though it may be temporarily stifled, cannot die. And when it dare not speak aloud, will whisper. And at this instant, I thought I felt the revived varletess on but a slight retrograde motion, writhing around my pericardium like a serpent, and in the action of a dying one, collecting all its force into its head, fix its plaguy fangs into my heart. She hesitated, and looked down, as if irresolute. And this set my heart up at my mouth, and, believe me, I had instantly popped in upon me, in imagination, an old spectacled parson, with a white surplice, thrown over a black habit, a fit emblem of the halcyon office, which, under a benign appearance, often introduced a life of storms and tempests, whining and snuffling through his nose the irrevocable ceremony. "'I hope now, my dearest life,' said I, snatching her hand and pressing it to my lips, "'that your silence bodes me good. Let me, my beloved creature, have but your tacit consent, and this moment I will step out and engage a minister, and then I promised how much my whole future life should be devoted to her commands, and that I would make her the best and tenderest of husbands. At last, turning to me, I have told you my mind, Mr. Lovelace, said she. Think you that I could thus solemnly, 
There she stopped. I am too much in your power, proceeded she, your prisoner, rather than a person free to choose for myself, or to say what I will do or be. But as a testimony that you mean me well, let me instantly quit this house, and I will then give you such an answer in writing as best befits my unhappy circumstances. And imaginest thou, fairest, thought I, that this will go down with a lovelace. Thou oughtest to have known that free livers, like ministers of state, never part with the power put into their hands without an equivalent of twice the value i pleaded that if we joined hands this morning if not to-morrow if not on thursday her uncle's birthday and in his presence and afterwards as i had proposed set out for burke's we should of course quit this house and on our return to town should have in readiness the house I was in treaty for. She answered me not, but with tears and sighs, fond of believing what I hoped I imputed her silence to, the modesty of her sex. The dear creature, thought I, solemnly as she began with me, is ruminating in a sweet suspense how to put into fit words the gentle purposes of her condescending heart. But looking in her averted face with a soothing gentleness, I plainly perceived that it was resentment and not bashfulness that was struggling in her bosom. The lady, in her minutes, owns the difficulty she lay under to keep her temper in this conference. But when I found, says she, that all my entreaties were ineffectual, and that he was resolved to detain me, I could no longer withhold my impatience. At last she broke silence. I have no patience, said she, to find myself a slave, a prisoner, in a vile house. Tell me, sir, in so many words tell me, whether it be or be not your intention to permit me to quit it, to permit me the freedom which is my birthright as an English subject. Will not the consequence of your departure hence be that I shall lose you for ever, madam? And can I bear the thoughts of that? She flung from me. My soul disdains to hold parley with thee, were her violent words. But I threw myself at her feet, and took hold of her reluctant hand and began to imprecate a vow to promise. But thus the passionate beauty interrupting me went on. I am sick of thee, man. One continued string of vows, oaths, and protestations, varied only by time and place, fills thy mouth. Why detainest thou me? My heart rises against thee, O thou cruel implement of my brother's causeless vengeance. All I beg of thee is that thou wilt remit me the future part of my father's dreadful curse, the temporary part, base and ungrateful as thou art, thou hast completed. I was speechless. Well, I might. Her brother's implement. James Harlow's implement. Zounds, Jack! What words were these? I let go her struggling hand. She took two or three turns, crossed the room, her whole haughty soul in her air, then approaching me but in silence, turning from me, and again to me, in a milder voice. I see thy confusion, Lovelace, or is it thy remorse? I have but one request to make thee, the request so often repeated, that thou wilt this moment Permit me to quit this house. Adieu, then, let me say for ever adieu. And mayst thou enjoy that happiness in this world, which thou hast robbed me of, as thou hast of every friend I have in it. And saying this, away she flung, leaving me in a confusion so great, 
that I knew not what to think, say, or do. But Dorcas soon roused me. Do you know, sir, running in hastily, that my lady is gone downstairs? No, sure, and down I flew, and found her once more at the street door, contending with Polly Horton to get out. She rushed by me into the fore parlour, and flew to the window, and attempted once more to throw up the sash. Good people, good people, cried she. I caught her in my arms, and lifted her from the window, but being afraid of hurting the charming creature, charming in her very rage, she slid through my arms on the floor. Let me die here, let me die here, were her words, remaining jointless and immovable, till Sally and Mrs. Sinclair hurried in. She was visibly terrified at the sight of the old wretch, while I sincerely affected appealed bear witness mrs sinclair bear witness miss martin miss horton every one bear witness that i offer not violence to this beloved creature she then found her feet o oh, house look towards the windows and all round her o oh, house contrived on purpose for my ruin said she but let not that woman come into my presence not that miss horton neither who would not have dared to control me had she not been a base one ho sir ho madam vociferated the old dragon her arms kimboed and flourishing with one foot to the extent of her petticoat what's ado here about nothing i never knew such work in my life between a chicken of a gentleman and a tiger of a lady she was visibly affrighted and upstairs she hastened a bad woman is certainly jack more terrible to her own sex than even a bad man i followed her up she rushed by her own apartment into the dining-room. No terror can make her forget her punctilio. To recite what passed there, of invective, exclamations, threatenings, even of her own life on one side, of expostulations, supplications, and sometimes menaces on the other, would be too affecting and after my particularity in like scenes, these things may as well be imagined as expressed. I will therefore only mention that, at length, I extorted a concession from her. She had reason to think it would have been worse for her on the spot if she had not made it. It was that she would endeavour to make herself easy till she saw what next Thursday her uncle's birthday would produce. But, oh, that it were not a sin, she passionately exclaimed, on making this poor concession, to put an end to her own life, rather than yield to give me but that assurance. The lady mentions in her memorandum book that she had no other way as is apprehended, to save herself from instant dishonour, but by making this concession. Her only hope now, she says, if she cannot escape by Dorcas's connivance, whom, nevertheless, she suspects, is to find a way to engage the protection of her uncle, and even of the civil magistrate, on Thursday next, if necessary. He shall see says she, tame and timid as he thought me, what I dare to do, to avoid so hated a compulsion, and a man capable of a baseness so premeditatedly vile and inhuman. This, however, shows me that she is aware that the reluctantly given assurance may be fairly construed 
into a matrimonial expectation on my side. And if she will now, even now, look forward, I think from my heart that I will put on her livery and wear it for life. What a situation am I in with all my cursed inventions? I am puzzled, confounded, and ashamed of myself upon the whole, to take such pains to be a villain. But for the fiftieth time, let me ask thee, who would have thought that there had been such a woman in the world? Nevertheless, she had best take care that she carries not her obstinacy much farther. She knows not what revenge for slighted love will make me do. The busy scenes I have just passed through have given emotions to my heart, which will not be quieted one while. My heart, I see, on reperusing what I have written, has communicated its tremors to my fingers, and in some places the characters are so indistinct and unformed that thou art hardly be able to make them out. But if one half of them is only intelligible, that will be enough to expose me to thy contempt for the wretched hand I have made of my plots and contrivances. But surely, Jack, I have gained some ground by this promise. And now one word to the assurances thou sendest me, that thou hast not betrayed my secrets in relation to this charming creature. Thou mightest have spared them, Belford. My suspicions held no longer than while I wrote about them. For well I knew, when I allowed myself time to think, that thou hadst no principles, no virtue to be misled by. A great deal of strong envy, and a little of weak pity, I knew to be thy motives. Thou couldst not provoke my anger and my compassion thou ever hadst, and art now more especially entitled to it, because thou art a pitiful fellow. All thy new expostulations in my beloved's behalf, I will answer when I see thee. End of letter 31